Good morning. I'd like to thank the Geological Society for the opportunity to present at this conference and for the invitation. I would like to speak today on the importance of geoheritage with specific reference to the role of geosites in the promotion of geoheritage. So the contents of the talk will be first a brief introduction to what geoheritage and geosites actually are. And then we will look at um, particularly particular elements I've highlighted as important in the promote, public promotion of geoheritage, such as the sustainable development of economic mineral resources. Um, other kind of less obvious roles of geology, um, such as its relevance in influencing human history. And I've noted land and water use and management here in a different color. And that's technically because I'm not actually going to talk about that. But I'm just noting that these are important things that could be addressed. Um, I don't personally have the expertise to do this. And the, some of this will be addressed later on in today's sessions. And then we'll look at um, how these kind of topics can be incorporated into kind of broader multidisciplinary approaches to the promotion and education in geoscience, and then through being combined with geotourism, how we develop geosites. And we'll finish off by looking at kind of the progressive evolution of sustainable geosites. So what are geosites? According to Wikipedia, geosites are simply locations with a particular, particular geological or geomorphological significance. It may also have cultural or heritage significance to it. We can look at a broader definition, which Science Direct offers, where geosites are lumped in with the broader categories of geoheritage and geoparks and geoconservation, in which it is recognized that it is part of an interdisciplinary movement and that it also involves the kind of uh, economic sustainability to it, so economy and tourism being reflected. So this is our kind of goal in the development of a geosite context, is this bigger picture. So why are geosites important to us? Why are they useful tools? To me, this speaks to why geoscience education itself is important, or geoscience awareness by the public. And why is this important? Because the people we are educating are the people that are essentially paying for it. So the people whose taxes or who are providing the votes to justify the spending of tax money to support conservation and preservation and development of our natural resources in all sorts of contexts and also the people whose children um, today are going to be the natural scientists, the geologists and all the other natural scientists, and the people making the decisions on how the money is going to be spent in the future. So we would like them to be as well educated and informed as possible, and the sooner the better. And the most obvious example for me is mining in South Africa. And is it taken for granted? Um, just paying some homage here to Monty Python. Um, everybody in South Africa is quite aware that mining has been very important to the economy of the country over its last century. Um, although there's probably a general perception that it is much less important than it used to be, which may well be true, but that doesn't mean it is no longer important. So yeah, there's this perception that everybody knows that mining is important, so we don't need to promote it. But do they really know everything they need to know about how, what the role of mining actually is? There seems to be a general perception that mining is a license to print money. It's the golden goose. 
which I decided was easier to illustrate than the cash cow. So if we take that for granted as a kind of relatively unlimited resource for cash, um, we risk cooking that goose for the short-term benefit at the cost of long-term. One aspect of this that's well known in the minerals industry, but probably not to the general public, is the cost distribution of the development of mines. Um, when does money start coming in, as well as where is that money going to? So the fact that um, even though it might not cost very much to send out small parties of geologists to do uh, greenfields exploration, you have to send a lot of parties out. You might send a hundred parties out for every one that eventually leads to successful um, development of some sort of economic mine. And the real big money spend comes well before you start making any money, and then you've got to pay that money back. The influence of mining on society in South Africa could also stand some updating. Um, what is known to South Africans in general, for example, what's in the current school syllabus, in addition to information about um, the history of mining in the country, um, also relates, like through the history syllabus, in to the influence of mining on um, how it affected the indigenous populations, um, extracting the workforce from the townships and the cultural dislocations that caused. Um, so what isn't taught necessarily is what's happening now. What are we as a country doing to remedy these problems? So to um, fix the existing damage and not perpetuate it into the future. Um, aspects like how much of the money actually goes into national government now through royalties and through local ownership of companies and how much money is invested into local communities in various ways. So mining companies currently do invest a large amount of their profits into local communities. And one might argue, well, that's only because they have to, because we make them through legislation. But of course, these are money-making businesses fundamentally. Um, and they're not that different from anyone else in this regard. And that's up to us as a country to be well informed and to enforce these regulations and see to it that this is a part of doing business. And then the country will benefit as a consequence, as it is doing now. So a lot, there's a lot of information out there that's available from different companies, and they all seem to fundamentally be contributing in comparable ways um, into local community, health initiatives, education initiatives, environmental initiatives. Um, it's well known, or it's let's say it's widely known that yeah, gold and diamonds, where we used to control the universe, are not as dominantly South African money makers as they used to be. And we can see that illustrated in some of these plots. Um, the, on the left side, we see a, uh, a plot showing that diamonds and gold at the bottom of that diagram were particularly um, under productive compared to the, their pa recent past. And the diagram on the top right shows the trend of gold production over the last 50 odd years, with South Africa represented by the black line, um, declining, whereas the rest of the world slowly increasing. Um, however, that being said, mining was still um, a huge part of our economy. And this um, graph from last year shows how um, mining was actually um, the savior of South Africa's economy during our late COVID recovery phase here. And this also just um, reminds us that this kind of education needs to be constantly updated. This isn't information I was aware of till I was researching this talk. And uh, 
So when we set up these kinds of uh, pathways for public education, it's not a question of setting them up and then letting them run. Um, these need to be uh, constantly maintained and updated to be actually useful. So my point is that we are we don't need to feel sorry for the mining company that people aren't appreciating them. Um, they're they're there doing their business, um, but there's a lot of information available that the geoscience community could be sharing with the public and becoming more aware of themselves that would benefit everybody. So by doing this in a kind of sensitive and useful way where we're not just acting as unpaid advertising for companies, but showing people that there are a lot of benefits that are already happening and have been happening for a long time. And there are ways that the mining industry can contribute to society um, if we choose to invest that money in sensible ways. Moving on then, we'll look at the impact of or the relationship between geoscience and human history in Southern Africa as another example of aspects of the geosciences that we could bring into the context of geological heritage. For example, um, migration routes of peoples into and around South Africa have been strongly influenced by the geology in the form of relatively impassable mountain ranges, when there are at least when there are other options to take, how those mountain ranges have controlled drainage patterns, so the courses of major rivers, which tend to be where the people want to go, so they have access to fresh water and transport. Um, and more locally, um, limestone terrains producing karst topography, which become cave rich, and that's influenced preservation of geological or human heritage, uh, cases of the um, cradle of humankind, for example. And uh, temporary refuges as well. So some of the examples I'll be mentioning include the migrations of the Bantu peoples from sub-Saharan Africa down into Southern Africa over the past 3,000 years, the migrations of the Dutch farmers, the Boers, um, in the 18th and 19th century within South Africa. We'll look at the progressive contraction of the Basutu people into what became the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. And Makapan's hut, just outside Mokopane, in the Limpopo province, provides an excellent example of where we can integrate geological, archaeological, and historical, and relatively recent cultural and political interactions and history, all into a nice coherent story. Well, all that, not all that nice, but conceptually nice. Then we move on to just the recognition that um, there are prominent kingdoms in Iron Age South Africa or Southern Africa in which the role of the geology in controlling the topography, um, providing the hilltops, which were the preferred locations for regional capitals, um, is can be recognized. We have two lamella in the northern Kruger Park in Mpumalanga, a map in Gubwe, um, around 1000 AD, and in Great Zimbabwe, just to the north, by the 13th century. And then we'll mention the, the relatively well-known competition for um, mineable mineral resources that then took place in the 19th and 20th centuries between the British and the Dutch republics, the Boer republics. The diagram on the left here shows the movement of the Bantu peoples from Central Africa down into South Africa over the last 3,000 years. Um, the timing and the routes are determined by a combination of archaeological evidence as well as essentially cultural reference, um, linguistic evidence for um, borrowed words. Um, so it's not quite as tightly constrained as in the last couple of hundred years, 
Um, but we can see that the migrations tended to be driven by um, access to the shores or to the, the coastal areas um, and restricted by features such as the deserts, mountain ranges and tsetse fly in Central Africa. In the upper right, we see the migrations of the trek boars away from Cape Town and they were trying to distance themselves from Dutch administration. And then 50 years later, realizing that they hadn't gone far enough once the British took over and then they kept moving to the northeast, interacting with and displacing indigenous peoples there. And again, all of the migration routes are strongly influenced by the positions of the mountain ranges. So we could summarize this by the um, emigrations along the coastal areas and then along the coast south of the Cape Fold Belt, occasionally crossing over it into the interior eventually, and again kind of largely controlled by the escarpments and mountain ranges. The area that the Basutu people originally occupied was progressively trimmed back by the Boer farmers looking for a good arable land, and then that practice continued by the British until the Basutu were restricted to the mountain kingdoms, which were not seen as desirable land for the purposes of the European colonists, um, not recognizing at the time the uh, agricultural value of the Drakensberg, nor um, the mineral potential. But if it wasn't for the existence of the Drakensberg, form Drakensberg Formation Volcanics, um, the Lesotho people probably would have been scattered. Um, the Iron Age kingdoms include Mapungubwe Hill, shown here, um, just south of the Limpopo River, um, and the famous Golden Rhino was discovered there, shown on the right. And that was the center of a, an Iron Age kingdom, which is the predecessor to Great Zimbabwe, shown here. Um, and this was uh, located on these eroded granite hills in central Zimbabwe at Masvingo. And I would just like to, let's say, shout out to Professor Tom Huffman of the Archaeology Department at Witz, who literally wrote the book on these kingdoms and who very recently passed away. So I'd just like to thank Tom for his contributions there. And then we can, we can refer to sort of more local um, situations like Melville Copies here from Johannesburg. Again, hilltop settlements in the Iron Age. This is probably in the 1600s, where we had um, crawls, furnaces, um, the extent of the occupation or how widespread this sort of thing was is not entirely clear. There aren't a lot of these around. And we know that um, religious activity, past and present, is centered around um, hills. So um, Sunday worship going up onto the sides of hills. So then all this is in some way related to geological control, um, influencing the geomorphology of the surfaces. Most geologists are quite aware of the progressive development of the interior of the country and the competition between the British and the uh, Dutch republics or the Boer republics for the interior. And this all related to the discovery of precious metals, first in Kimberley and then subsequently gold 15 or so years later at Langlachte after some earlier but smaller gold deposits in the northeast. We would now associate that with the progressive development of colonization in those areas to sort of facilitate uh, development of the resources and also to establish ownership of the, those areas. That goes along with the coal exploration story, which provided the engine for processing all these resources, um, particularly the gold and the chromium and the iron that we're going to talk about in a second. The Maltino goldfields in the Eastern Cape were the first ones to be developed 
And that's pretty much coincident with the discovery of the metals in the, the north. And then we had Vereniging and Witbank over the next 30 years, and then gradually expanding that into the coal fields we have now. The kind of discussion that could come out of this could be um, a recognition of how, th whether the discovery of precious metals then inspires colonization. Is that the root cause of that good or bad? Or is it because colonization was already happening, metals are found and then that just breeds competition for it. I got thinking about whether this was a purely fatuous observation. And I thought, I decided it probably wasn't because we have other, we have things like the little copper rush that happened in the Northwest um, in the 1850s and it lasted about 20 years. It created the boom town of Springbok and O'Keep there. And then that was the end of it. So we might say, well, okay, there wasn't enough practical resources there or means of extracting them and getting them to the coast at the time. So it never developed into a kind of major uh, colonization or urbanization opportunity as compared to gold or diamonds. But we can look at the mining of manganese in the Northwest province there. And that's been going since the 1920s as a component of steel. We can also look at chrome, which has been going since the 1920s. And neither of these areas have developed into major urban centers, particularly the Kuruman hot as hell area um, in the Northwest province. The chrome boom, arguably in the last 20 years now, if we look at the Steelport area, um, Burgers Fort has apparently since about 2010 changed from sort of scattered shops and a couple of strip malls Apparently that area now supports something like a million people is a number that I've heard. Um, and they, there is a proper mall and stuff there now. Maybe it just took a lot longer for that to stabilize or took the addition of platinum to the resource base as chrome wasn't doing it. So maybe there's something to do with industrial minerals versus precious metals. Um, but I think those are the kinds of things that would be interesting to know more about and to, to be informed of when getting educated on the geology of a particular area. How do we share this information? Well, there are a number of venues and tools we have at our disposal. First, we have established museums. Here are a couple of examples. And the museums are good places to combine disciplinary knowledge and particularly to combine archaeology, history, and geology. So there's the Kitching Fossil Museum in New Bethesda. So the building itself shown on the top left, and this is the kind of garden in front where there's reconstructions of Permian reptiles, mammal-like reptiles, in fact, our distant ancestors um, that preceded the dinosaurs, and that's a school group getting educated or cornered, as it may be. And then the Albany Museum in Grahamstown or Makanda with reconstructions and uh, African dinosaurs and providing a historical con context for the evolution of life in South Africa and in the Eastern Cape. We can use literature to develop just purely kind of geoscience backgrounds, but in a, a relatively digestible way. So kind of short geostop style geological education. Um, there's a lot of information out there um, that's been produced going back as far as one cares to look probably. I ran across this paper from 1968 um, which is a paper on general education of the value and role of chromium. So it's not, it wasn't quite pitched as a kind of public education, but it was just definitely pitched at a kind of interested undergrad geosciencey kind of level. We have very well developed museums at places like Kimberley, which are which 20 years ago had the nice historical village, now has a really world-class um, museum and education center combined with the historical village. Freda Fort, shown on the bottom right, is an example of um, what happens when an area has a lot of potential but isn't developed in quite the right way. So there were a lot of good ideas, there were a lot of smart people involved in the development, but um, the execution turned out to be problematic. Um, there's lots of fascinating geology at Freda Fort and it's still a important stop for lots of us university types, 
but it has never developed into the proper World Heritage Site it was intended to be. And that doesn't mean we can't do it. And by all means, we should do it. It's sitting there waiting for us. Places like Makapanskat, just to the north of Mokopane, have done a very nice job of integrating archaeology, um, hominid evolution, Pleistocene um, animal and plant evolution, geology, providing the, the venue for this in terms of these caves, which are hosted in dolomites, so this kind of karst style topography. In the cradle of humankind, this was the main reason people were there in the first place, was mining the lime out of the caves, and then discovered that there were um, fossils of interest in there. Um, the same thing at Makapanskat. And then on top of that, though, it has this very interesting modern history involving four trekkers and Chief Makapan and his people. Not a happy story. Herman Charles Bosman has written a nice one of his short stories. Well, you know that when Bosman writes it, it's not going to have a happy ending. There's a nice link from geological history through hominid and general animal and plant. So evolution of life over the last tens of millions of years recorded in there, plus modern history, all in one site. And it's been fairly well done in setting that up and getting it operating. This is an example of a publication which is the integrates many scientific disciplines together. Now, you can't read the page on the right, even if you're holding the book in front of you, this is very faint text. So I'm helping you out here. So there are chapters on the geology to start with, then sort of in theory, moving through progressively younger um, disciplines. So paleontology, then there are individual chapters on each of the climate, the plants, the insects, reptiles, birds, and mammals. There's a section on the archeology span as we move into human history, then we move into pre-colonial and then colonial history. Then there's a section integrating this into um, local schools um, and then finishing with the kind of local tourism. So local trails, local drives that are of interest in the area. This is a significant amount of work to produce. And really this, like all of these ventures, and this speaks a lot to why a geo geosite succeeds or not, is dependent on the people that drive it. Roy Lupke in particular, and Irene Demur here, um, have been really instrumental in promoting a lot of geoheritage development in the Makanda area. Roy seems tireless and ageless doing this. And then it's the actual authors that contribute, in this case, my wife. So people that are willing to put their time and expertise in to make these chapters. And these chapters are all very well done. They're relatively short, digestible line diagram illustrations to keep it interesting. The chapters are all just a few pages long. This is a very good way to offer the basics of the heritage value in a whole variety of things at once. Kind of reaching latter phases of my talk here, I guess given that I started at what, almost before 22, I'm about, about right. To me, this sort of progression in development of a geosite starts with the kind of obvious thing. Um, this is a picture from Addo National Park here, our game park, about an hour to the west of us in Makanda. Um, a nice vertically tilted Cape Fold Belt quartzitic sedimentary rocks. So there's just the basic principle of just education, like the what, high, what, how, when, and why of these rocks. Yes, they're pretty and they look interesting, how did these rocks come to, to be here? What caused this particular phenomenon? So this is kind of a introductory geology lecturette in a way. And this is probably what a typical geosite has in it. Some kind of educational material addressing what you can see in front of you. So this would be stage one. Stage two is integrating it with other heritage elements, which means providing additional educational material or opportunities to see so that's a an, an very close up picture of an elephant taken out of my car at Addo on the top right. And then on the bottom left, that's the 1820 settlers who were the British colonists that arrived here in the 1820s. There they are picking out a good spot for the future development of automobile factories. And on the right, displacing the inhabitants that happened to be there. 
um, which led to the Khosa Wars of the end of the century. And then the next step, though, <clears throat> is integrating those. So that this is what you don't see done very much, and I'm not sure. Like a like even that that very nice book on Makanda, all of the heritage items, it doesn't tie them to each other necessarily. So what you really want is a way that shows how they all influence one another, if possible. And this is where you really need integrated. So here we have, here's my superficial illustration of this. So deposition of sedimentary rocks, intrusion of a nice resistant, soon to be resistant dolerite sill. Here's a granite intruding and some gold veins. Then we have some weather and some erosion. Then we have human occupation. So we will build our chief's palace on the top of the hill, the village below. We'll have a little mining, as it tends to be our want. We built a gold roof for the palace. Then we have resource competition. Human history follows. So we want, ideally, you want some way to integrate all of that information along with plants and animals and drainage patterns and how this all leads to where we are now. So a person coming to a geosite leaves with some awareness of how all this stuff affects them personally today. And I think that's kind of the goal. Um, this is a picture just stolen online as well um, from Maro Peng. This is the end of the Sturkfontein tour. This is where we all take pictures of Robert Broom's head. The final stage is, yes, once you've got your integrated multidisciplinary science project, is then integrating that as a sustainable community, well, let's say structure. This involves involvement with the community as you are researching it and developing whatever you're going to develop, whether that's putting also making sure things are translated into multiple languages. This is something that we've just been recently doing. Roy lupke has been motivating or driving here at uh, uh, Makanda. Um, we've redone uh, local heritage plaques, posters and literature all to not just be English and Afrikaans, which is what it was, plus those had degraded with 20 or 30 years of time. All of this stuff is much better done by, with the participation of local community. Um, getting people involved, there's lots of people that are quite keen, well-motivated and well-spoken and will work as tour guides and well-spoken in multiple languages, which is the key, and genuinely interested in what they're talking about. Um, this has worked very well in Maro Peng, in my experience visiting there. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of the people working as tour guides are also interested in further developing their, their knowledge, uh, doing further study, whether that leads to degrees or not, but it leads to a genuine awareness of the value of the, what they're talking about. Um, one of the potential problems, and I think it's been, particularly the Vitz people have been very good with maintenance of their heritage site training, like the recognition that it's not, you don't just train a person and then leave them to it indefinitely. Places like Makapanschat seem to suffer slightly more from this, where there wasn't as much regular interaction as would have been ideal. And this is the danger when the training is coming from a university that's not next door to the place. So just logistically, that causes problems. And the more interaction with really having a local basis for that expertise um, would help that. Those are things that are recognizable and, uh, and addressable as well. And then you want, yes, you want a, a way for this to actually make money. So preferably not just some money goes into the tour guide's pocket. Otherwise, they're just sitting there waiting for the tours to happen. Makapanskhat was a bit like this nowadays. There's not a kind of education center that's active, at least the last time I was there. Whereas Maropeng, there's a lot to do in addition to the tours. So whether that's little animal parks nearby, game farms, uh, but ideally the educational side of it, but um, building up small, at least local centers of economic infrastructure that employ more people and yeah, just get more general community investment into that center, that educational center, that geo site, the more you can get the better. Obviously, this depends on the site and the proximity of local communities. Geology isn't always where you want it to be. The end of this, the idea is that this is best done as multidisciplinary 
multidisciplinarily as possible. So yeah, if we're building this around sites of geological interest, then obviously a geologist is the ground floor. And then depending on the rocks, paleontology, paleobotany, so anything paleozoic is going to have, well, everything can have life associated with it, potentially, but a lot of it is blue-green algae. But then bringing in historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, human geographers, geomorphologists, environmental scientists, and then the social scientists positioning this information in the community context. This is something that's probably not a good idea to leave to geologists, for example. This is where we need humanities people involved. Um, and then involving local community right through the process and then to make this actually work, again, this isn't something you want to leave to natural scientists. So business managers, marketing, how can this be made? What is the context in the local economic community? Who are you attracting? What are people likely to want to, to buy or pay for? So to do this properly, so we've seen enough examples around South Africa where this kind of thing has been done very well and where it hasn't worked as well as it was hoped. There's lots of places I haven't talked about that were part of my original kind of thinking. Barberton, there's this really well done geoheritage trail, which was really set up by a few people motivating it and driving it, raising the money. Swain Crater outside Pretoria had a very nice little sort of self-education center. And then there's, a, there's still the very nice trail with educational materials which link geology and yeah, human occupation, sort of pre-colonial stuff, early colonial stuff, mining, again, was mining the area for lime and salt. And um, so it's nice. It ties in a lot of things very nicely. Unfortunately, the information center suffered from a fire a couple of decade and a half or so ago. And I'm not sure what its current situation is, but there's been a lot of very well executed versions of this. What it didn't have was the, that then the, um, the more sustainable structure around it to kind of keep it keep it current and keep it uh, in shape so i think that's all the insights i can offer i hope that was some food for thought thanks very much and i'm open for questions steve thank you so much for that really really interesting talk any questions for steve i've just got a comment um <clears throat> my, my grandchildren told me to go to the W5 Science Museum, which they see in Belfast, and they were absolutely right. And other lay people told me to go to the Conjure Trail, other ones told me to go to the Cliffs of Mohair Geo Park. So when lay people tell geologists to go somewhere, it really appeals to the lay people. Mm. And the, w, the W5 stands for who, what, why, where, when. And they've done the uh, Giants Causeway uh, very well. I used to live in Northern Ireland, so I wanted to go anyway. Yeah, they're, they're very, very good. So when things are done well, so I would ask everybody to think, when did you last go to a geotourism destination and what drew you to it? Uh, the last one I want to mention is my dentist and an oceanography professor, professor said, go to the Gorge of Samaraya in Crete. My wife and I walked down it in our, in our early 70s, right beside the, the geopark next door and a, and a Greek geologist. Uh, he um, gave me a book just about the whole thing. So uh, they think think why you went to a geotourism destination. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you. There's a comment from Dave Reed in the chat. He says, well done, Steve. Collectively termed Earth Stewardship. Have you personally integrated this into your own courses? Big change to your old course. Yeah, I just was typing something back in for that. Um, yeah, I not in any systematic way like this. This is, I mean, we, we struggle to get our geological content through in, a, in the time we have. What I do is try to pepper my, my geological content with references to things like this. In fact, the, 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 like the Lesotho Drakensberg link was, I used that in my third year lectures this week, but it's just as, Aside, so they're not part of the formal course content at all. My logic is that by integrating these things in, um, you make you give this the listener other things to attach that knowledge to. So they might be more likely to remember where 
the Drakenberg volcano, the Drakenberg formation exists if they then remember that it's Lesotho, which is where half of our students come from these days. I think it it helps in the teaching of it, but I'm not, yeah, as as an undergraduate geology course, I'm not really able to teach content that's linked in this way. Um, we are like this is where in theory in a uh, like in a more like a merged geology geography type scenario one could develop courses that do link sort of human geography physical geography and geology much more closely which would allow allow for this but yeah at the moment it's it's outside my expertise and my mandate but yeah I, I find it interesting and I try to share that fascination with the students they can take it or leave it. Are there any other questions for Steve? Steve, thanks again. That was absolutely fascinating. It's a pleasure. Right, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks so much for the opportunity that you've given me to, to do a presentation on uh, promoting geoheritage in education. I must say from the outset that I don't speak as an education expert, but I speak as a practicing geography teacher as well as a, a teacher who has had the privilege of assisting Wits University to assess uh, geography student teachers in public schools, mainly in Soweto. So basically a lot of my outlook is based on a real experience that I have experienced while teaching and while actually observing conditions in schools. I also like to see, think of myself as somebody who's always thought out of the box when it comes to teaching. Um, when I remember even from my first day in the days in the 1980s in teaching, I would invariably think about what resources do I need to make this topic interesting. And so I often spent a lot of my time basically making projects. Um, be it out of plaster Paris, be it planning to do something with a hose pipe and a piece of plastic and a heap of sand out in the garden. So that is the way I look at teaching. Now, reintroducing geoheritage into the current curriculum, uh, promoting our geoheritage through education. Geoheritage has always formed part of geography, and geography is my field. That is me teaching in uh, probably the late 1980s, early 90s in my geography classroom. And I believe the education is pivotal to the introduction of the concept of geoheritage on the ground. Now, I did this right from the beginning of my career. You wouldn't believe it if I told you I never did geography at school. I followed what you're going to see me analyzing in a minute. I followed what Possibly my parents suggested would be a good career, uh, take up some, some accountancy, history, maths and science. Uh, when I got to university, I took geography and it changed my world. The education or the level of education that I received as a student at WITS was incredible. And I couldn't believe the depth of knowledge that came through in terms of the application of what we had learned to the real world. And so I came out of university, not as a past geography student from school, but I came out as a varsity graduate thinking um, at a varsity level. So very often I was, I was often found to be teaching things that many other teachers didn't teach, things that were in the curriculum, but I basically added to them. So I focused a lot on using powerful images in my teaching, using models, uh, taking kids outside, doing practical work. Now, the critical function of a public education system, I think this is all just a given, and I'm just taking this off the top of my head. To achieve an acceptable level of literacy among the youth, in preparation for their incorporation into the working population. This includes a broader general knowledge of their environment, economy, and therefore opportunities available to them. One of the critical things about teaching is that we must realize a lot of kids, uh, children are literally a blank slate. 
They know very little about the world around them. And through our teaching, we actually expose them to that world. Now, I had never and I still never have been overseas. Yet through research and through the use of resources, by the way, there was no internet at that time, I was able to teach kids a world view of geography, although I'd never been overseas myself. The second thing, the provision of sufficient numbers of science and maths based achievers to fill the critical skills based needs of the future economy. A lot of schooling, I know, especially in private schools and in the top government schools where I started, the big drive was to encourage science and maths. But now that left a body of children who fell outside that category. And that is where I specialized. I was known as the teacher who challenged the bright kids, but also made it interesting for those kids that were a bit slower. And they used to enjoy coming to my class because they received a world view education, an interesting exposure. So ultimately, to offer the majority of children as broad as exposure as possible to a variety of fields, so as to give them an opportunity to choose a career path. Broader geoheritage education forms part of this development in a child's lateral thinking and general knowledge to instill a sense of empathy for their fellows and their environment. I believe that basically encapsulates the overall goal or aim of an education system. But the public education sector is underperforming. And I have seen this over the last five years going through government schools. The reality is this, a minority of learners follow science and maths as a career path. That is unbelievable to think, but it is a fact. The majority follow what they see as soft subjects, subjects they perceive to be easy. Many of these learners, as a consequence, never go on to achieve their full potential. Many learners are then merely taught using textbooks with little practical exposure to the real world. Teachers are often unmotivated. There are motivated teachers, but on the whole, I've seen many, many more unmotivated teachers. Teaching resources are basically, are basic to non-existent. Resources have fallen away. Children are consequently under-challenged and become bored with school. And that's often the cause of bad discipline at school is because children are bored. Now, geography, and this is where the potential comes in. This is where the potential comes in. Geography, earth science, a potentially powerful subject to reignite a love for learning and inquiry among children. I believe that if children are not interested in what they are learning, children are not challenged by what they are learning, you are failing as a teacher. You've got a critical situation within a class especially when classes are mixed. You will have strong academic children invariably mixed with slower, uh, I wouldn't say weaker academic, but maybe slower learners. And you need to pitch it at both levels. It is important to note that the majority of public school learners take geography as a subject to grade 12. It's in the region of 75% of learners take geography and for that reason they fall outside the science maths um, part of education and for that reason i believe that geography this subject is taught correctly using the resources potentially available with its lateral links into many other subjects has the potential to fill many gaps in the system introducing science directly to students who maybe don't think they have the capacity to understand science, and then exposing learners to wider career opportunities, being some examples of the powerful ability 
of geography or earth science to be used in the education system. Geoheritage forms a pivotal part of the broader earth science component within geography. And this is the final one. Conceptualizing geoheritage as a function on which to build the teaching of physical geography. And here I've put it in a nice chart. Physical geography as a backdrop to teaching children to understand and appreciate their geoheritage. It automatically links them to this. Most children, they are absolutely keen to go to school, especially younger kids, because they are naturally fascinated by the physical world around them. The colorful stones, the stars, volcanoes, plants, insects and more. It is therefore critical that these inbuilt interests be nurtured, not lost, not crushed, not smothered in textbook teaching and used to expand many complex facets within a child's education. A lot of teachers don't realize how important it is for kids to smell, to see, to hear, to touch, to experience. Teaching geoheritage forms a critical foundation to link minerals and rocks to geology, to landscapes, to soils, to fauna, to flora, to mining and the primary sector, ultimately to include the preservation of geoheritage and understand it, it, its intrinsic value to not only an economy, but to tourism, both local and international. And that is the job of a teacher in a school. Entry points within the current curriculum which offer opportunities to focus on the broader geoheritage theme. I believe there's ample space. It's just that the teachers need the motivation, the resources, and a, um, I will go into it in a minute, a, 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 almost a, a common policy to apply. In grade nine, we all know that they start with basic rocks and minerals. I've seen it done where basically they are taught out of a textbook. Not one rock is present in the class. Not one handful of soil is brought into the class. Not one reference is made to the actual reality. The basic rocks and minerals, agents of erosion and related landscape features, natural and man-made disasters, grade 10, the game is up to broader background to geomorphology, plate tectonics, mountain building, volcanoes, earthquakes, grade 11 fluvial and karst uh, geomorphology, economic geology, and sectors of an economy. Yeah, they finally begin to tie in the geology with the economy, with the mining, and uh, basically all built around the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary sectors of an economy. So geography is well positioned to bring in this word geoheritage and link it in to all of these, these concepts. Requirements to incorporate the concept of geoheritage into the, the curriculum. I don't believe there's much of a challenge other than just starting it, starting the ball rolling. The curriculum already allows for its incorporation. All that is needed is a basic framework to link all relevant topics within the curriculum under the broader concept of geoheritage, to make available basic resources to better teach some of the more complex concepts. And then the major initial focus should be made in preparing student teachers and current teachers who are keen to embrace the project a series of pilot projects to test the effectiveness of resources supplied and to develop new ones. So basically that is what I envisage in a nutshell to be my vision as to what can be done. Now, resources. Resources. In education, a powerful image or set of images are worth a thousand words. When I see um, some wonderful charts that have been produced by various companies, even the Minerals Council, they tend to try and throw a whole lot of knowledge onto a chart to pin on a wall. Kids don't read through these things. They don't actually read through them. 
What I used to do as a teacher was collect powerful images, stick them around the stick them around the classroom, and then basically um, use that as a motivation. So powerful powerful images are so important in teaching. And the questions that kids may get out of those two images, the one of the early earth, or a rendition of the early earth, and um, basically that is something to be looked at. The Freire Ford impact story, I myself have done a, a, a display for my talks at Paris, where I created hand-painted diagrams to simplify the processes that take place within fractions of seconds to minutes to hours after a vast impact takes place. Now, encourage kids to create their own story using color and to connect and link geological structures and to then see the stories hidden in the rocks for themselves. I've come to the conclusion you don't only need resources, you need to provide sets of work exercises which incorporate materials that are user friendly to children in terms of color by number. You lead them into the story. And so what I'm now going to share with you are some of the resources that I have been working on together with um, people like Nick Norman. But I believe this is just the beginning of what can be done. The potential is huge. Box of Rocks, Nick Norman's well-illustrated book combined with a sample, has the potential to be used as a classroom handbook. An excellent introduction to the GeoHeritage journey. Now, I know a number of schools who have bought this combination to use as a hand set in their classroom. And um, so that, has, that is a great achievement in itself. Included in the set, um, I made sure there was a 10 times magnifier. And the purpose for that was to get kids to, to encourage them to actually go and look at the world around them using a magnifier. And so that magnifier was not only to look at rocks, it was to look at soil, to look at leaves, to look at if they could find meteoroids on the roof. In, in, in a container after winter. Um, these little things that actually bring uh, geology and geoheritage alive for kids. Now, as a developer of, of resources, I've got a more comprehensive set, and I believe, and I'm going to try and be uh, to try to push this into both the schooling and the amateur geology level. A more comprehensive set is aimed at taking basic mineral and rock collecting to a higher level. And what I've done is I've tried to limit it to teaching people about identifying the nine major rock forming minerals and then to understand how common those minerals are in everything that people see around them. The development of supplementary resources that use as many of the senses as possible would greatly enhance the teaching of geology and geoheritage based topics. Educators would also feel more comfortable having the support materials already built into the resource packages. So with that box of rocks, there's an explanatory booklet that goes with it and a diagram pack. And I'm going to show you a couple of the diagrams that have been produced. There are also sets of experiments. The more advanced sets place emphasis on understanding the basics of mineral crystallization and the identifying of the nine major rock forming minerals. So basically to get kids to grow crystals, which they do in science, but now you're doing this in a, in a geology or a geography classroom, and you are then linking those principles to the actual minerals which make up your common mafic, uh, your, your felsic and mafic rocks. The links back into science, to the periodic table, the opportunities are endless. The thread follows the basics of mineral chemistry and the conditions under which mineral crystallization takes place. And for me, as a geography teacher, this is a good foundation 
where you're now taking kids out of the curriculum and just for the sake of it, you're now adding extra knowledge to their, to their curriculum based knowledge and it doesn't take a lot of time to do. And so basically, the, the, the major felsic minerals and the basic ability to identify them and, and to understand why they are the colors they are, why they have the characteristics they are, and likewise the mafic minerals. To go further, and what I'm doing here is I'm following a thread to show you my line of thinking of how I then use diagrams to combine them with the sample to keep, teach kids complex concepts, taking kids through the basics on how and under what conditions different minerals crystallize and what types of rocks are commonly formed under certain conditions. And what is actually meant to happen here is these are all caliber number diagrams. This kit contains, I think, about 25 diagrams. Carefully thought about, some of them I've actually created them out of my actual imagination. And then the purpose is for the kids to actually place the mineral and rock samples onto those diagrams and to then better understand the links between temperature, pressure, and the types of minerals and the types of rocks that form. There we are even going further. We are taking this now to a new level, to looking at how different magmas originate and actually form and produce different types of rocks. Now we get environments, sedimentary rock forming environments, how to simplify it, how to elaborate on it, and how to simplify it in a way that kids can better understand it metamorphic rocks even even more complex and then finally when kids have a good grasp of rocks and basic uh, rock forming processes rock and mineral forming processes to introduce um, the geological map of south africa and with it the geo heritage component of geology and in this particular um, exercise your aim would be to actually point out to kids that wherever they travel in their country they can follow the story that is held within this beautiful geological map and here I've created a color by number map to force kids to actually see the, the layering of the rocks the, the sequencing of geological time now how to deal with the concept of geological time. This is one of the great challenges in teaching and even more challenging is getting kids to understand the seemingly impossible. This diagram, I, I didn't put the credit, I couldn't quite remember how, where I've got it out of it, so it's a common book, but an incredible image. I want to share this with you and I think it's worth sharing this with you. A powerful model to simulate changes in geological settings over time. These are colored sands and are mixed with oxides. And using this glass um, laminate with uh, various uh, props, you are able to create an incredible simulation of geological processes. So I'm going to play it for you here. Ready? Right, everybody, um, as promised, this is the, um, the Fold Mountain simulation model, and I just want to show you the basic setup. Um, basically, we've got tubs of colored sand, as you can see, red tint. This is actually plaster sand with some oxide in it, and you're going to have as many colors as those oxides come in. Then you've got some tools, a ruler, you can have a nice sharp pointed knife, uh, basically a paint scraper and, and a pen. Now, basically, I want to show you very, very quickly um, how this simulation model works. So what I've done is I have prepared one behind the actual model demonstration. You can see it's two pieces of um, six mole glass and the uh, edges or the end stops have the ability to move in and out. Now, bringing in the real model, I'm going to bring it to the same position. Now, what I've done here, I've gone and preloaded this. If you're actually teaching this, for instance, in grade 10 or even grade 11 
to teach kids how rock strata is actually laid down, for instance, in a geosyncline, or you could be talking about the history of the Himalayas. And uh, basically, as you lay the sand, and I'm going to show you how to lay sand now, you can basically put ages onto those layers and, and basically... And basically, you can um, explain as you're going along. Now, I'm going to just do one example. What I've actually also done here, as you know, in, in, in with, with rock strata, if you gently compact it, it would tend to more likely fault than fold. If it's left uncompacted, it would tend to fold. So I'm going to show you the basic principle. I'm going to use some green. And I'm going to place it into my dispenser. I'm going to place it into the dispenser. And then I'm going to drop it into the sand model to form a final layer. Now, once you've done that, the purpose of the ruler is to then straighten the sand out to get it as even as possible. Now, don't forget this sand is not wet and it's not dry. It is in between. It's damp. Almost like a kid building a sand castle on a beach. Now, going with what I've done before, I'm going to gently compact the one end. Okay, so basically, I would get kids to actually, or students, to draw those layers as they are. Because then they can associate the layers with various dates, ages. Uh, some could be lavas, some could be layers of sediment, others could be layers of um, evaporites, whatever you like. Now, basically, I think another very important thing to do is at some point use a pen to actually put in sea level. And so this is the point at which kids can actually see uh, or students can see how horizontally layered sequences of rock, when deformed, can actually rise above sea level to produce mountain ranges like all of our peripheral fold or intercratonic fold mountain belts. Now I'm going to simulate the process of um, folding and whatever happens in this model it can never be repeated in a second model because each model just like mountain ranges would differ. So yeah I'm going to start applying the compressive stresses and basically, you can actually see how the strata, uh, where you've got your, um, your uh, compacted, slightly compacted, and your folded strata, um, actually develop. And there you can actually see the pattern that is produced. You've got to just watch that the uh, stops at the bottom actually pick up the soil, because they want to rise over the, um, they want to actually rise over the, the other material. So I'm just going to try and fold it a bit more. There you go. So now, kids really battle to understand, for instance, a geological map, uh, in terms of the fact that you've got, uh, it, it, as the rule goes, your youngest rocks on top and your oldest rocks at the bottom. But where you actually see younger and older rocks lying parallel to each other, that is easily explained by this model. So for that purpose, this model even gets better. Because if you remove the front layer of glass, simply because the sand is compacted, you just got to watch out that your sand doesn't crumble like a sand castle. You can now actually see quite clearly um, what has been represented. Now, if you take sea level having been approximately there, what now needs to be simulated is the, is the process of erosion. So that is very simple. You can actually take a knife and you can very carefully remove layers of this uh, model and you have now got a flat geological map. But of course you need to now put in the terrain, the valleys, etc. And now you have now got a complex three-dimensional model. And if you had to actually get students or kids to draw that at each stage, so the the deposition stage, then the folded stage, and then the eroded stage, you could now actually get them to quite clearly understand how a geological map 
actually represents a three-dimensional um, structure that has been created in the way I've demonstrated. And I think this, uh, very, very quickly, because we don't have the time, but I think this uh, is, a, is, is a perfect example of one. Right. Um, yeah, sorry that the, the video was a little bit low. It's very difficult to put it at full frame. But nevertheless, uh, this model overcomes the difficulties in thinking in both time scales and three dimensions. Many complex geological features are also illustrated. So you can talk about uh, synclines, anticlines, faulting, uh, etc., etc. Once the basics of geology are understood, then those interested are ready to explore South Africa's amazing geoheritage ge tre treasure chest. An amazing collection of books are now available to feed the geological enthusiasts. Now, I've taught many kids in my life, thousands, and many kids are capable of understanding a lot of the advanced geological processes on, a, on, on an amateur level, so much so that you know, I, they actually amaze me at, at their ability. Now, basically, the daunting task of getting resources onto the ground and into the classroom. This is a school uh, near the Medikwi Game Reserve. They contacted me asking me for resources. So I drove, I think it's around 450 kilometers, and I arrived at this school. And I made a presentation to them. Um, this was all part of a pilot project of basically box of rocks. Um, and from what I, from what I can understand, I think they, they are pretty happy with what they've got. Uh, and although these school, this school is in a deep rural setting with the tools, and I, by the way, also gave them the, um, the model, the, the model mountain building uh, kit with the rocks, with samples of rocks, uh, big samples for the teacher. And I think that they are very, very happy with what they receive. Now, the aim of geoheritage-based schools projects would go a long way in highlighting the importance of our geoheritage and the phenomenal growth of our country. It would also reinforce an understanding of why the managing of our geoheritage is so important for the future. And uh, the mining and related industrial sectors offer one of the greatest opportunities for expanding the economy and creating the critical employment needed into the future. Now, basically how I got kids interested, now I know a lot of the detractors would say that uh, a lot of people see this as pollution and so on. But if you show kids a YouTube video of what an electric arc furnace looks like, they are so overwhelmed with the science and they are so overwhelmed with the impact that it makes that they begin to understand its need and its function and it overcomes the obstacles that are attempting, that are attempted to be put in the way in terms of environmentalism. Environmentalism has to be considered, but uh, the mining industrial sector, um, as the previous speaker pointed out, are critical to this country and its future. Now, the importance of exposing children to as many aspects of our geoheritage as possible. Yeah, we are at the Council for Geoscience Core Sheds. I've got another visit scheduled. I was going to schedule it for Friday, but they've pushed it to September because of construction. But I dare to take kids out. And I think if, a, if, if, if the Council of Ge for Geoscience could allocate some time, maybe once a week, once a month, twice a month, to host schools, it would be a wonderful um, con contribution to the understanding of the greater geoheritage. Using our current... <coughs> yeah, our kids in the, in the um, Walter Sisulu Botanical Garden using that geological display to answer questions, to solve problems. The stories told by the landscapes are an excellent way to teach an integrated approach to geoheritage. As you all know from the top of the Michalisberg, you can see the bushveld and the mining, and from the southern side, you can see 
Johannesburg, the ridges, and all the geology. Um, going to visit uh, mining history is critical for a child's development and understanding of the historical origins of our mining industry. Uh, using models in the field. There you can see I've got a model of Johannesburg, and we are doing this at Harrison Park. We went to actually take a look. You can no longer do it at, at present. And basically then getting kids to understand this amazing story that you're sitting at Harrison Park, yet it's part of a bigger geological story and it's part of the story of the development of South Africa. And then going further using models to better understand the complexity of mining and the evolution of landscape. There's my rendition of an early Vidvardistrand uh, setting for the explanation for the deltas and for the great uh, depositional phases of the Vidvardistrand. And then, uh, of course, the dedicated visits to places like Parais. And then finally, no outing in terms of geology is without reinforcement using samples and getting kids to actually physically um, identify the minerals, log their collections, learn how to collect samples, learn how to be responsible. That's yeah, so, um, Dylan and Paul will also presents uh, part of the presentation. Um, we both, um, well, we don't work, we volunteer for, for the Umbola Foundation, which is a, uh, the non nonprofit arm of um, Umbota Africa, a uh, groundwater consultancy in Musenberg. And our other two authors are Gemma Bluff and Lachelle Penn Clark. And Paul and myself will be talking about celebrating hydro and then I'll put it in brackets there, geological heritage. Um, and with two examples being the Table Mountain Dams Trail and the Hermanus Water Walk. Um, and just want to acknowledge the funding that you received from the 35 RGC Legacy Fund for the Table Mountain Dams Trail. Um, and then the water walk, Hermanus Water Walk is in development at the moment. And the picture you can see there is uh, Haley Hutchison Dam on the top of Table Mountain um, in mid November 2013 when it was 100% full. And then the picture on the right is uh, the GWP 12 production borehole in Gateway Wellfield in Hermanus. So um, I enjoyed Steve's talk this morning, especially when he brought up the fact about how important it is to bring in geo heritage with everyday aspects of life because the general public understand it, but will understand it better. And he's made mention of water management, and that's pretty much what we'll be talking about. So hydrogeology and hydrology are quite commonly overlooked aspects of geo heritage. And uh, that's despite water and all its forms being critical in the development of Earth and shaping of its landforms. And the establishment of pretty much almost all of humans, humanity settlements is because of access to water. Um, and that water supply is important because you can use the evolution of it to track the development of that, of that settlement across the Holocene and it provides a tool to teach the public about human interactions with the earth, as well as the future going forward in a changing climate. And a lot of these historical water supply systems reflect engineering feats at the time, especially the Table Mountain Dams, which Paul will talk about, and their important cultural heritage features. So we've done two or developed two self-guided walking trails um, with guidebooks and apps. Well, the Hermanus Water, water Walk will have that in the future uh, in, in the areas of Western Cape, which have rich water supply histories. So like I said, the one is the Table Mountain Dams Trail, which was funded by the 35th 35 RGC Legacy Fund, as well as on Voda Africa, with respects to time from us putting in time for it. And then Hermanus Water Walk, which we're doing in association with the Overbeck Geoscientist Group. And I think John Blaine is presenting next week on some of their good work that they're doing, uh, sorry, presenting tomorrow. And we we want we link in with them with respect to Hermanus Water Walk. And both trails cover um, the Table Mountain Group, um, the surface and groundwater supply systems in both trails as well as the associated fractured systems with the TMG. And we hope that these guides and trails will help the user gain a greater appreciation and understanding and feeling of ownership from where they're from. And then once they have a better understanding, they will strive along with scientists like ourselves to preserve this associated uh, hydrogeological heritage and the cultural heritage going forward. So this is what the Table Mountain Dam's uh, guidebook looks like. Um, it will be pretty much finished in two weeks and online for free from the, the Umboda Foundation uh, website. So that's just the front and inside cover. 
Um, this is the last page and this presentation as well as the booklet itself is dedicated to um, Rowena Hay and Dr. Chris Hartnady. Uh, Rowena was the founder of the Mvoda Foundation in, the, in Mvoda Africa um, and, and the managing director and Chris was the director of Mvoda Africa as well and they both sadly passed away last year from COVID so this is they were very passionate about geoheritage so this is um, in memoriam of them. So this is just some of the pages of the guidebook, um, just showing you um, the top, let me just bring the pointer up. There you go. The top left is just showing examples of some of the reservoirs in the city bowl, some of the dams and some figures about water use and population. And then we go into some of the geology of our Table Mountain, where the dams are situated, uh, as well as bringing in stuff about climate change and the reasons for um, climatic conditions in the, in the Western Cape, so the public has an understanding of the importance of the water supply and how it evolved over time. The hike itself, um, the preferred routes, you start at Constantia Neck Car Park and you go up Orange Cliff um, to Woodhead Dam. And this portion of the hike, you need a permit from Sands Park, from Sand Parks. And then you go from the, from the Waterworks Museum, you go through the Woodhead and Haley Hutchison Dams, through the three Weinberg Dams, which is the Victoria, Alexander, and De Villiers, and you go back down to the car park via Constantia Neck. If you don't have a permit for Orange Cliff, you can also do it by coming up from Castile Port, from Camps Bay, and then going back down to Constantia Neck. Um, or you can just start at the Constantia Neck car park itself and go up and down via Constantia Neck. So there's a few different ways to go. Um, and yeah, this is actually the, we, in the booklet itself, this forms an A4 fold out map at the back of the booklet for the user. Um, with Forge, we also developed um, a nice little basic app, um, which is linked to their main Forge app. It's essentially a, a layer that's, that's also downloadable for free. And in the actual the layer, it has the trail, and it's got all the little geo sites or, or cultural sites, like the dams and specific spots to look at some nice uh, geological features. If you click on the, on the, the actual part of the, the segment of the hike, it tells you if it's easy or, or difficult and what the, the kind of terrain is. And if you actually click on, um, if you zoom in and click on one of the sites, it gives you a little description of, of the actual site. And there's also a picture in the attachments. So we actually had the inaugural hike on Monday as part of the Geoheritage Conference. Um, we're lucky to have uh, Professor Dave Reed and Dr. Andy Killer come with us. Um, he added in lots of valuable insights, um, geological insight along the trip. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough going when you go up Orange Cliff. It's, it's, it's a bit steep, but as geologists, um, luckily we stop lots of, lots of, more, lots of unplanned stops along the way to have a look at some interesting things in the, in the various formations of the Table Mountain Group. Um, and then also looking at the various tunnels, um, which Paul will go into in detail, and then on the way back along the, uh, the, the upper Weinberg Downs. This is just a geological map showing the, the actual route. Um, the geology is not too complex on the back table of Table Mountain, but it is nice to, to, uh, for lay people to start to understand geology better. Um, so there isn't really any crazy um, beautiful folding like you get in um, uh, uh, Swartberg Pass. Um, it's just pretty much flat line TMG. But there is some interesting features, and you do get very nice outcrops of the Hrafwada formation, the peninsula formation, as you as you walk up uh, the back table. Um, and this, we just got some cross sections in the in the booklet just to show what the geology is like. Um, so, like I said, pretty much flat line peninsula formation and Hrafwada. You do see some nice structures in, in both, so cross bedding. And we also bring in stuff to deal with the hydrogeology of the TMG. Um, I'll just put this little picture in because you get nice seep zones where you get these peninsula sun dews, which are little carnivorous plants that you can see along the walk. Um, also, although it is pretty much flat line, there is some, there is some interesting uh, and actually not very well understood um, folding, uh, even within the flat line parts of the Cape Peninsula and Table Mountain. So the, the bottom image shows what's called the Fluckenberg monocline, and then you get some fault uh, bend folding uh, near Cecilia Ravine. And um, yeah, but Dr. Andy Killick is busy trying to work this all out in his now retired spare time. <laughs> so Paul is going to take over from me here to discuss um, the various uh, more cultural features, and then I'll come back and talk about the Humanus Water Walk.
Yeah, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much. And thanks, Dylan, for that, for that introduction. Um, I'd just like to take you through the actual um, the, the story of water in, in Cape Town and give you some understanding as to how the dams were built and, and how we moved from the very first dam uh, in the City Bowl up to the Great Western Cape Water Supply System. So all these slides that you'll be seeing are actually taken from the, um, from the guidebook. Um, on the left-hand image here, you can see the general sort of overview of Table Mountain from a, from a hydrological perspective, looking at the different stream flows. And what's apparent in here, if you just see where my cursor is, is that the Bachanar Reservoir was built in uh, pretty much Van Riebeek's time, 1650, when uh, Table Bay was first sort of occupied. Prior to um, the Dutch arriving, um, the Khoi settlers had been here for some time, the, the Khoi pastoral <laughs> settlers. And, uh, and prior, before them, the, the San had lived um, in, in, the, in the area for up to thousands of years before, um, before European settlement came in. So Table Bay was always known as a resource for water, and most of the water came off the front or northern face of the mountain through what the uh, Dutch called the Varsh River, which was the fresh river, um, and the San called the Camilla, which was sweet waters. Um, that water that was then taken into the Bachanaz Reservoir, which could at that stage hold 0.5 of a million, 0.5 of a million liters of water, which was not very much in today's standards, but it was then also led out through a gracht or a canal, an open canal down into the actual um, waterfront area where the ships could then resupply their water. However, that water soon um, was not enough for the growing settlement of, 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 the, of Cape Town. And as the population expanded from what was in those early days of about a thousand people up to close to 45,000 people um, in the sort of uh, late part of the 1800s, they needed to build more reservoirs, which they did um, further up in what is the area now of the city gardens. And here you can see um, on the left-hand side an image of the Wachenaas Reservoir that was um, uh, found underneath the excavation for the um, Golden Acre building on the foreshore. And this was the memorial opening in, in 1976, I think it was, or 74, um, off this reservoir. And you can see here the little canals or the grachts that led the water underneath what is now the constructed city. But on the right hand side, you can see here we have the reservoirs which were then um, later built. Um, we have Duval Park Reservoir 1 and 2, and above them the Maltino Reservoir. Now, these three reservoirs all took the water in that flowed off the northern buttresses of Table Mountain from the Plutterclip River, um, which, as I say, was called the Varsh River, and they then provided the city with water. That was, gave us a storage of about 200 million litres of water at that stage. Um, which was uh, supplying a population of roughly 50,000 people in, in the city. So it was, uh, the population expansion hadn't happened yet, and this was still sufficient water. But unfortunately, um, droughts plagued Cape Town, and they, they have recently, they always have, and they always will. And um, the Maltino reservoirs and the Duval reservoirs weren't able to be constantly supplied by the, uh, the Plutterkrib River. And the, um, here's a picture just showing you the actual reservoirs, the Duval Reservoir um, lower down and then the upper Maltino Reservoir. The Maltino is still functional today and is part of the, uh, the city's water supply system. The Duval Park Reservoirs are now uh, historical monuments and no longer used. Um, but that wasn't, despite the fact that, um, that, that we now had 200 um, million liters of water, um, it was still not enough to supply the city. So what we've done is put it into a graphical form so you can get an idea of the size of these reservoirs and the scale of the storage of water in relation to the population. And you can see as we move along the time axis from 1663 through to 1886, how the storage had grown from half a million liters up to almost 200 million liters. But at the same time, the population, which is this curve here, was expanding um, and continually putting challenges on the water storage. And we'd, uh, by that stage, at the end of 1800s, we'd reached um, almost uh, you know, 50 million people. And that water was no longer sufficient to supply the city, even from the Great Maltino Reservoir. So then the engineers taught, turned their thoughts towards an alternative idea, and that was to take water off the back table of the mountain. And um, they incredibly um, uh, industrially built a tunnel underneath the Apostles. 
And this tunnel runs uh, quite literally from Hout Bay through to Kemp's Bay. And you can see, um, you know, the old and the new, this is a, a, the, the left-hand side was the sort of finalization of that tunnel. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see its present day status. Um, and you can still see the old disused pipe, which used to take water from what was then the Dyser River, which had uh, much more water than the Plutterclip River, and brought it from what would have been flowing out into Hart Bay to now bring it through into the northern part of the peninsula and supplied the Maltino Dam. So this provided um, a pretty good solution towards the end of 1891 for when the, the Plutterclip River was drying up. Um, and there you can see um, along the top of Camps Bay, um, above Camps Bay, the, the, the pipe track, which brings the water from the exit of that tunnel all the way through to the Kloof Neck uh, waterworks, um, uh, which then supplied and purified the water and then sent it down to Maltino. And still functional today, as you can see on the bottom right-hand picture, the pipes are still there, although they don't come through the original old tunnel under the Apostles, um, but I'll deal with that in a few slides time. Moving onwards, um, it also then became further apparent that the Dyser River itself, which supplied this tunnel, was not sufficiently um, robust to, to keep water through the, uh, through the summer season, and it also dried up. And so they were stuck back in the problem of having a water challenge again. So they then, having built the tunnel, now had to build a dam. And this was when the Woodhead Dam was uh, built at the end of the 1800s, 1897, it was completed. It was the first large dam in South Africa and was um, of an order of magnitude bigger than the Maltino Dam. It was actually 955 million liters as opposed to 200 million liters that the Woodhead, uh, the Maltino Dam was. So this was a big dam and it was thought that it would solve Cape Town's water problems. And, uh, and you can see here various pictures of it um, in sort of 100% full stages prior to the drought that hit Cape Town. To build these dams, and not just the Woodhead Dam, but several of the other dams that Dylan spoke about earlier, they're now five on top of the mountain, uh, was a mammoth task at that stage. And they actually built an early cable car that ran from the Atlantic seaboard all the way up to the top of the mountain. Um, it was called the Castiles Port Cableway. And they then imported a steam train from Scotland and uh, hauled it up the mountain. And you can see in the bottom right hand picture where the cable car comes up from Buckhoven, sort of looking overlooking Buckhoven, Camps Bay, Clifton. Uh, the, the old uh, original structures are still there. And the steam train then hauled the equipment from the top of the mountain summit along to where the dams were being built. This was a major undertaking in the early part of the 1900s, um, done largely by Scottish uh, masons um, with stonework abilities and lots of uh, labor was incorporated into the, into the program. The end result with these two marvelous dams that we've seen, uh, we saw earlier in the slide, and in the left-hand side, we see the Heli Hutchinson Dam, about the same size as the dam on the right-hand side, which is a little obstructed in this picture, but they're both 900 to 1,000 million liters in capacity. And the top right-hand image is quite interesting. It shows the, uh, the village that existed up there at the time of the construction. Um, and there was about 400 people living on the top of Table Mountain, and there was actually a small shop and even a post office. Today, the, all that remains of that is the, uh, down in the bottom right-hand side here is the Waterworks Museum, which is a very interesting place to go and uh, look at all the old history. And you can see the steam train in place, and it's well worth uh, a hike up to the top of the mountains to see it. So that sort of then was the situation with the two big dams, which um, supplied down into the, into the Cape Town um, city bowl area. But the three more dams were built more or less simultaneously. And I won't go into the detail of them. In the very early part of the century of uh, 1900s, about 1910, Victoria, Alexandra, and de Villiers Dam, these were built by the Weinberg municipality. And their, um, their function was to take water um, into the Weinberg or the southern suburbs area. And instead of going through the mountains, which you can see represented here by this tunnel, the Woodhead Tunnel, um, along the pipe track to Kloof Neck, this water was taken from these three much smaller dams and uh, piped down and, and down to Constantia Neck Waterworks from where it was put into, um, into use in what was then the southern suburbs and now feeds into the main city bulk system. So that ended up an era of dam building on the top of Table Mountain, which was five dams which in total gave us a storage of 2,400 million liters of water. And this was about 12 times what was originally uh, available to the original city reservoirs of Maltino. 
But of course, the population had expanded at that stage and was close to a quarter of a million people. Um, and uh, Cape Town was again quite challenged by water. And, and um, uh, just taking one step back here before we go to the future and having a look at the comparisons here of the, the, the population and the size of the dams, this is an interesting situation. On the left-hand side, you see the City Bowl Reservoirs giving you um, about 200,000 um, million liters, which is on the right-hand side of the axis here. And then you can see the two big dams, Woodhead and Heli Hutchinson, and the three smaller dams supply in the Weinberg municipality. And at the same time, you can see the growth in population, which uh, came up uh, sort of sweeping up to almost a quarter of a million people by the time the dams on top of Table Mountain were Built. And the interesting thing is that um, although this was 12 times the storage of the City Bowl reservoirs, the 2,400 million litres would today only give Cape Town about three days worth of uh, supply at our current demand. So it's hardly sufficient for the future. Um, one more little step along the way was that the Woodhead Tunnel became defunct over time due to sort of collapse of the rock around it. And uh, the engineers in 1966 had to build a new tunnel, which was uh, uh, not quite as interesting in terms of stonework, but it's, it still exists today and it is functional and is sending water through to the, uh, to the uh, Kloofneck Waterworks um, via an open sluice that runs for 1.3 kilometers under the Apostles between Hart Bay and, uh, and Camps Bay. And here you can see an in, a look into that tunnel going downhill. So today, just to finish off, we sit with the, the Western Cape water supply system in, in current time. And uh, we have now, um, this is now of course expanded. And if you look at the map on the left-hand side, you can see where um, I'm indicating the cursor is where the, the dams on top of Table Mountain are, a very, very small little area supplying Cape Town. And that is expanded into this massive area on the, along the, uh, the Cape Town uh, Fold Mountain system from full flay in the north right down to the Stianbras dams um, towards uh, the south. And this massive um, uh, Western Cape water supply system, uh, the, the, these dams all supply the, the, the Western Cape water supply system, which is shown in the, in the yellow belt reticulation lines feeding into Cape Town. So we now have six dams, um, of which if you can see on the graph here, Tiavatis Kloof is the major big one. Um, the others are all slightly smaller, but all of these, even the smaller ones like the, Berg, the, the Stienbrus Upper and the Full Flat Dam are still considerably bigger than the first two here, which represent the city bowl reservoirs and the Table Mountain dams. Um, we now, in total with the Western Cape water supply dams, we can store 375 times the volume that was stored originally on Table Mountain. Um, and this then begs the question, is it enough and was it enough and why did we run to day zero in 2017? And uh, just as a last slide, I'd just like to finish up and just look at the climate of the situation. Um, so Mediterranean climates around the world are quite water challenged when it comes to supplying large populations and large cities. Um, Cape Town here showing you um, one particular Mediterranean climate, but there are several others from California and obviously to the Mediterranean itself. Um, southwestern Australia, and of course, um, the, uh, the Pacific freeboard of, of Chile is also Mediterranean climates. All these areas um, endure considerable water challenges in supplying large cities with, with, their, with their, um, uh, their assurance of supply. Um, and just an interesting uh, uh, picture here on the right-hand sh side shows you Tiavatis Kloof, our major dam, and you can see here in uh, 2017, at the height of the drought, just how little water was in that dam and how empty it was. It was uh, right down to, to its lowest levels, um, causing the day zero uh, crisis that had hit Cape Town. And then below is a satellite picture taken just last year, towards the end of last year, showing it back in its full, full um, storage capacity now. Um, so we, we've come out of the drought. And that's not to say there won't be more. So there are many reasons for drought, and I wanted to just bring one of them to our attention. What we, we tend to be noticing is that the, the high pressure system in the Atlantic um, is a major um, a blocker or obstructor to cold fronts passing over the southwestern Cape um, and bringing their rain in the wintertime. Now, normally the South Atlantic high pressure system migrates northwards towards the equator, during winter and migrate southwards towards the pole or the South Pole during summer. 
Um, recently, it's become considerably more um, uh, stuck in its position in the south, probably due to global warming and heating of the subcontinent and the impact of this, and you can see that by the purple lines, the more recent 2015, 2017 position of the, showing how it was blocking off the, the water supply system and moving the entire um, mean of the polar jet to the south of the Atlantic. But more of this detail is in the book, and we're running short of time, so I'm gonna pass back to Dylan, who's gonna move on to the Hermanus water walk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna go through the Hermanus water walk. It's, a work in progress, it's in development stage, so it's not as obviously as detailed as what we've just been through. But Hermanus has got a very rich water history, um, a mix between groundwater and surface water. So the whole town was founded on, on Table Mountain Group Springs. Uh, the name actually comes from uh, a, a Dutch teacher that used to take his sheep in the Himalayan Valley, and people used to call it Hermanus Peters of Fontaine. Um, and then uh, the town itself ended up being called Hermanus Petersfontein, but because it was too long for, for the post office, it just got shortened to Hermanus. Um, so yeah, the, those TMG springs supplied the town in the, from the late 1850s to early 1900s, and then there were also uh, springs and boreholes at Onerous. And then the town had a well field where the golf course is currently uh, into the upper Nardo aquifer. Uh, but then the DeBoss Dam was developed and the first surface water came in 1976. And pretty much all of that historical groundwater use was lost and um, only surface water was used until recently in the last 20 years, um, where Umbrella Africa has been involved in developing the three well fields in the Table Mountain Group, uh, targeting the Plinchel Aquifer, the Gateway, Campbell, and Vilmot well fields. And now they play an integral role in the water supply of Hermanus. So this is just an old uh, map from one of the uh, old uh, Department of Water and Sanitation reports showing the Hermanus faults and the the golf course well field. And this is our updated geological map. And um, we've actually updated the geology from the, the previously mapped geology based on the drilling we've done for, for the well field development, but I won't go into that now. But yeah, Pimasa's geology is a little bit more complex than, than Table Mountain. You have a whole range of fault blocks which displace the TMG, Borgafold group and underlying basement rocks to various extents. And we target these main uh, major faults, such as the Hermanus fault and this utter cross fault that you see here for, for well field development. So you get your recharge, which is a slightly circle in the fern cliff area, groundwater then flows down the Hermanus fault and we abstract it in the gateway well field. And it's also abstracted in the Vormald well field where recharge flows down the fern cliff and utter cross cliff faults. Then you also have recharge in the Onrus mountains and you abstract at the uh, Camp Hill well field. And it's just shown here uh, in the cross section the different structures that we target. And groundwater supplies 30 to 40 percent um, of 30 to 40 percent of the demand, so 1 to 1.5 million cubes of the town, whereas the remainder comes from the Boss Dam, but we're busy increasing the groundwater supply um, to its full license limit, so it'll be up to 50 percent in the future. So this is just the preliminary trail for the Hermanus water walk. The yellow shows a driven section um, and the whole concept of it is you actually walk from where water exits, so at the wastewater treatment works, and naturally out at the Hermanus Fault to the discharge zone by the sea. You then go have a look at the pre extal water treatment works where your water is treated. You then park your car at the Rotary Drive car park, and then you then walk um, along the contour path um, in Ferncliff Nature Reserve, you stop off at Gateway Wellfield, see where the groundwater is extracted, and then you then walk along the path and you essentially walk along the flow path um, of the peninsula aquifer um, right up to the recharge zone within Ferncliff Nature Reserve. And um, I like in my, in my mind the concept is um, when you do the driven section, it's driven because it's not really that safe to walk this part. But the driven section, you're essentially following infrastructure and water articulation, which is very fast. Um, so in your car, you're going pretty fast from the treatment from the treatment, the wastewater treatment works to the treatment works. And then when you get to the well field and you actually walk, you walk in relatively slowly in comparison to driving. And that kind of gives you an indication of how slow groundwater flows. Um, in comparison to a reticulation system. Um, so you can explain those concepts to, to people uh, as part of the trail. Um, and this is just some of the geology. Um, John Blaine, I'm sure we'll go into more detail tomorrow, but just showing the folding and different for, uh, formations of the TMG. This is actually in the coastal platform of Hermanus, and this is in the Himalayan Valley. Um, the well fields itself aren't that exciting. 
it's just a chamber. All the all the exciting stuff happens when you drill the boreholes. But it's what it's a world. It's pretty much South Africa's best municipal groundwater supply system. It's it's world class and managed on a scalar telemetry system. And final slide is the plan is to actually have an education center in one of the old buildings next to the old reservoirs as you drive into a minus and all that kind of information can be put in there in posters, um, doing murals on the old reservoirs and beautifying the area around um, the gateway well field as you drive into a minus. And this is some of the work we're doing in association with uh, Dr. John Brister of the Overberg uh, Geoscientist Group. So hopefully towards the end of this year, we'll have the minus water walk to the same level of detail as the Table Mountain Dams Trail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one question. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mike DeWitt. I'm based in, uh, at the moment, I'm based in, uh, in the Cape as well. Um, my interest is really on the um, evolution of the South African landscapes. Um, and um, in, in pursuing that interest, um, I had an opportunity to uh, look at probably the, the best preserved um, volcano that we have in South Africa. And um, it is a bit of a, a, a not well known uh, site, but I think it's something that uh, would step in very nicely with the talk that we had on education for people to, to have a look at a, a reasonably well preserved uh, volcano and its uh, geological um, associated rocks. Okay. So we're, um, just as a, as an interest of uh, location, um, it's um, not, not very far from Cape Town, 250 kilometers on the N1 to Marquisfontein, then the turn off to Sutherland, also a very good tar road. Um, as you can see here, uh, you climb up, up the escarpment uh, just before you get to Sutherland. And, and Salpeter Kop, which is the name of this volcano, is about uh, 20 kilometers from, uh, from Sutherland. Uh, easy, accessible, as I said, from, uh, from Cape Town, but also many people now driving from Johannesburg to Cape Town these days take uh, the, in, the uh, inland road um, through the Karoo, and there is a fairly good um, dirt road from uh, Priska through to uh, Fraserburg, from Fraserburg through to Sutherland, uh, and that way get to Cape Town. Uh, and an ideal place to uh, stop over is, um, is in Sutherland to uh, have a look at this site. Um, as a bit of background, the, uh, the site is part of a, um, uh, a um, estate called the Rochekloof Estate. You can Google it. Um, and um, it's uh, divided up in two large areas. One area is about 18,000 uh, square kilometers. The actual um, lodge is in the sort of central part of this, uh, of this area. Uh, and they pursued another area uh, uh, which is not linked to the uh, Rojo Clove estate, but is part of them, uh, is where the uh, Salpetokop volcano is. Uh, there is unfortunately a, a provincial road that, that uh, cuts through this area, so linking up the two areas is difficult. But uh, they uh, have a substantial uh, game in this area, um, and it's a, a wonderful place if you, if you like, like the Karoo. It's in the southwestern part of the Karoo. Uh, from a geological perspective, uh, it's a fairly uh, simple geology. This is the yellow is uh, part of the um, uh, yellow is part of the Beaufort um, group, um, and um, there are some dolerite sills which are part of the, uh, also accentuate the uh, escarpment just to the south of it. Um, and there is a whole group of Cretaceous uh, intrusions of which the Salpeter Cop is, is part. A matter of interest, there's the escarpment going through the southern part of, of Sutherland. There's the town of Sutherland. There are a whole group of intrusions in this area. I'm not going to go through them, but I just wanted to mention them. There are carbonatites, there are some kimberlites, there are some uh, potassium trachytes, there are some olivine melatites and ultra uh, mafic lampophires. So it's a, an area of, of uh, great in geological interest, um, but the main uh, feature, geological feature, um, which really is, is of, of significance is the Salpeter Kop uh, volcano. From a historical perspective, this area was first mapped by um, Cascrain and he produced the first um, 
divisional map in 1901. Um, and um, there's uh, Sutherland for, for uh, uh, orientation, Sutherland there. There's Saltpeter Cop. It used to have a different name. It used to be called Old, Sne Old Snail Cop. Uh, because it does get snow, snow in the winter. It was visited and described by um, Robert Gordon in 1778, um, and they called it Salt Peter, Salt Peter Hill. It was visited and described by, uh, by Liechtenstein in 1804, and, and the first geological visit was really by Andrew Wiley in, in uh, 1859. He, um, he visited this place and um, he described it um, as he noted, some very interesting uh, barite crystals, and he recognized some feldspars. Uh, so he called it a, a rugged bosses of a feldspar trap conglomerate. That was his description of this site, and um, and this is from uh, from Rogers' uh, description of um, early visit early geologists. Um, he described it as well as an immense dike of cellular ironstone with sulfide, barites, and other minerals. And the, the area is um, contains quite a lot of um, uh, ferruginization, so uh, that fits in with uh, with some some of the description that um, Andrew Wiley gave in 1859. But the first geological map of uh, Salpeter Kopf, there it is. Um, it has different names, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, and it's spelled differently today. But in those days, it was called Salpeter, as of the uh, the salt. It was described by Rogers and, and, uh, and the Toy in 1903, a year after the um, uh, South African Second War. Um, and they produced this geological map. And on this map, they identified various other uh, uh, necks and plugs of carbonatite and, um, and, and dikes. Um, so, but the main feature is really this, this, uh, this Salpeter Cop itself. It was only in 1975 that uh, De Wet from the uh, University of Stellenbosch started, um, did his MSc on this area and did a more detailed geological map at the time. His supervisor was uh, Favourt, uh, and Favourt then took it further. He, uh, he wrote various publications, particularly on the interest of the carbonatite in the, in the 1990s, <clears throat> and produced various uh, uh, various publications on it, but really more focused on the carbonatite side of the uh, of the uh, intrusion. I've uh, just completed a, a, a very detailed geological map of the crater itself. Uh, cr the crater itself is here in colored in green, and this was published this year uh, for, for those who are interested to look at uh, perhaps a bit more detail. And uh, while doing this, we um, in talks with the, the management of the Rochkova State, we're now looking at setting up uh, some trails over this uh, site, which is uh, really uh, incredibly interesting from uh, from an educational point of view. Interesting, if you if you look at the geomorphology of the of the uh, of the volcano, that's uh, a typical shot of the Salpeter Cop. Very dislike the uh, the typical copies that you get in the crew, the flat line copies. This is a, it stands out like a sore thumb, uh, and um, it has a very different shape um, than uh, than the rest of the crew. The, uh, the the actual hill is a remnant of uh, the tephra cone uh, next to the crater, so it's actually not the crater itself, but it's the tephra cone next to it, and uh, I'll try and explain that. Uh, in the next uh, over the next few slides, let me take you through a, a, a shot of flight over the uh, the site. This is uh, the volcano, the the uh, the tephra king, tephra cone on this on the north side of the crater. That's the crater just just to the edge of it um, that you you're seeing, and at the bottom of this tephra cone is the contact with the uh, the very bread shaded. Um, uh, bedrock, uh, the Belford bedrock uh, that below it. So the uh, the actual tephra here is probably in the order of uh, uh, forty to fifty meters thick. Let me let me just take you through that. As of interest, you can see the surrounding uh, horizons of the Belford, and then the, as I mentioned, the, the crater just just to the south of the uh, the, the peak. The, the height of the peak here is at seventeen uh, sixty six meters. So it's, a, it's quite an elevation and hence 
the winter does attract a lot of, uh, of snow and, uh, in, in this uh, Sutherland region. Now, if, if you look at, uh, you can pick this in Google Earth, this is an aerial photograph, but in Google Earth, you can see it very clearly as well. That's the, uh, the tephra cone on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the north side of the crater. The crater extends just to the south of it. And you'll see the, uh, the, up, the, uh, the circular ring structure around the uh, actual volcano. These are the updomed strata of the Beaufort. This is the Abraham Skull Formation. So it produces an incredibly interesting feature from, uh, from your uh, uh, imagery. Uh, and uh, it's really to do with the updoming that occurred just prior the uh, uh, intrusion of the, or the uh, extrusion of the, of the volcano. So, but the uh, actual crater is about a kilometer in diameter. So it's a sizable feature. And uh, we'll show you later how you can uh, access it. Just a couple of shots of the sort of rocks that you can see when you go uh, on the proposed trail that we, we'd like to put out. Um, you get the beautifully uh, fractured country rock. This is actually from a core of uh, one of the exploration companies that looked at this site in the 70s. Um, and uh, you get the, the uh, country rock breaches. Um, the uh, fractured country rock is in, in, in orange. The uh, country rock breaches are in yellow. You get the uh, you get some fantastic looking um, paraclassic breaches, uh, and again I'm not going to go into the technical detail of these, but they are surround. This is particularly uh, on the north side of the uh, of the complex, uh, where the uh, the top here where the beacon is at 766 meters, uh, and then you get some reworked paraclassics which are more bedded uh, and um, and more. Uh, um, so better sorted um, that have been reworked from the original um, uh, paraclastic pile. Um, and, 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 and it's not always easy to see some of these textures, particularly because, um, just to go back to this side, the, um, the elevation, the elevated uh, tephra cone on the north side has been highly hydrothermally altered. So it's, uh, it's very silicified and, and hence it's, uh, it's been resistant to erosion and stands up as a, as a positive feature. But if you look at some of the thin sections, you can still see, see some of the lapilli and some of the finer grain tufts associated with the spiroclastics. And unfortunately, one can't really see that easily in the field, but this will be part of the, uh, the guidebook that we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully put together. Um, in addition to that, there are some spiroclastics that sit outside the crater. Um, and uh, these were initially interpreted as uh, separate intrusions, um, but what they are more likely to be are um, uh, ejecta that, uh, that uh, were deposited outside the volcano as part of the eruption. Um, and they consist of uh, trochetic paraclastics. They can be bedded um, and they can be uh, deposited straight onto bedrock. You can see the, uh, there, are, there, is, there are no, uh, there's no evidence of any intrusion of this. So the, uh, the uh, uh, interpretation is that these things are in fact part of the uh, ejector that came out of the Kimball, uh, out of the, uh, so out of the um, uh, volcano. And but with that, one can project almost a paleo surface uh, on which some of these uh, ejector material have been deposited the contact of the ejector with the, with the country rock quite close to the volcano. So that would be a, a, a paleo surface that one can almost walk on at the time of the, of the eruption. In addition to that, there are some very nice looking uh, trecha dikes. They are um, again altered, they're full of feldspars. These are all altered feldspars that have been hydrothermally uh, altered. But there are several of these dikes on it that one can see and, and, and its relation related to um, to the to the intrusion itself. Walking into the crater um, itself, there are some uh, very nicely laminated uh, crater sediments here. They range from fine grain, almost tooth materials, to uh, more lapilli uh, tooth materials, coarser grained. They've got some uh, there's some erosional context between these various uh, sections, and they're also fairly steeply dipping, uh, dipping at the edge of the crater and uh, dipping more shallower towards the, uh, the center um, of the crater, which suggests that there has been some caldera collapse after the uh, eruption. 
part of the interest, economic interest of this particular intrusion was uh, the carbonatites. This, uh, there's a zone in blue here at the, at the south side of the, uh, of the crater, which has been injected by uh, carbonatite dikes, little dikelets. Um, there are various zones of uh, carbonatite of, that have replaced some of these uh, uh, epiclastic sediments. So uh, it's, it really gives you a good indication of the strati stratigraphic relationship. There are some interesting carbonatite dikes all over the place. But interestingly enough, some of the carbonatite breaches that exist outside of the, uh, the crater uh, are, uh, they are intrusion, they're um, uh, vent breaches, carbonatite vent breaches, and you can see the large Karoo class uh, rafts that exist in these um, breaches, but they also contain, in, in addition to the angular uh, country rock broths, they contain some very nicely rounded quartzite pebbles. And uh, when it weathers out, they leave a, 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 a carpet of rounded quartzite class that, uh, that is quite fun to walk over and to, uh, to look at. You can see these things are extremely well-rounded. Uh, there's no percussion scars in it. Um, and uh, the, the, some of them are, uh, are uh, bedded um, quartzites. Some have little pebbles in them, so they're con quartzite conglomerates. Some have been phenotized um, during the eruption, but generally it's been interpreted. Uh, and this is also, uh, if you cut some of these, uh, these things open, the, the majority consists of uh, quartzites, which have been interpreted as the Table Mountain Group uh, quartzites are sitting underneath the Karoo in this part of the world. You get some uh, tillite uh, uh, rounded xenoliths um, that are no doubt part of the of the Dwarka tillite sitting underneath. But there are also some things that look like a nepheline cyanides. So there's a range of of xenoliths beautifully rounded, as you can see here, almost golf ball size and and almost sorted in the uh, in the vent as they brought these, uh, these uh, Z rounded xenolates up. There's some photographic sections that we did in, in order to try and get the identification. But, um, and, and this is the, uh, uh, the uh, Nephilim cyanide xenolates with some beautiful uh, Nephilim and some um, feldspar crystals with some uh, needles of uh, natural light in it. All the, the ingredients to uh, try and identify it. There are some late stage, um, later stage for, um, intrusions in green, two of them actually, um, and uh, the one here in the northeast or uh, northwest are, um, there are two sites, there's one site of a, about 50 meters of nicely bedded um, uh, pyroclastics that sit uh, just next to a, a vent which, uh, which seems to be related. The, uh, the strike of these, uh, this, um, these pyroclastics are almost perpendicular to this vent um, and are, are not in, uh, are, and don't seem to be related to the, uh, to the Salpeter Cup volcano itself. Just going into the crater, that gives you some idea of what the crater looks like. We're looking north now, there's the uh, Salpeter Cup dome, or uh, um, Tephra cone. Um, and um, walking through this, there's a, a vehicle for scale. You can walk through this crater. And there's some there are some sites of uh, uh, fossil wood that have been found in that we found in this part of the of the crater, um, and the wood has been fairly well preserved. You can see the growth structures on on these wood specimens um, found in these epiclastics. Marion Banford from uh, Wits University looked at this wood and uh, established that this was a uh, a conifer uh, that had not been recognised in South Africa at this stage. She put an age as late Cretaceous, early Cainozoic. Um, but what, what is interesting about this, uh, the description of the, uh, the, the cell structures um, and the um, tangential or long uh, structures itself is that it, from there, she, uh, she interpreted this, this was a species that required a year round source of water, which was a, uh, a quite feasible living at, at probably at the edge of a crater lake. Um, and uh, was able to grow continuous throughout the year. It also it suggests that the, uh, the, the climate at the time was warm and humid with no or little seasonality. 
and this uh, this really supports the sort of global records of uh, of our warm late Cretaceous uh, climate that we had at the time. But, uh, just a comment, and, and one can see this very beautifully um, on on the trail are uh, the hydrothermal alteration, which is a late stage uh, fluids that came through these rocks, probably associated with the uh, carbonatites. And this is uh, these are paraclastics here that have been uh, slowly being replaced uh, as the uh, the fluids migrated through these through these rocks. Interesting one, one there there is a uh, a trail that goes right to the top, then there's a trail that goes right to the, the front of this uh, pyroclastic pile, and there's some uh, features that look like uh, femoral ac activities, uh, and this is where a lot of the iron and manganese uh, came through and, and uh, replaced some of these rocks. So there are, there are lots of volcanic um, um, characteristics that one can look at whilst going on these trails. Finally, there are some uh, tunnels that were dug at the bottom. Sorry, let me just go back. This is a photograph taken here at the bottom where there are some tunnels into the, uh, the tephracone. Uh, and um, from on the ceiling of those, you can see some uh, uh, almost um, growth of some salts. Uh, these are manganese nitrate salts that are produced by the uh, meteorotic recharge. And it's just suggested that the, the name from, uh, from for the volcano came from uh, from the salts that uh, that one can see on the on the faces and on the ceilings of some of those uh, some of those faces you know, rock faces. Um, just on the edge of the of the uh, um, the uh, the volcano, there are some. Uh, these are again photograph of some of the pyroclastics. There are some dolerite cloths in here that link quite closely to uh, the dolerites around it. So it certainly suggests that it's post karuan age. Some of the dating that has been done on some of the other rocks here uh, range mainly from sort of 75 for uh, many of the olivine melalatites. So that has been regarded as the age of the uh, Salpeter Cop intrusion. We've done some, uh, recently done some work on the appetites, uh, lots of appetites inside the, uh, inside the uh, uh, carbonatites. And with uh, Robert Bola and Robert Muir, we've produced an age of about 70 million years for the appetites. We've also looked at um, the potassium argon on sulfologopite minerals, and Pete Siegfried has done has been uh, very helpful uh, in doing that, and came up with an, an age of 66 plus or minus three. So at this stage, we're sitting at an age of 70 million years, um, a bit after the uh, olivine melanotites. And, um, but we have some, some uh, phlogopites that, we, that are presently being prepared for our argon dating to um, try and, and uh, tighten this age up a bit better. Um, some geophysical work that was done by Edgar Stettler and uh, the Geological Survey at the time suggests that you had a, a fairly big uh, negative anomaly sitting over Salpeter Cop, uh, and uh, that was probably due to low density trachytes and breaches. Uh, and it's surrounded by high density uh, carbonatite. So these carbonatites are, that we see in the field uh, certainly um, express themselves very nicely in, uh, in, the, gravities, in the gravity work. And um, if one looks at some of the Sukor boreholes, this is, uh, there's Sutherland, there's South Peter Cop, there's some deep holes that were drilled by Sukor in the 60s. Um, it certainly shows that the crew is about 2,000, 2,500 thick under here, and in many instances go into the uh, Cape, Fol Cape uh, sediments before hitting the uh, basement rocks of the Namak uh, Natal mobile belt. Interesting, you know, this particular hole here had no more uh, Cape sediments, so with the uh, xenoliths that came out of this uh, volcano here suggests that the contact uh, of the uh, of the Cape Fall Belt must be, or the Cape sediments must be sitting some just to the north of Saint Peter Cop. Uh, some uh, geophysical surveys were done, uh, and uh, it showed that the, this particular um, site was uh, quite rich in thorium. It had some uranium and, and potassium, but particularly in thorium. And this extension to the west, uh, to the east, is really related to. Um, uh, the drainage that drains out of the, the volcano. I'm not going to go through this, but uh, when uh, there has been substantial interest in this place, particularly in the 1880s from a diamond point of view, in those days, uh, 
anything that looked like a kimberlite and, and, and elephant certainly do do that and, and even so Peter Cook, there are areas that um, make one think after the discovery of the Kimberlite, Kimberley mines, there are some shafts and tunnels that uh, Rogers and the Tory have on their, on their map and they are still on, on site. Uh, Ryan Mind looked at this from uh, in the 1970s uh, from uh, the rare earths, niobium, thorium, zinc, etc. Unfortunately, um, there are some serious uh, mineralogical uh, challenges, so uh, metallurgical problems. So that really never came to it, but they found some gold. They managed to get Rio Tinto involved, but that gold never really materialized in, in something either. But when you walk around, you can still see some of the boreholes that exist, and I've plotted most of those um, on the map. There's some interesting minerals that one can uh, identify during your walk around. There are some, so there's quite a lot of barite, particularly in the, in the paraclastics but also some beautiful naturalite and, and other zeolites um, associated with the carbonatite. So running through quickly a, a model um, that, uh, that, that, we, that we're trying to put together and, and simplify, perhaps you have a, a 75 million year intrusion of uh, um, olivine melanotites uh, associated with heating in the mantle. Um, we don't see some serious updoming due to uh, the uh, development of a magma chamber and, and associated volatiles. Um, you then have the explosion uh, around 70 million years with uh, associated tephra material coming on the sides. Uh, and then finally, uh, the carbonatites coming at a later stage, whether they are associated with the, with the uh, earlier volcanism or whether they are, are separate. Um, intrusion is an academic uh, is an academic question. Uh, there is lots of debate on that, but I'm not going to go into that. Safe to say that there are lots of these carbonatites and carbonatite breaches in and around this volcano. And then um, at the at the late stage, we had a very late stage uh, uh, final puffing of of the volcano with some eruption of these uh, late stage volcanoes when the crater was probably already formed. We had some water in the crater and Konov was growing around it. Uh, and this is what it looks like uh, today with the remnants of your tephras and also your, um, your uh, uh, paraclassics on the top. So what this really means is that you have this very well-preserved Kimball uh, uh, intrusion, trachyte related intrusion, still sitting at, at the surface of this Cretaceous landscape. So we know that uh, the, most of the erosion took place uh, that we see in post Gondwana times in the Cretaceous times, but at the end of the Cretaceous, there is a, there's a major change in the erosion rates. And, and it's something that we still not fully understand, but it's something that you can see very clearly visiting this site. And it's, uh, it's something that, that one can uh, explain to uh, students very nicely by looking at this. Now, the access to it, um, there is a, this is the Sutherland Merville. Uh, provincial road, it's a dirt road. You turn off on a farm, a very reasonably farm road, and then go into a three kilometer uh, four by four track, which is quite challenging in places. You can park your vehicle here, or one can park your vehicle here and then walk up. Um, and then there are various trails that one can uh, walk around to see uh, certain of these features that I've described. Uh, we're busy trying to. Um, uh, lay out some of these trails and uh, and and develop that uh, in, over the next year or so. In addition to that, on Rojo Clove itself, there are some very interesting uh, dinosaur sites, uh, fossil uh, Burford fossil sites, and um, just next door to for, to some Let me check it on LinkedIn. is the uh, the South African yeah. Large Telescope, a site well worth visiting. This is where we stand on the uh, the salt area, and you can actually see South Peter Cop just sticking out there. Shows you how close it is. Um, and uh, Sutherland itself has some interesting um, activities. There are some shopping opportunities here at the Sutherland Mall, or you can go and see uh, movies that they project on, these, uh, on, this, on the ceiling of these domes. Very, very interesting movies also about space. So Rochaclof itself, brilliant site for seeing some game, particularly in the winter. They're growing some wines around this. There's some fantastic wines there, but also for for night sky and, and uh, looking at the stars, uh, they've got some facilities there now that, that you can do that. So well worth a visit. And as uh, 
uh, an integrated uh, area with, with some uh, very interesting sites. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Good morning and welcome to our presentation. My name is Lauren Hoyer, and today I'm going to be taking you through the geology of the UKZN Westville campus. This will be the first part of the presentation, and my colleague Tanya Reinhardt will be taking over once I'm done. This presentation is going to go through what is the pilot study for the updating of the geology of Durban brochure. This hasn't been updated since 1998 when it was published by the Geological Education Museum of the University of Natal in Durban. What we aim to do is to revolutionize how this brochure is presented. And what we intend to do is create an interactive PDF which will enable people to look at different geosites around Durban. This interactive PDF will allow people to look at a geological map of Durban where different geosites are highlighted. They can then click on a particular site that they would like to visit, either virtually or in person, and they can find out more information about this site. So the format of the updated brochure is going to include a whole bunch of different pieces of information. The first thing we're going to look at is the the Marion Hill Formation, which is from the Natal Group. And this is an example of what the structure of the brochure would look like. So we'll have a series of different sites highlighted, and this is the one we're going to look at in the next few slides. So as you can see, we've got a number to the slide. Um, so that is number one, and that is showing the site number for that particular area. And it's also showing the safety of the site, where green represents that the site is safe to visit. We obviously don't want to take people to dangerous areas, but if we can help people to understand that some of the sites are more accessible than others, and that obviously makes a lot uh, more viewer friendly. There is also a colored tab on the left hand side of the entry. This shows the age of the unit. So units with similar ages will have the same color on the left hand side. There's also a blurb about the site so that you can read up on the information to know what to expect at that particular geosite. And then lastly, we have a scannable QR code, which will redirect the viewer to a video that is available to watch about that particular site. So that if people are unable to visit the site in person, at least they've been able to see it through a video and have an explanation of how the geology there is formed and any particular structures or features that would be of interest. So let's click on that QR code and see where it takes us. Today, we're going to virtually visit some of the geosites that have been pointed out on the UKZN campus in Westville. We're going to first look at the Natal Group Sandstone Outcrop. Welcome to UKZN Geosite 1. Here we will look at sandstones of the newspaper member, which belongs to the Marion Hill Formation of the Natal Group. The small outcrop behind me is made up of sandstone, one of the most common rock types on Earth. These rocks formed 490 million years ago, and they were the first sedimentary rocks deposited onto the much older granitic basement that we see exposed in the valley of a thousand hills and along the southern beaches of Pozzuoli Natal. One of the most obvious features about this group of rocks is their color. They are often pinkish to purplish in color because of the minerals that make up the rock. Here we have quartz, which is typical in sandstones, but we also have a lot of alkali feldspars, which gives the rock its color. If we take a closer look, we can see the sand grains in the rock, so we can call this rock an Arcosic Aronite. When we see these sandstones at different places around Durban, there are other features that we can observe, such as cross bedding and ripple marks, which form from water flowing over the sediment. Using all of this information, we can piece together exactly how the rock formed. And what we've learned from this rock is that it was deposited by a river. If we look at the rivers that occur in KZN today, these rivers are called meandering rivers. They move quite slowly, so they can carve meanders into the landscape. These Natal Group sandstones were formed by braided rivers, which are much more energetic than meandering rivers. Because of all the special features like cross bedding and ripple marks, we can deduce that these braided rivers drain from mountain ranges that were once in the northeastern region of KZN 
and extended all the way down south to Margate. These rocks also make amazing cliff outcrops at different places around Durban because they are naturally harder than the granitic rocks below them. We see these incredible cliffs in the Kranzkloof Valley in Kloof and at Aravi Gorge, south of Durban. The next place we're going to visit is the site of the glacial pavement. Welcome to UKZN Geosite 2. Here we will be looking at the power of ice and the effects glaciers can have on old landscapes. I'm standing on an incredible outcrop that has preserved a process most of us living in the subtropics are unfamiliar with, that being the movement of ice across the Earth's surface. As you can imagine, this must have happened a long, long time ago, considering the weather that we are accustomed to in sunny Durban. The rock beneath my feet is part of the Natal Group sandstone. It was deposited about 490 million years ago by a series of rivers. But we're here today not so much to look at the sandstone, but at the features that are preserved on the surface of the sandstone, which reveal something about the movement of this ice across the Earth's surface. The very surface of these rocks that we see exposed today was also exposed at the Earth's surface 300 million years ago. And the term we give to a surface like this that is re-exposed many millions of years later is a paleo surface, in other words, an old surface. They often provide clues to us as geologists to the processes that operated either in the earth or on the earth many, many years ago. And what's especially interesting here are these lines that we see on the surface of the rock that go across this entire outcrop and they're very regular. About 300 million years ago, the surface of the earth in South Africa was very different to what it is today. It was much colder. And why was this the case? Well, South Africa was once at basically what is now the South Pole 300 million years ago. And this allowed for very, very thick ice sheets to form. As the ice sheet moves, it carries at its base a lot of sediment in the form of uh, cobbles or pebbles or stones or rocks. And as these are dragged across the top of the surface, in this case of the Natal Group sandstone, it can polish and smooth the surface, but it can also leave behind these lines in the surface, which we call striations. And in this case, because we know they were formed by a glacier, we can call them glacial striations. So not only is it incredible to imagine that there were once glaciers here, moving over this rock in a totally different yeah. landscape, we can also determine which direction the glaciers moved by feeling these striations. In one direction they will feel quite smooth, and in the opposite direction they will feel quite rough. Now that we've considered these glacial striations and we can understand which direction that ice flowed, it's important to understand that it will flow in the same way as a river, and that is towards a sea. In this case, we know that the glaciers would have flowed over this outcrop in that direction to my right-hand side to what would have been the Karoo Sea. It's important to understand, though, that the current sea, the Indian Ocean, next to Durban, is in fact in the completely opposite direction. And this gives us an idea of how our landscape has changed in those 300 million years. And it's really incredible that if we just take the time to look at some of the smaller details in any outcrop, such as this one, we can learn a substantial amount about our Earth's history. The third site we're going to see today is that of the Dwyker Group Tillite, which occurs along the embankment on the northeastern section of the sports field at UKZN Westville. Welcome to UKZN Geosite 3, where we will take a look at an outcrop of Dwyker Tillite and the depositional environment where it formed. Right guys, well the rocks we're looking at here today provide a glimpse into a rather unusual time in Durban's history. In fact, these predate Durban by nearly 300 million years and point to a time when South Africa was part of the supercontinent of Gondwana. At that time our location was near the South Pole and much of the South Africa that we know today was covered by immense sheets of ice. It is hard to imagine such a change from today's hot and humid conditions, yet we know this to be the case from evidence held up in these very rocks here. As you can imagine, thick glaciers move very slowly, yet the total amount of movement over hundreds of thousands of years can cause huge amounts of erosion over vast distances. Like the fjords of Norway, glaciers carved the landscape here surrounding these rocks, plucked material at their base and transported it so that it eventually was deposited as this rock, the Dwyker Tillite. 
Of all the agents that can move sediment, ice is the most impressive as it doesn't discriminate in what it transports. We find that these materials, when deposited, have a wide range of grain sizes, from boulders, as big as houses or trucks, to small cobbles such as this, to even very tiny materials like this, no bigger than something like silt or clay. We can also see here a variety of different rock types, from metal group sandstones to small pieces of granite. So a very cosmopolitan mix of sediments or clasts within this, just because of the non-discriminant way in which ice can pick up materials. What we find many times is that things like these granites have been transported from very far away. So for these in particular, these have come from an area, say the Valley of a Thousand Hills, with granites that are much older than the rocks that encapsulate these clasts today. So what's especially interesting about these features is something that we call drop stones. So this is a great example of a drop stone here. The presence indicates that the glaciers had extended out past the land into the ocean where they then broke off to form icebergs. Once these icebergs melted, the material they once held up in that ice is dropped to the seabed. You can see how in this instance here, very fine laminations of clay or mud encapsulate the stone and have been deformed around it as it is impacted onto the seabed. Much the same as if you were throwing a pebble into a shallow muddy puddle. What's especially interesting again about this outcrop is that 490 million years ago, the Natal group sandstones were deposited. These are found some 50 meters higher than this rock at present and at an equal elevation just behind us here. Usually older rocks occur below younger rocks as they are deposited first and later generations of rock are deposited on top. These follow two fundamental rules in geology called the law of superposition and the law of original horizontality. What we find here is a rather unusual situation where we have younger rocks occurring below or adjacent to older rocks. This kind of relationship can be explained in ice's incredible ability to carve landscapes. The entire campus rests atop a finger or an island of older rocks in the form of the Natal Group sandstones and all around it resting in deep valleys that were carved by moving glaciers are these very tillites that we're looking at here, deposited within those valleys once the ice began to melt. In effect, where we are standing now, or where I'm sitting, is a large valley several hundred meters deep cut by thousands upon thousand years of ice motion. The last geosite to see here is the Science and Technology Education Centre at UKZN. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. We hope to present more geosites in the not too distant future. Here is where I hand over to my colleague Tanya Reinhardt. She's going to take you on a tour of the Geology Education Museum, which is housed at the Science and Technology Education Centre at UKZN, also known as STEC at UKZN. Here we go. Okay, so this is, this is a model um, of a tsunami, and so Brian was already talking about that model helped to understand, um, you know, things like uh, uh, procedures and so on. Um, this is one of the exciting things that we show the learners, um, how does a tsunami work, so we talk about receding waters uh, and so on, and I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown of what it's going to look like, and we do a big flush, and unfortunately my tsunami was supposed to be a little bit bigger than this, and it's a bit small, but I promise you if you're going to come and see it in life, um, it's going to be a little bit bigger. Also what we try to do is um, here in the Science Center, it is actually a, a mixture between the Geology Museum, which is here, and uh, the Science Center, which is on this side here. And I just quickly want to show you our uh, famous periodic table, uh, where we have real elements, because this is something that people don't really get to see, real elements. Um, and also, uh, we were talking about platinum, the riches of pl platinum. Here we have a piece of Marenska reef, to also show, uh, you know, uh, the learners or the, the or the public that we basically where where the rock uh, where the sorry the elements come from. Here we have gold. This is a piece of gold also from um, uh, from local South Africa. Okay, let's go into the museum. Again, talking about models, um, we try to get students involved as much as possible. So the students build, for example, this mine uh, uh, shaft mine sinking model. Also, uh, at one point, they built a mining model showing uh, underground mining, the Roman pillar methods, 
And we also tried to explain, you know, how coal was formed in the same process. We also refer this, of course, to the, to the nice geological heritage. Uh, where can we find, for example, coal in KwaZulu-Natal? Okay, let's come inside. So we are not big. In fact, we are very small. Um, this is about 80 square meters, uh, but we try to be as interactive as possible, just as to the uh, spirit of the site center. Just follow me. So here we have different displays. Classical displays that show, um, for example, um, sulfur mineral veins, you have our manganese. We also try to go a little bit on the, on the publicity side. So this is a, a, a new one that we did on birthstones. And uh, if you want to find out what your birthstone is, you have to come and visit. And uh, also, this is quite nice. Um, this is our uh, fluorescent light box that you can have a look inside. Okay. Also, of course, uh, KZN is very famous for its rich rocks and fossils. And, and I just have to go back because I have to show you this. Um, people always think that rocks are very rigid, uh, but they're in fact not. Uh, here we have a bending rock in action. So you can lift it up and it bends. If you've never ever seen it, um, you can play around with it when you're coming here. Okay, as indicated, here are our fossils. And I usually make a joke that I'm the youngest fossil here, living fossil here in the museum. So uh, also, of course, our famous Peru fossils, so, so the Olestrosaurus fossils, um, representing um, KZN geology. We also try to educate the public and the learners about useful rocks and minerals, um, which is quite important to have the link between, you know, what do you actually use in everyday life? And uh, so here we have examples from, from the kitchen. So from your uh, uh, cassiterite, bauxite, goodite that you use for your, for your uh, tins uh, to, you know, things like kaolinite that you use for your uh, properties. I also want to show you, of course, the very famous diamond here, which is the pride and joy of the museum. And it's the largest fake diamond uh, that we have here in the museum. Okay, so uh, I often get questions about, you know, um, is it real, is it not real? Sorry, guys. It is unfortunately not real, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, again, uh, this is some things about the bathroom that you can use. We also try to be as hands-on, as I said, as hands-on as possible. So we have tables where uh, the public and the learners can actually pick up the fossils, have a look at them, investigate, uh, investigate them. Yeah. Uh, here we try to replicate the rock cycle with our sedimentary rocks. A uh, very famous example from the Bedwapsaran conglomerates uh, to, you know, the Ecker Shale, again, local is lekker, uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, we try to show them some features here, just like these ripple marks or this remarkable piece of a mud crack um, that, uh, that we have here. Also, what is quite interesting, of course, are the different uh, kind of properties of the rock. So for example, your, your banded iron formation rock is very, very heavy compared to your, sorry, pumice. So again, this gets the learners or the public usually quite uh, uh, excited to feel actually the difference. Also to show them that, you know, some rocks and minerals are in fact made uh, Here we have our igneous rocks. Um, so we have a selection of extrusive and intrusive rocks. The majority of these rocks are in fact from, um, from South Africa, from uh, KZN. We have the banded rhyolites and the rhyolites, um, also the basalts. Uh, um, so we have some, uh, and these, here's some kimberlites here. And we come to the most precious part, of course, the metamorphic rock. Um, and if you are a, a hard rock geologist, people have to admit metamorphic rocks are the in rocks. Uh, so we have a selection of uh, beautiful 
uh, metamorphic rocks. Um, so this is one of the, the very famous ones that, um, that, that uh, learners especially love, especially the girls. Um, and we had a very uh, interesting geologist who calls this a glitterite. Uh, so we also get uh, samples uh, from other parts of, of the world, um, usually uh, brought to us by lectures or by lecturers. Okay, so we also have microscopes, uh, which we find very useful. Um, kids often uh, have never been uh, looked through a microscope. So here we have our fantastic polarizing microscope where you, they get really excited about the beautiful color changes of a polarizing microscope. And of course, um, we try also to show them the small scale world. And uh, here we have our sand display where we have sand from all over the world, again, collected by our lecturers, which we are very grateful of. So we have, as you can see, so we have lots of sand from uh, uh, Southern Africa, from South Africa, but also from the rest of the world. And here we also treat, uh, uh, educate them about the, the special Durban beach set, okay? And the reason why the Durban beach, for example, have got these black strips alongside the beach. And we can go a little bit further into more details so we can tell them how these uh, uh, sand actually forms through weathering and erosion. Uh, we can show them, in fact, also what makes up these little, uh, these little uh, black patches on the Durban beach by looking through the microscope and discovering the little black grains inside, which were are your heavy minerals. Anya, you've so got just a five minutes, five minutes left. Five minutes, Steve? Just under, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so heavy minerals, I'm about to finish off anyway. So heavy minerals, um, so they can feel the difference. Uh, they can use a magnet to extract, for example, the magnetite in the heavy mineral sand. We can show them, in fact, you know, um, so how this, this forms, so when the waves are coming in, washing away the lighter particles, what stays behind are the black grains, which are your heavy minerals. Again, local is lacquer. So we show them, you know, for example, the marble. And let's just quickly talk about our educational things. Uh, we've heard from Barry that um, this morning that educational resources are very important. Uh, we have our own suite of posters that are freely available online. Uh, that the, the learners or, uh, or the teachers can contact us for, and we would send them the PDF so that they can print it out. Um, we have our geology of KZN uh, posters here, uh, one in English, one in Easy Zulu, uh, which is also freely available. Same goes for the, for the brochure. Um, Lauren already mentioned the geology of Durban brochure, which we are going to renew. This is something that we dished out to schools. Uh, he was talking about rocks. We basically use rocks from KZN. So this is our famous KZN rock box, which we distributed to over a thousand schools over the years. We also develop our own materials, our own little kits, um, and very showed you the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, mineral uh, uh, kit. So this is kits that we distribute uh, during the events like National Science Week. Um, this is uh, something that we've done fairly recently. We visited schools, we did uh, a, a how to make a fossil kit and we translated the sheet, actually the instruction sheet into Easy Zulu. And with that, I'm basically finished. Um, if there are any questions, if there's anything that you want to see, uh, let me know and I can just zoom into it. Thank you very much, Tanya. Yes, we have a minute or two for questions. If people want to see anything in the museum quickly. If not, I can quickly show you that we're also uh, dealing with the, the hermeneutic side. So this is also a poster that we developed. Um, so this is our um, infamous cabinet, very popular, um, again, with the, with, the, with the higher grade learners, because this is what they uh, tend to learn in schools. Uh, so. We have fossil casts, uh, thanks to the courtesy of uh, um, University of Witwatersrand. And yeah, so that's it from my side. Thank you very much. You've put together a very nice educational center there. Thank you, Steve. 
So I'm going to talk about something quite different. It's not so much geoheritage as history of, of geosciences, and, uh, but it's sort of linked to geoheritage. It's part of our geological history. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is something uh, I came across um, in my research last year. So I'm going to talk about George William Stowe's description of a large salt pan near the Vaal River between Christiana and Blumhoff in 1876. George William Stowe is one of the pioneering geologists of South Africa in the 19th century. He was a British born uh, geologist and ethnologist, and he worked in Bricoland West in the 1870s. Now he is originally from Britain and he had originally been intended to study medicine and he had attended five years of medical lectures at King's College London, but then he abandoned his studies and moved to South Africa at the age of 21. In fact, he was originally supposed to have moved to, to China, but then he saw a friend's uh, um, letters uh, from his uncles who were living in the Eastern Cape. And uh, they said, it's a wonderful place. And he decided, okay, he's gonna to move to South Africa. And that's uh, exactly what he did. And uh, he arrived uh, in the Eastern Cape um, at, uh, in uh, about 1843. When he arrived in the Eastern Cape, um, his interest in geology was stirred by the lectures uh, for the public given by Dr. Guybon Atherstone and Dr. Richard Rubich, who were two of the medical doctors who were also pioneers in the geological studies in the Eastern Cape region. And um, so he was stimulated by their lectures and got an interest in geology. And in 1859 to 61, he published papers on the fossils and the geology of the Sundays River Valley. And then after visiting the diamond fields of Greekwell and West, which had just been discovered, uh, he published a paper on the diamond gravels of the Vaal River in 1871 in the Journal of the Geological Society of London. And so this brought him to the attention of the authorities at the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and at that time, there was no geological survey established in the Cape. And um, they re relied on the uh, services of experts who they hired uh, to do geological work uh, as, on a consultancy basis. And uh, he was commissioned to do the first geological survey of Bricoland West, where the important diamond fields were situated. Now at that time, Bricoland West was not exactly part of the uh, Cape Colony, the colony of the Cape of Good Hope, but it was sort of um, somehow annexed by the British. It was adjacent to the Boer Republic of the Orange Free State. And uh, uh, there was also um, you know, uh, some dispute about the, the ownership of that region, but it was um, to the, uh, near the Vaal River. And uh, the, the British authorities were keen to get somebody to do geological work in this area. So um, they commissioned his work and he published um, a, a huge work called the Geological Notes upon Bricoland and West in the Geological Society's journal in 1872. And in that same year, he was elected a fellow of the Geological Society of London. In 1874, after he had published his, his work on Griqualand West, he was tasked by the Cape Parliament to map the region between the Val and the Modder rivers, because this is an area again with a lot of diamond workings and it was of great economic interest. Stowe then produced a comprehensive three volume work in 1876, and it was called Notes of a Geological Survey of a Portion of Griqualand West. He was supposed to have been paid a grand sum of 50 pounds for this uh, task, but he was never paid for it. And his work was actually never published. Um, but these three massive tomes, they're big sort of elephant folio type volumes um, that were um, handwritten manuscripts together with lots of illustrations uh, that he had made. They ended up with the Geological Society of South Africa and where they were consulted by Professor Robert Young who used it for his 1908 biography of, uh, of Stowe. And these volumes were eventually donated in the 1910s by the Geological Society to the National Library in Cape Town, where they have been sitting for more than a hundred years in their rare book collection that you see in this, in this slide on the bottom. Uh, Robert Young produced the first uh, biography of uh, William Stowe. Uh, there was a, a brief uh, obituary when he died um, by his friend uh, Rupert Jones, but uh, this was the first full-length biography and 
thus far the only one, um, of uh, the work of uh, William Stowe. And uh, it was based uh, in part on those uh, three volumes that are sitting in the National Library, uh, uh, which uh, give a lot more details about the work that he was doing uh, in that region. Now, aside from his interest in geology, he was also uh, interested in ethnography and he studied the, 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 the peoples uh, who were living in the Northern Cape region at that time, uh, mainly uh, what he called the Hottentots um, the, or the, what you would call the, the Hoi and Sun peoples today. And uh, also he was uh, greatly interested in the rock art that you saw abundantly, uh, especially rock engravings uh, in the rocks that you see in the, in the uh, Cripple and West region. So he published uh, this book, which was published in 1905 posthumously, um, edited by George Steele, the historian. This was uh, a testimony to his interest in ethnography and also his interest in rock art, which he made a very uh, useful and abundant copies of uh, many, uh, from many different sites where he saw rock art, rock paintings, and he made copies of these. And um, this was uh, uh, collated and eventually published posthumously uh, uh, much later on. Now, the interest in rock art uh, was uh, stimulated by the work of uh, William Wilhelm Blake, the uh, linguist uh, who came to South Africa in the 18th century, 19th century. And uh, Blake uh, was a linguist who tried to, to link the, the Sun languages with languages um, and in other parts of the world. Um, and uh, he had interviewed uh, people who took him to the sites to interpret rock art. And uh, one of his uh, major collaborators was Lucy Lloyd, his sister-in-law. And uh, uh, eventually also his daughter, Dorothea Blake, who became also a linguist. Uh, and uh, they were all interested in the origins of, of, of art. And today there is a, a major archive at the University of Cape Town that is digitally recording all of their, their work, uh, all of their uh, work about rock art. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an area of great interest. Um, in archaeology and in ethnographic studies in South Africa and art history studies at both UCT as well as the National Museums, Zico Museums, and the National Library. Long after his death, uh, Dorothea Blake actually took some of the work of uh, William Stowe, the rock paintings, and in 1930 she put together this book on the rock paintings in South Africa from parts of the Eastern Province in Orange Free State, um, uh, and that was... Uh, uh, put, put together uh, by Dorothea Blake. Now, coming to the geological work of, of Stowe, he, uh, his major work was his work on the Geological Survey of Bricoland West, which was commissioned by the Cape uh, government. And initially, this work was published as an abstract. Here you see the full abstract in two pages, published in the Journal of the Geological Society in London in 1873. Um, and then this work had been presented on his behalf by his friend, Professor Rupert Jones. And uh, um, the following year, the full paper, a very long paper was published, uh, Geological Notes by Brickwell and West. And in this paper, he produced a geological map. Uh, this is the region that he's talking about. And it shows the Harp Plateau, which is uh, underlain by rocks of the Transvaal supergroup. And then the Fentersdorp rocks, which are outcropping in this sort of area. So these are the two main rock types that you find in this region of, uh, of Brickwell and West. And he was the first to map these rocks. And um, you can see that uh, he, he, he covered a, a large area, which he, he mapped on his own. He also produced uh, maps of various salt pans, uh, both in the, the Brickwell and West region. And as I will show you later on in the stalk in the Transvaal region as well. So he, he mapped the pans and some of the ridges uh, surrounding them. This is the area around the confluence of the Orange and the Val rivers, um, which is an in, uh, area with um, of diamond diggings. And uh, this is what he published uh, as a result of that first commission. But then um, where, after he published this, he was, he was commissioned by the Cape government to continue mapping uh, along the Val River to the northeast. So in this, in this direction towards the northeast, uh, he continued mapping. And that is the, the, the uh, product of that mapping 
that occupies those three fat volumes that are sitting in uh, the National Library today. And uh, so in the first volume uh, of that work, um, it's labeled part one, Khay Kharib or Val River, uh, from the uh, 14 streams to the Clarain Poor. And uh, in this volume, he wrote a description of a large salt pan, which is situated close to the Val River, between, halfway between Christiana and Blumhoff. And, and today, this span appears on the one in 250,000 geological sheet on Christiana uh, of the Council for Geoscience, which is based on orig original one in 50,000 sheet mapping by Buerta in eight, 1985, where it is marked as a salt mine. I will show you uh, some uh, photographs of this later on. Now, modern satellite images of the salt pan show that its shape is still very similar to that when it was first mapped by Stowe in 1876, but it varies in size considerably depending on recent rains. And these pans overlie the basaltic lavas of what Stowe then called the Val Rock, which we now know as the Allen Ridge Formation of the Fentestorp Supergroup, the uppermost unit in the Fentestorp. And uh, although it was then part of Brickwall and West, this pan then became part of the Transvaal Republic, then the Transvaal Province, and is now today in the Northwest Province of South Africa. This turns out to have been the first detailed description of a salt pan in this Transvaal region, and we preceded by two years Anthony Trollope's first description of the Pretoria salt pan, that famous Zwang um, crater. This is the description that uh, Stowe gave. It, it, it takes up about two pages. I'm not going to go through all of it, but he says um, about five or six miles to the northeast of Piet Buerta's house. That is the last description that he, he had along, along this river. And uh, uh, at that time, the, these towns didn't exist, you know, Christiana Blumhoff. Um, and he said the season of 1873 being an exceedingly wet one, the supply of salt in 1874 was considerable. At the time of my visit, some 50 or 60 people were engaged in gathering it, and some 800 bags had been obtained. So in fact, this was a salt pan that was being exploited as a source of salt and of economic interest at that time. Uh, and it depends on the rains. If there's a lot of rain, the next season is going to have a lot of salt. And uh, when he described this, he says, in going to this place, the first portion of the road passes between a succession of weathered or but rounded bosses and ridges of the Var Rock, which is uh, the fender stop lavas as we would know it today. And he goes on in his description, I'm not gonna go through all of this. He describes the salt pan um, in, in, in some fairly, fairly good detail, um, mentions the number of freshwater springs uh, running uh, along the edges of the pan. Uh, there's also a, a little uh, a hill that separates the Northern and Southern parts of the pan. And from that hill, he made some sketches, which I'm going to show you. Um, at the end of his description, he says, the salt is evidently carried into the pan by the water of the springs from some of the surrounding deposits. Thus, upon evaporation, precipitates a thin film of salt from the saturated solution, which during the dry season is gathered into small heaps and after being allowed to drain, is carried away. He already had figured out how these salt pans uh, form and how they work uh, just from the evaporation. So let me just take you um, to the modern day geological map. This is the 1 in 250,000 Council for Geoscience sheet for Christiana. And on this, the two predominant colors, uh, or three predominant colors, let's say, uh, the green colors that you see predominating in the middle part are the Fentestorp. The blue colors are the overlying Transvaal supergroup. Um, the yellow colors are just quaternary alluvium and, and overburden. And uh, in the middle here, there's a little inlayer of the older basement in pink are the granites. And in purple is the remains of one of the greenstone belts, um, the Amalia greenstone belt. So that is the basement overlain by Fenderstorp lavas, overlain by, by dolomites of the Transvaal supergroup, and then younger alluvium. Now the salt pad, the, the Val River in this uh, runs across like this. Um, in this region, in this map, and the salt pan is situated uh, right down here. Um, if I show you a close up of that region, um, this is where it is. We are looking at this area now. Um, so the green here, is the, uh, the immediate basement around there, is the Fentestorp lavas, and uh, in yellow is the younger alluvium quaternary, and uh, this is the area that you see 
a salt pan. It's just known as a salt pan or salt pan. And it's on a farm called salt pan. So there's no other name for it. Uh, the, there is another name um, of, a, of a, a right next door called career pan. Uh, and sometimes it's referred to by that name. But it's really just known as the salt pan. And you can see it's got a mine symbol with sodium. It's, a, it's been a salt mine um, for, for a long time. Now, this is the map that was actually produced by Stowe. It's in, uh, it's, uh, in color and uh, it shows um, a plan view uh, and he's got uh, an explanation, uh, a beautifully handwritten explanation in the side. And it says here, um, um, one is weathered boulders and then uh, Ditto forming a, a flat uh, boss. Uh, and then uh, uh, shoulders, the springs that are shown here of fresh water, uh, saline springs, black saliferous mud, um, calcareous uh, and other types of uh, lacustrine deposits, and some red sand and clay. So these are the sort of rock types that is identified. And you can see it's a, it's a beautiful map. Uh, hand drawn, and it shows all the elements that you need for a map. You have the north arrow, you have the scale, and uh, uh, this is what uh, all maps need. And it's not really this dictum of uh, having a map and a scale is not always followed. If you look at even modern maps being produced today, they often lack a scale uh, or they, they, they don't have a proper uh, uh, north arrow. So <laughs> You should remember that this is the way things uh, were always done and should be still done. And here we see an unusual perspective view combined with a cross section. So you are standing in the, in the middle. If I just go back, if I can, yeah, if I go back here. So there is um, the salt pan here and, and it has a, a hill in the middle and then the salt pan continues to the north. So it's got this funny sort of uh, shape like a bean shape. And standing on the on the edge of, of one of these uh, uh, this this hill, looking back over there, is this perspective view that you get. Uh, so looking into the distance, it's the edge of the pan. And here's the salt pan. Uh, these are the saliferous muds in the, in the foreground, and uh, you can see it says black saliferous mud. That says gray, and then that's the salt pan. And in the distance, you can see number one. It's got high uh, a high ridge and springs. Um, and, and so on. Uh, notice that he's got uh, on the side of this, uh, this pan, this area here at A, he's got a, a, a section line. And that section line is a cross section which is shown in the bottom of this diagram. So down here is an actual cross section that shows uh, going from this high ground in the, in the, in the back. And there is this, the edge of this, uh, the, the, the shoreline. Sorry, if I just go back. There's the, the shoreline and then going into the actual um, uh, pan itself. So you can see that the shoreline consists of these units, which are labeled um, as uh, five, six, and seven. And five, you see here, is sandy friable Mali deposits with um, uh, a slightly saline taste. So he tasted it as well. And then uh, this is with uh, infiltration of calcareous tufa. And then uh, at the top, uh, it's a, um, uh, there's a calcareous uh, noduliferous deposits at the very top. And then eight at the bottom here is outcrop of evaporating, uh, of erratic boulders, which are at the, at the base um, in the, in the, at the bottom of this pan. This is um, a view uh, that you will see of that pan today if you go on Google Earth and uh, you see um, the, the same sort of shape, you see that, that the pan has this, this, this funny shape with an island or a peninsula sticking out into the middle and uh, of, of high ground. And uh, you can see the very shallow um, area down here, the deeper parts of the pan uh, over there. Now, this is uh, uh, an image that was taken um, in, uh, uh, a, a, in, a, in 2019. Um, but if you look at the same image, that was taken at a, in another season. You can see that the pan is expanded uh, quite greatly after the uh, the rains, and uh, the pan is expanded. And so this is what happens when there's a, a good rainy season like we're having now. Um, the pan will expand, and then the following year when it dries out, you'll have a lot of salt that's deposited on the edge, and that is exactly what Stowe had recorded back in 1876. 
So if I compare the two images, the, the actual drawing that Stowe had made in 1876 with the modern uh, Google Earth image from 2021, you can see great similarities. And you can see that there's not been much uh, change in the shape of this, this pan uh, over the uh, preceding uh, um, century and a half. That was uh, uh, just a little uh, extract out of that three volume work um, which uh, is still sitting in the um, uh, National Library. And, and how I came across that is that I was doing research uh, on something totally different in the National Library. And um, as I was uh, uh, going past one of the tables, I just saw the name Stowe on, on a big folio volume. And I thought, what is that? that? That's interesting. And the librarian showed it to me. And these were some of the drawings that he had made for this big uh, report of his. And he had fantastic drawings of uh, showing some of the glacial pavements. He was, in fact, one of the pioneers of the study of glaciation in the Karoo uh, in, in the Northern Cape. And uh, I intend to, to write up that section on the, the glacial deposits. It's in one of the three volumes. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to do that over the next year. Um, I then discovered that these three volumes who had been taken out because they are being scanned at the moment by the National Library after having been sitting there for more than 100 years. Uh, they have decided to, to scan these uh, as, as part of a, a project on scanning the rock art that Stowe was, was interested in. Following his uh, unsuccessful attempt uh, at getting a commission from the Northern Cape or getting paid for what he had done uh, for producing those three volumes for which he wasn't paid, he then uh, found a job uh, with, as a surveyor, a geological surveyor with the government of the Orange Free State Republic. And uh, they, uh, he worked for them in uh, 1878. Uh, and he then um, proceeded to, uh, to, to do this work, uh, sorry, in 1877, where he discovered the Ferenichen coal field. This is something that few people know about, but this was a coal field that was discovered right along the Var River at Ferenichen, and, and that uh, was developed um, in the 1890s. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, plant fossils were found there in the early days uh, in those quarries uh, with uh, Glossopteris flora uh, uh, associated with the glacial beds and even below the glacial dwykatillites. So the, this is a very important uh, site uh, uh, in terms of the history of paleontology in South Africa, but also the, the coal fields uh, helped to develop the economy of the Transvaal and of the uh, Vitwadestrand uh, gold fields. So there is, uh, in fact, this uh, plaque that was uh, um, uh, sort of a monument that was erected by the Geological Society of South Africa and the Ferienichen uh, Estates Limited and it still stands there as a monument to his activities. But aside from, from this, uh, most of his geological pioneering work is really still unknown because he only published those two papers uh, in, the, in the Journal of uh, the Geological Society of London. And um, his major work, with his three volume work, is, is still uh, unpublished and sitting in the National Library. He is much better known today uh, for his pioneering work in ethnography uh, about uh, the, uh, the Bushman or the sun and the rock art. And there is in fact, uh, all of his, his paintings that were published by Lucy Lloyd, uh, uh, and uh, sorry, by Dorothea Blake, um, they have now been digitized as part of this digital archive at the University of Cape Town, the Lloyd Blake collection. And uh, they have in fact, the, something called the digital stove um, which you can Google and you can find all these images on their website. So all of the images that Stowe had actually recorded um, as these beautiful watercolor images, um, and they were originally reproduced in that, in that book in 1930 are now available uh, for study uh, and they're available on this, on this particular website. So uh, with that, I will thank uh, Melanie Hustain of the National Library of South Africa for access to the Stowe manuscripts and for permission to reproduce the diagrams that I've shown you. And uh, I, I, I show you here uh, some of the, uh, the papers that Stowe had published and the book that was published by Young on the work of Stowe. Thank you very much and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you and thanks for 
making it possible that I participate in this conference. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a faculty member at Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. Jena is located in Thuringia, one of the, the, the provinces in central Germany. And I have been doing fieldwork in and research in the Barbet and Greenstone Belt for about 30 years. So today I'd like to talk about an ongoing research drilling project called BASE. <clears throat> and I'm not going to focus much on, on the scientific results. It would be too early because as I say, it's we're still drilling with three rigs as of today. Um, but I'd rather uh, talk about the implications for the recently declared Barbet and Maconjua World Heritage Site. And my co-author is Nick Bukes from the Ju University of Johannesburg, I think well known to all of you. So in, I have um, two acronyms in the title, which demand a, an explanation. BASE stands for Barberton or Key and Surface Environments. And ICTP stands for International Continental Drilling Program. Um, ICDP is essentially a club of nations. I think it currently has 21 members. South Africa is one of them. And from their annual contributions, um, major um, expensive drilling programs are financed that would surpass the financial ability of the funding agencies of any particular individual country. And um, as I'm talking here, I represent my wonderful, wonderful uh, online um, on-site uh, geoscience team of, of 13. I'm not going to introduce each of them, but I think some of them are even here in the audience. This is the structure of my talk. Um, I'm not going to speak much about number two and number three, but I'll, I'll stick to number one and then a bit to number four. Okay. So what are we drilling for? What is the whole thing about? And um, uh, this is essentially the, our, our objective in a nutshell. BASE is an international drilling project to investigate the setting of the earliest life forms. Eight boreholes at carefully selected sites in the Moody's group of the Barber and Greenstone Belt are being drilled through sedimentary strata. These are, the Moody's group is about 3.2 billion years old. And um, uh, incidentally, or well, not incidentally actually, all but one sites lie within the World Heritage Site, which poses a bit of um, administrative and, and perceptive challenges. The topic that we are trying to investigate could hardly be any larger. Um, you see it up there in the upper left, are we alone in the universe? Um, so, and you all know about uh, this incredibly expensive effort to find um, traces of either fossil or extant life on Mars. I think currently there are five robots on wheels driving around trying to, to photograph and um, these, these microbial mats or any other bacterial remnants on the surface of our sister planet. Um, secondly, um, the eight planets we have in our own solar system are by far not the only ones we know. Um, as you see here, this is uh, the, the, this, the screen dump here is about a month old. We have 5,005 confirmed planets, and, um, and of those, I think 70 or 80 um, are thought to harbor uh, liquid water. And then, of course, uh, to, the, to the right, uh, you see uh, just a screen dump of what you get when you type in origin of life um, and, uh, and Google and, and choose images. Um, the question is that we are going to investigate life on our own planet as it originated to see whether it's an extraordinary circumstance or whether it is something that should be commonplace. And that is, um, let's say it's resilient and it's inventive and it spreads out quickly under <clears throat> a wide range of, um, of environmental parameters. So that of course then bears on the question, are we alone, right? Does life form almost necessarily given sufficient time and space? And I think we have lots of each or does it not? So to get maybe a, a bit less philosophical, um, when you think, when you want to investigate the origin of life um, and you look around in the universe, there's exactly one planet of which we know that life has originated. And it happens not to be very far, uh, it happens to be our own planet. So 
uh, what better way to investigate this question than to go back to its very beginning of Earth history and to see uh, under what circumstances life has formed on our own planet. So, and here you see um, three samples, uh, three outcrop samples from strata that may be known to some of you from left to right from um, planktonic uh, organ dog, planktonic organisms in Church of the Onferwacht group to the banded iron formations of the fig tree group and the microbial nuts of the Moody's group. And so because the Earth is a dynamic planet, we all know that um, the, 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 there are not a whole lot of ancient, ancient rocks left, right? We have to go down into the basements of the oldest cratons, which are shown here in a diagrammatic greenstone, uh, diagrammatic cross-section. And you see here, uh, essentially the small vestiges remaining between huge granitic and gneissic domes. These are called greenstone belts, right? And to make matters worse, the, the, and this being continental basement, it's typically not well exposed. It's covered by the, the high field rocks on one, hand, on one side, and of course by the basins of the coastal, of the Mozambique coastal plain on the other side. But here you have the Barbadan greenstone belt, and this is essentially all the data set we get, right? So it's a very incomplete and in addition, rather weathered data set to investigate. Consequently, we know very little about the early Earth. Yeah, we don't know whether continents are a prerequisite to life, whether the atmosphere uh, was hot, whether the coastlines were extensive or, or, or rocky, whether uh, we, we know little about the ocean's temperature and composition. We know virtually nothing, surprising as it may be, about climate, weather, and solar radiation. Uh, we radiation in particular, the extent of volcanism, the tides, and um, the oddball meteorite impacts. And of course, um, consequently, we know little about the origin of, and spreading of life. So um, we, we do what we, uh, what we set out to do. Uh, we study the Barbud and Greenstone Belt, and this is an oldie but goodie map of the Barbud and Greenstone Belt by Anhauser, Hoon, and Rob in 19, 1983. And you see the Onferwacht group in red and green, largely volcanics, the fig tree group, sediments and, volca and, and volcanics in brown, and then the item of interest here, the Moody's group in yellow. And this is a substantial greenstone belt. It's one of the largest and best preserved worldwide, about 110 kilometers wide and 40 kilometers uh, long and 40 kilometers wide. And you see the town of Barberton. Let's see whether you can see the cursor here. And you can also see that uh, when you follow the, the, the national boundary that about a third of the greenstone belt lies and largely uninvestigated in Eswatini. So um, because the, the, the value, the geological value, the uniqueness and outstanding universal value of uh, the greenstone belt was gradually recognized. It was given um, South Africa's most recent World Heritage Site status, and that was in 2018. And about 40% of the greenstone belt um, were, uh, were placed under this protection. We study here in our drilling pro program, the Moody's Group, um, an ideal target for early Earth studies because we can map it on the surface. You see everything here in, within view is the Moody's Group. It's all steeply dipping. and um, and rather well exposed also here, everything you see is Moody's 3.7 kilometers stratigraphic thickness, um, extends over most of the greenstone belt um, up to 1,700 meters per year. There are many places where you can fall to your death and most strata dip subvertically, which makes it a bit of a challenge for drilling, obviously, but it's very nice for geological mapping. We somewhat know under what, um, under what uh, the positional environments, the, the, the Moody's group was deposited, uh, and it's ideal, I think, for the, for the spreading of life. Um, we're looking at tidal deltas and shorelines, coastal plains, and some pro-delta sediments. Um, here and there, a, a small alluvial fan. And the, because the, the degree of preservation is absolutely exceptional, um, there are an, an, there's an abundance of sedimentary structure 
of um, biological, physical, chemical, um, and, and interactions with lavas and tufts. Um, so it's a very rewarding area to map and to define sections that would be worth drilling because, as I have pointed out before, at the surface, most of these rocks are sufficiently weathered that uh, they are not really amenable for detailed geochemical studies. In particular, they have been poisoned by oxygen yeah, uh, through oxic, oxic weathering um, within the soil zone or even, even further down. What I would like maybe to point out particularly are these fossilized microbial mats that exist in shallow water tidal facies sandstones of the Moody's group over a thickness of about a thousand meters. They are millimeter spaced and you see these upward protrusions. They have a setting and they have a morphology identical to modern cyanobacterial mats. So it stands to reason that these were the earliest uh, photosynthetic oxy oxygenic photosynthetic organisms. They produce oxygen, okay, at 3.2, about um, 900 million years or so before the great oxidation event. Of course, all of that oxygen was first consumed to reduce all the, the minerals that were lying around on the surface, the pyroxenes, the olivine, the, the pyrite, and so on. So of course, we have studied these microbial mats also in, in recent exposures, and uh, these are absolutely uh, impressive. Because uh, we realized that by, by mere surface uh, studies, we wouldn't get much farther strategically, um, I applied for and uh, then convened an ICTP workshop uh, that was in October 2017. It was held in Barberton, and I showed the, the jolly uh, assembled group here the, the various sections that I proposed uh, for, for drilling. Um, we, we prioritized them and selected them and uh, had a number of, of uh, very nice interactions. We gave ourselves a structure and then wrote uh, an ICDP full proposal, which was co-authored by 10 authors from 10 countries, um, with, uh, with myself and Nick being the lead authors. I'm not going to, to delve much into uh, the detailed, um, the detailed uh, scientific objections here. Each of those main points here can be fleshed out by a number of bullets, which I don't want to read you through. But we, we as you see, we would like to look at the pro-delta phases. Of course, the microbial mats are a major question mark. We have several paleo soils. Um, we want to find out about temperature and air pressure and, um, and pH and composition of, of uh, ocean water and atmosphere. We have interests in paleomagnetism, the strength and the location, of course, interaction of magmatism with the basin. And of course, we need to learn how to tell the time. So a couple of slides, I think only three slides on, on what we did for drilling. Um, Moody's has been reasonably well mapped. On the top, you see the headers. Moody's usually crops out in, in large synclines up to 20 kilometers long and five kilometers wide. These synclines are tightly folded and often overturned. Uh, so from upper, upper left to upper right, you see the Stolzburg, the Moody's Hills block, the Eureka, the Dysdale, the Saddleback. These, are, these may be names familiar to you. And um, here are the, uh, the boreholes that we are uh, going to drill or have already drilled. Uh, they are a total of eight at uh, seven sites. And um, they are designed to, to span uh, both a range of depositional environments and, and the stratigraphic thickness, as well as uh, being able to correlate with each other over a couple of kilometers or tens of kilometers. In addition, these um, eight boreholes will be complemented by the sampling of three tunnels, which we have um, by now accomplished. It's the Ben Lomond added and the 22 level added of Agnes Mine, which you see on the left, penetrating the Moody's Hills block. And it's the Lomati water tunnel um, in the Saddleback Syncline. In particular, the, the last uh, sampling was done only three weeks ago. Uh, because it's a water tunnel it, and it's 3,000 meters long, um, it, it involved a lot of wading. And we used a canoe uh, to carry our samples, which was uh, great fun. Here are our drill sites, and you see those with a with a, a check mark are already done, and uh, the rigs have moved on. We still have to do number one and number five A and five B. And here's our drilling schedule from left to right. 
2021. We started on November 15th with the first drill hole and then came a second. And in, in early, I think in January, there's, yeah, the, there's a, a typo here. In January, we started with a third drill rig uh, that was a new rig and drilled twice as fast as the others. We are currently here, um, April 6th or 7th or so, and um, we are imminent. I, Pumi could inform us um, where we are currently standing, but I think they started drilling at site five today and will start drilling at site one um, yeah, later this week. We were extremely fortunate in having been granted a nine months free lease of a large industrial hall in downtown Bar Barberton, the Byers Hall, next to the museum. And um, here you see um, a view of our working area. The, uh, the front half uh, we, we designed as an exhibition and museum style, whereas in the back, we processed our core. So now the shot from the other side, uh, going back to that Oseba uh, in the back, uh, here you see us, uh, processing the core, uh, we, we rotated the core around the screens here that, that you see in the center. It involved a lot of carrying core trays, obviously. First results, I'm not going to show you many cross sections, but remember these strata are dipping subvertically. And in order to get the maximum stratigraphic thickness out of them, we would have liked to drill through them sub horizontally. That cannot be done, obviously, for engineering and friction reasons. So we drilled at 45 degrees. And here you see either the pre-drill or the post drill cross sections. Yeah? And you see, I think we did a, a, we covered a fair amount of strata and a fair variety of, um, um, of mythologies. Each of the boreholes is between, here, here comes the slide. Each of the boreholes in, um, is between 250 and uh, 450 or so meters long. Those in white are done and uh, the, uh, site four is finishing now, and site one and five will be starting imminent, imminently. So in total, we think we will, at the end of the drilling um, uh, of the operations in, in mid-May, we will have about uh, 2,600 or 2,800 meters of uh, fresh, continuous uh, cores of Archean sedimentary rocks. So rocks are piling up. Um, as we process them, they are being photographed and uh, rotated so that we then we slap them into a left and a right half. The left half goes into uh, goes into the ICDP um, um, laboratories in Spandau, which is a suburb of Berlin in Germany, and uh, the right half of the core of all cores goes into the National Core Repository in Dongasuk outside uh, Pretoria. Um, most importantly, relationship to the World Heritage Site. Um, this was a difficult project because um, in, the, in the mind of the local and regional um, population, uh, drilling rigs are always, always, always associated with exploration for mining and therefore intimately associated with, with gold. And we did have a couple of people strolling in and checking us out and asking for the gold library and so on. Um, and, uh, but we managed uh, to, to stay unmolested throughout the, the drilling program. So what we had to tell the population again and again and again is the following. The mountains next to your town are a treasure that consists of more than possibly mineable rock. We are driven here and we are here, strangely enough, by curiosity and governments worldwide are willing to spend money on it. Mining is highly competitive worldwide and employment in Barbadin mining is decreasing. So better look for something else, even though it's obvious that employment in geotourism will never be able to match the employment in mining. So in contrast, the Barbadin Maconchwa Mountains World Heritage Site is there forever. Yeah? It's worldwide unique and will not be exhausted. It is sustainable, but requires care. So we, um, a large component of our time and efforts, I would say maybe 30% or so, was spent on, on outreach education publicity. And um, strangely enough, even though you see a couple of school children here, we failed to mobilize the five Barberton high schools so far um, uh, to visit our site, uh, to visit our hall or, or the, the drill, one of the, the drill rigs that 
was parked next to the road six kilometers out of town. Uh, we were, our efforts to contact the teachers were blocked uh, by one of the local um, administrators, uh, actually a Barbadent resident uh, who, who never found the time actually to, to come by the bias hall. We found that rather irritating, but we did have a couple of school classes. However, these school classes actually had come to visit the museum and we managed to draw them over to our core processing facility um, for um, yeah, half an hour or so. That was great fun. Um, of course, we had lots of visits by uh, university classes and by colleagues, and uh, uh, these were enjoyable and, uh, and highly successful. Of course, we had lots of tourists, local and international. We had all kinds of uh, local and regional associations like the, the Heritage Society or the Bird Society or um, uh, Taxpayers, uh, no, Ratepayers Association and so on. And, uh, and these were very grateful um, um, and, and, and positive visitors. Um, we also succeeded in making the, the local govern, government agencies aware of what they have in their backyard. Uh, up to, to the left, you see a visit by the, by the, uh, by the yeah, head staff of the University of Mpumalanga, recently founded in Melsbroit. And up to the right, you see many of them probably will recognize Musa Mabusa, head of the CGS. We had visitors from the German embassy in, in Pretoria and from the local um, Tourism and Parks Authority, MTPA, uh, who actually would like to administer the, um, uh, the, the World Heritage Site. Um, we flooded uh, all uh, media channels known to us uh, with, uh, with what we had. Yeah, we, we had TVs, we had uh, the, the local newspapers, we had, uh, we, we, Pumi is maintaining a, a, face, um, a Facebook page. Uh, we are constantly on the ICDP webpage. We had regular visits, I think, for three, four, five weeks at uh, the local radio stations. Uh, and I uh, published, a, and I'm still publishing, a, a bi weekly one page newsletter, which uh, all of you would be happy to subscribe to. This is open to the public. And of course, I have uh, daily messages of the day uh, that are posted on the ICDP webpage. We trained as much uh, as many young professionals as possible in our team of 13. We have five locals. So um, finally, and maybe more strategically thinking, um, our, our goal was to, to show um, the, yeah, the general population, in particular the stakeholders, governments, um, associations, uh, local, um, local stakeholders, that the, the mountains back there have a significant tourist attractivity. And since the World Heritage Site has been declared in now four years ago, not much really has been going on. Um, there are vague plans for a visitor center. However, um, the, the regional authorities were surprised and they looked around appreciatively when they saw that actually a nucleus of a future visitor center already existed here by our rock samples and the posters in which we displayed the objectives of our research. Um, aside from our scientific issues, um, it, I learned uh, that uh, it all depends on people. Yeah? And we had an outstanding, we means the international crowd, we had an outstanding local part, and we still have an outstanding local partnership with UJ, Nick Bukes there and, and his colleagues. We had the privilege of drilling in the World Heritage Site and the preliminary or um, temporary administration embraced us fully. Uh, we had a perfect setup in the bias hall uh, in downtown Barberton facilitated and made possible by uh, the local and the regional government administration. I, we had a wonderful and diverse onsite team. We had uh, vigorous support uh, from the Barberton community and we had a an responsive and interested drilling contractor. This is what we are trying to, to reach. Yeah. We start with awareness, uh, we try to build knowledge, we try to transfer the knowledge into an appreciation, and from the appreciation should come eventually one day some stewardship. Um, my feeling is at the moment we are all the way at the bottom. Okay, We're trying to create awareness. Um, some people may know a bit about um, what the Bauburn and Greenstone Belt is about, 
but appreciation is limited at the moment to the natural beauty. Okay. So um, Pumi is in the audience, I believe. She's our outreach publicity education uh, um, manager. Sorry, Pumi, for writing here reception. This is our bias hall. And Pumi has this Facebook page. And of course, we have an, a separate email address. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christoph. We do have some time for questions. Uh, John Rogers here. Uh, just to say that I went to the Barberton area uh, over 10 years ago, and Martin de Witte just made Barberton famous to the BBC Earth Story documentary. And the publicity guy in tourism there said, we used to think we only had the gold mines, and now we've got a history. Um, yeah, that has changed, or it is gradually changing. Um, the, 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 the mining heritage, uh, including uh, Victorian furniture and, and um, corrugated iron uh, um, sheds and uh, stamp mills, uh, has been the focus of, uh, yeah, of Barbet and geotourism in the past. But we are trying to, to, to turn this around 180 degrees rather than looking into the, into the history the past history, we would like to look into the future. And, and Cape Town, we also tried to copy your wonderful ceramic signage. Thank you. And the Maconja Trail. Yeah, William Stephan in Britain. Uh, it happened so that uh, five weeks ago, I was uh, in the Barberton Geo Trail and uh, visiting the white tidal sandstone site. Yep. Uh, there was a drilling machine there. I had no yeah. idea first what it was, yeah. and then yeah. I saw a panel uh, showing that it was a research project, and it's fantastic to hear you speak about this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah we, the, because the, the site, number two, we call it, was so public, we, we fenced it in. It was just, it just had a footprint of 15 by 15 meters, um, but in order to, to make it a bit more penetrable, uh, we put up three posters, um, and you may have seen that that yes. I, I, I pretty much leaned myself out of the window quite far. I said, uh, your taxpayers' money at work, and this is uh, of interest to, to uh, scientists, uh, common people, and, or something, and curious people worldwide. Uh, interesting enough, I visited the Barberton Museum, uh, but I didn't become aware of your hall. Uh, that would have been great to see. Yeah, um, the, the Barberton Museum has an, uh, when, when did you visit there, John? Uh, William, uh, oh, so William. Sorry. it was around the 10th of February, okay. no, 15th, yeah. 15th of February. We, we would have been uh, next door and there are two green sliding gates. Um, it's an industrial hall after all, but sometimes we are up in the mountains, all of us, or uh, it's closed on Sundays and so on. So you may not, and our our signs are inside. Uh, so you may not have it. May not have been easy to become aware of it. Thank you. All right, I'll start. I'm Stuart Clegg. I'm a freelance geological consultant, and I live in Hartbeer's Port in the Machalisberg, and uh, that's the view across the dam to the Machalisberg Formation quartz sites. The Majakaneng hiking trail is sort of out of sight around the corner. And this, incidentally, this feature here is the Brit Graben, which you don't really get a very good view of uh, from the hiking trail. So it's not really included in this talk. OK, so where is the trail? It's shown by the red arrow there. It's at the top of the mountain range. There's Hartbeer's Port Dam. Brits to the north, Rustenburg to the west, Victoria to the east, and there's the whole Johannesburg metropolitan area down there. Now, how did this all come about? Um, I have some slides here from Belinda Cooper, who is the coordinator for the Mahalisburg Biosphere. And she gave me a few slides to explain the background to this project. And I'm going to, the slides are self-explanatory really, but I'm going to read out the notes that she provided for me, so bear with me. Um, 
This project has provided a positive and practical opportunity to address the biodiversity conservation and sustainable land use management in the core zone of the Mahalisburg biosphere. This is an area where the community and the environment meet and where due to continuing joblessness and desperation, some people overutilize the natural resources of the area in order to survive. So in order to help UNESCO designated sites to overcome existing impairments due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the German Commission for UNESCO set up a special support program, SOS African Heritage or hashtag SOS African Heritage. And the aim of this is to contribute to preserving independent and sustainable organizational structures at African world heritage sites and biosphere reserves, as well as to secure spaces dedicated to education for global citizens to sustainability and cultural diversity. The German Federal Foreign Office and a number of private funding institutes provided funding for the SOS African Heritage. In 2020, each project was awarded approximately 25,000 euros. SOS African Heritage 2020 project was called the Save Our Species project, which tackled the detrimental effects of that COVID-19 was having on the environment and communities. Besides intensive mountain patrols and snare removals by several environmental NGOs, the 2020 project involved training seven eco-rangers in conservation management, where they gained valuable skills and confidence to commit themselves to environmental work. The foundation laid in the SOS Eco Ranger program was an excellent springboard from which to launch the Majakanang Hiking Trail project, as four of the Eco Rangers are based in Majakanang. So the SOS 2021 provided approximately 20,000 euros in support of the Majakanang Heritage Trail project. The trail team built the 10 kilometer Heritage Trail under the guidance of EcoTrail, a trail building specialist. The trail based facilities were built under the guidance of the MBR, NPC, and heritage signage was done by specialists. And one of those was me. I did the geological signage. This work was either done on a pro bono basis or at reduced fees. So all other, all other costs including the temporary employment of 12 trail team members was covered by the UNESCO grant. And the natural and cultural heritage value of the Majakanang mountain is a very attractive tourism asset for a day's visit from Johannesburg and Pretoria. The project enabled 12 temporary jobs to unemployed people from Majakanang, four eco rangers now run the trail and continue to earn a small but regular income. The use of the trail by school groups as a curriculum based outreach program has the potential to make it a more sustainable enterprise. The Department of Education or other sponsors would need to fund the outreach program for some schools. Mitigation against environmental challenges, anti poaching patrols, and the removal of snares, alien invasion, plant identification and removal, litter cleanups, community engagement and environmental awareness, incidental meetings of wood choppers and church groups on the mountain provided the opportunities to create awareness. The project held formalized workshops and events, including a presentation and competition for a local school. And community benefits, the Hiking for Hope campaign initiated by the trail team collected 140 pairs of school shoes for learners in need. And the well maintained trail and cleanups benefit from the community who use the area regularly. The trail operators plan to advertise free guided hikes to members of the community once a season. Okay, that's from Belinda.
This is a Sentinel-2 satellite image showing the outline of the trail here. The town of Majakanang is basically this area here. It has a population of about 25,000 people. And you can see on this uh, particular ve vegetation enhanced view that uh, as you go uphill to the top of the ridge, this is the, the edge of the scarp of the Michalisberg Mountains, there's a definite vegetation change. Before I wrote the signs, of course, I had to go and see the trail. So there was a scouting expedition with myself, uh, Andre Verdepol, who is a fairly well-known his historian, and Booty McQuena, who's one of the trail guides. Um, so the trail starts off here. Uh, this is the top end of Majakaneng, and it traverses, it contours along to the west, and then it starts climbing up. It's ex extremely well graded with nice zigzags. And there's a rest point here, and there's a five kilometer bailout option, which I think is about here. It probably goes across to the other rest point. Then the trail starts going downhill a bit, and there's another rest point at the bottom, and then it climbs quite steeply up to the escarpment edge. Uh, and then it continues along the escarpment and, and then eventually goes down into a kloof and works its way back down this very wooded kloof back to Majakaneng. What I saw on this, uh, on this scouting visit was that only the Michalisberg formation of the Pretoria group is, uh, is represented on the trail. But there's a vast expanse of geology that you can see from the top. I saw a lot of sedimentary structures in the Michalisberg Formation en route. There are also diabase intrusions and metamorphic features. And from the top, you can see about 1.6 billion years of geology, both to the south and to the north, depending on how clear the weather is. So the signage I felt needed to cater for quite a, a large range of knowledge levels from uh, perhaps university students down to uh, the total layman. So first of all, I needed a map. I felt that, this, that some of the signs should have maps, the one at the bottom and, the, and one at the top at least. Uh, I already had a map of the Michalisberg geology that I compiled for a talk, uh, and it's basically the it's the Council for Geoscience uh, KMZ file overlaying onto Google Earth. And I recolored it uh, because it needed recoloring. And uh, the problem with Google Earth is with the legends. To get it in stratigraphic order, you have to assign a number to e each of the units in the stratigraphy. And I tried to put unconformities in here and so on mainly because of the difficulty with displaying a nice legend. Uh, Belinda Cooper um, put me in touch with another a director, another director of the Michalisberg Biosphere, uh, Jerry Cominios, and he is a graphic designer. So first of all, uh, he, he said that he's going to work on the, on the legend for me. And then I phoned him up and said, how's it going? He said, yeah, I'm busy with your map. Uh, I was a bit concerned because I'm very pedantic about colors on maps, on geology maps. Granite should be pink, carbonate should be light blue, sandstones and uh, plastic, uh, coarse plastic sediment should be yellows or oranges, fine. Fine grain sediments should be sort of browns. Uh, mafic rocks should be purples or dark greens. So I was a bit concerned, but with toing and froing, uh, Jerry was really good and he, he kept the color scheme as it should be according to standard international colors for rock types. And his result was this, which was really impressive. Uh, he has put some 
uh, hill shading in there, and it's it's very aesthetically pleasing. And the legend that we worked on together, I think, came out about the best we can get it without being too complicated. And it's got a lot of information in it. Uh, then I wrote the text for the Michalisburg formation. Uh, this sign goes at the bottom of the trail uh, as you start the trail. That's the start of the trail. Uh, there's me. This is uh, Booty, one of the guides, and and this is um, this is Victor, and this is Samuel. Um, so there's the geology sign at the bottom with the description of the Michalisburg formation. And these on the other side of this uh, sort of reception area at the beginning of the trail are historical signs. Uh, those were written by Andre Verdepol, and there's an, an enormous amount of historical information on these signs. So what the text says about the Mahalisburg Formation is that uh, the entire trail is on Mahalisburg Formation quartzite, and I, I. Uh, explain that as hard and sand to make it sort of simple for the layman. It was deposited as a retreating shoreline over two billion years ago. It's now represented in an area about half the size of the Black Sea, that's after erosion. The sea formed in an intracontinental basin between 2.67 billion and 2.1 billion years ago. And it's a cyclic session, a succession of sediments, starting with the Black Reef Formation, and then explain how there was a long, shallow marine period accompanied by the precip precipitation of the Marnie Dolomite, uh, and that was followed mainly by clastic sedimentation. There are several, several erosional interludes and the volcanic e episode recorded in the succession. And then towards the end of the succession was the emplacement of the Bushveld large igneous province, which hosts the largest platinum deposit in the world. To explain the tilt, it's a combination uh, of the weight of the Bushveld, huge Bushveld intrusion, uh, and plus, of course, the epigenetic. Epi uh, epi Pyrogenic uplift of the Johannesburg Dome to the south, which causes that tilt. Uh, it's a combination of both, I feel. The Bushveld complex also metamorphosed, and I explained, caused physical chemical change to the upper part of the Mahalisburg port site. And then it says further signage at the top with a 360 panoramic view provides more information. So then we set off along the trail, or trail users set off along the trail. And the first uh, small sign that they see nailed onto a tree explains uh, ripple marks. Um, and there are a couple of sort of schematic uh, diagrams of ripple marks. That's an example of ripple marks, which isn't actually on the trail. That's in the, that's a, a photo from the Michalisburg Biosphere website, that's high up. Um, that's about when people see ripple marks in rocks, that's about the first time that they have an idea that perhaps the land was covered by sea. So these have been translated into Setswana. <clears throat> I don't understand it, so, but I, uh, I, I think the translation is very good and very well done from what I've been told. Then there are good examples of desiccation cracks, and it explains that when silt or mud is exposed and dries out, these cracks form. And the next layer of sediment uh, fill, fills these cracks up. And if it's sand, it makes quite a good contrast in the rocks. And it's not just geological features that we see. Uh, I saw that rusty bit of metal just to the side of the trail, I poked it with my hiking stick. And Andre van der Poel, the uh, historian, knew immediately what it was. He said, that's a British Army water bottle from the South African War. Um, so we, uh, it, that's been on the surface of the hillside for over 100 years, just exposed. You can see that 
at some stage somebody's used it for target practice, but probably post South African War. Uh, that's now in the reception area, and Booty brings it out proudly to show each uh, group of trail users. There's an explanation of metamorphism. I explain that uh, firstly you get diagenesis, and uh, which changes the loose sediment to rock, and then as it gets buried, you get burial metamorphism and the quartz grains become welded together, metamorphosing it into a quartzite. And then further metamorphism in the upper part of the Michalisburg formation was caused by the intense heat, thermal metamorphism from the um, later intrusion of the Bushveld Large Igneous Province and the magma I've explained as underground lava. And then the, the quartz grains recrystallize and grew to a much larger size. And this has caused uh, bizarre weathering patterns. Uh, and the rocks, uh, the rocks here get uh, eroded and weathered into outlandish shapes. Um, this is, these are some on the trail, but uh, even more spectacular, these are a bit further away at uh, Tonkwani. And then uh, more evidence of the South African War, when you get to the top, uh, there is a British blockhouse. Uh, there's Andre Verdepol there, there's Booty, the trail guide. Um, and these were built from a particularly well-bedded quartzite horizon, which was somewhere down in the in this kloof here, and they carried these up and built this South African War blockhouse. So you start walking along the top of the escarpment, and then the, the, there's the first sign that explains the view. Um, so we'll go and have a look at that. Now this is the the view to the south. This this is looking. This is looking sort of in an easterly direction, sort of towards Pretoria um, from the top. But you can see, you can see right out to the south, you can see right out towards Johannesburg. So these signs are located at the crest. Um, there's one facing south and one facing north um, on, the, on the crest of the scarp slope and the north facing dip slope. So it spans the geological time from this point at 2.1 billion years back to nearly 3 billion years on a clear day. The broad valley, fertile valley immediately below, it's called the Muert, is formed by the erosion of the Silverton Formation, which is a soft deep water shale. And the next ridge to the south is the Dasfoot Formation quartzite, and that's deposited in graded river systems, and the sedimentary succession can, continues further south. Uh, it includes the Heckport formation, which is mafic, and I say they're low silica, lavas and volcanic breccia, rubble. And uh, I mentioned the unconformity at the bottom of the Pretoria group um, before the Chunisport subgroup. And I explain that uh, the Malmani Dolomites can be seen in the hills in the background, precipitated in shallow water. Um, some of the hills have flat chirped tops, um, and the Dolomites are characterized by abundant stromatolites. And on a clear day, you can see the waste stumps of uh, Fitz Gold mines. Uh, they shouldn't be confused with the much closer dome, uh, the Ticket Pro dome, which is also white. So they could be mistaken thinking that that's a waste dump. On a very clear day, if you, this is the viewpoint from the top. If you look to the south, you can, you can see this big white dump. And that uh, is the remains of Sand Dump 20, which uh, that's an old photo that's subsequently been reworked. So, and then the view to the north, the uh, quartzite slopes away in a series of dip slopes, uh, expands from this point at 2.1 billion years to um, 1.3, possibly on a clear day. 
Yeah, Bushfeld okay. complex crops out at the base of the mountain. It's divided into zones according to the prominent rock type. There's a lower zone, pyroxenite. The chrome and matte platinum mines are hosted by the critical zones. And you can see the mines in the middle distance, uh, characterized by an orthosite, light colored mafic rock. And the main zones quarried for tombstones, and the upper zone has layers of magnetite, which are mined for the vanadium con uh, content. And the emplacement of the felsic granitoids and mafic com complex. Uh, components of the Bushveld convex occurred so near simultaneously that controversy still rages amongst geologists that specialize in radiometric dating. And the hills of the 1.3 billion year old Pielensburg complex can be seen on a clear day, which is a 30, di 30 kilometer diameter volcano intruded by its own cyanide. People always ask when they see a prominent hill like this one that you can see looking to the south, how did that hill get there? Why is it that shape? What's it composed of? Well, this is Volhutus Kop uh, or Tlochochole, which means um, the disobedient child in Setswana. And it's disobedient because it's standing away from its parents, its parents being the Michalisburg Mountains. It's also famous historically because about this position here was a British artillery base that General De Vette on the 26th of August 1901 made his famous uh, escape over the Mahalisburg. Um, De Vette uh, wasn't a geologist because in his memoirs, he says that they ascended a vast slab of granite. Of course, we know it's quartzite. I tried to work out why this hill is there. Uh, I found a Sam, uh, uh, when I Googled Volhutuskop or ser searched Volhutuskop, there's only one reference. It's a paper in 1949. And there was a sample that said norite. So I thought maybe weathering resistant norite enclave within the pyroxenite, but it is not the lower zone, it's the marginal zone as shown by uh, more modern maps. And the one to 50,000 geological survey map of 1970 shows a basal norite unit, norite quartz, norite and pyroxenite. Perhaps it's norite and pyroxenitic norite, but it also shows a diabase dike, which I think is probably something to do with why this hill is resistantly weathering. On the way, uh, as you start just before you go down, there's a really good example of cross bedding. So I explain how that uh, how that's formed. I didn't go into younging direction because I thought it might confuse people if you start talking about upside down rocks, uh, unless they were geology students. And then there's some uh, bacterial mats. The guide picked that up and oh, didn't pick it up. He pointed it out to me. It's a loose boulder. Uh, said it, it looks like uh, some kind of crust had formed and, uh, and then um, dried out and, 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 and curled up at the edges. And I spoke to, I showed, sent that picture to Vladi Altman and he said, yeah, it's, uh, bacterial mat that's been desiccated. The diabase uh, or dolerite intrusions, I explain that nice little quirk that we have in South Africa that uh, the Karoo uh, intrusions are called dolerite and anything older is called diabase. And then you get back to Majakaneng after going down through a Oh, there's another thing I just missed. The Crystal Cave is very interesting. It's a, a vein of quartz with, uh, it's sort of open. It must be very late fluid migration. And it's been dug out by local Sangormas and medicine men because it contains really, really pretty drussy quartz, tiny, tiny uh, carpets of uh, of little quartz crystals and it's a sacred place so that sign we actually put higher up and we explain that you'll see this place as you go 
lower down because with it being sacred, we didn't want to hammer a signpost right in there. They held church meetings at the place and so on. And so, right, finally back to Majak and Eng. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thanks very much for the invitation and thanks especially to the GSSA for this uh, very timely conference, I think. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the Freda Fort Dome and uh, put my title together, just uh, trying to think of something uh, um, to say about a very long association with the Dome. Listening to, to Jasper yesterday and then Steve's keynote again today and several other people, um, I think basically what they said tried, will encapsulate what, what I want to say in this talk and that here is an amazingly rich resource um, in so many ways that we can, uh, we can utilize as part of a group of geoheritage sites in South Africa. Um, I believe there are few places on earth that, that have the potential to showcase geoheritage in both the, the narrow and the expanded definitions um, of, of that word that we've heard mentioned in, in different talks. Um, as the Freda Fort Dome can, can do for us. And so my talk is briefly going to describe the historical background to how the Freda Fort Dome evolved from a mainly a research site for geosciences to promoting heritage and geotourism. And then uh, what it offers uh, in terms of a holistic approach to geoheritage. Then I'll uh, look at the benefits and perhaps some of the challenges of its declaration as a world heritage site. And finally, I'll give you an update on why I, I started to feel a renewed sense of optimism for its future development as an international geoheritage destination. 21 years, the 21 years obviously will take us back to 2001 and like any birth, it has to have a, a, a conception event. And I think, I know Uwe Reimolt is listening from Brazil to this and uh, he and I were uh, part of the convening committee for the 62nd Meteoritical Society Conference at Witz in, in Joburg in 1999. It was the first real big conference that we can recall um, for, the, for the, the international community of, of impact specialists that uh, came in post uh, the democratic era of South Africa. And so we, we went to a lot of trouble um, for knowing people hadn't traveled to South Africa for many reasons in the preceding decades. We went to a lot of trouble to put together a very uh, great set of field excursions. I think uh, he'd agree with me that the most uh, popular one turned out to be the Freda Fort Dome. And we, we put together a field guide for it. And then into that guide, although it was mostly the geology, we wove a bit of the history of South Africa, um, the archeological history uh, the, um, and the more recent history. Uh, and obviously took people out into the bush uh, and into areas where they were literally shoulder to shoulder with wild animals. And as a result of that, the delegates were unanimous in saying we had to get something published. We had to publish, publish this to the world rather than just keep it within the conference uh, that we'd done. So that was the germ of, uh, of this idea of, of putting something together. And in the end, uh, the Council for Geoscience very uh, kindly published uh, the geological field guide as Memoir 92 in 2001. So that's where it came out. Um, and that, that, that publication took the time to try and explain impact cratering science uh, that could be used as an educational tool to universities in South Africa and to, to non-impact geologists. But then it also celebrated, of course, the amazing uh, a history of rocks that were exposed in the dome, and then had a series of 22 geosites that, that it listed and described. So, so it, was a, it was a guide. Now, by 2003, there was momentum coming through uh, to see if Fred, the Freda Fort Dome could be declared a World Heritage Site. And as a result of that, there was huge public interest in, in getting information about the dome. And we started to, to give tours to the dome for people, and they asked for more information. And the council was inundated uh, with people, members of the public wanting uh, information. So we started working on a book that became uh, Meteorite Impact. And that book then expanded the geo geological side of things to include broader aspects of geoheritage, uh, more geosites, but to include things like the biodiversity and the archeological and, and uh, um, more recent history uh, aspects of, of the area as well as things like what is the solar system, what are meteorites and so on. So that, that was sold out, two editions were sold out within, within a few months of it coming out. 
the next big event was, was that we hosted the Large Meteorite Impacts Conference in 2008 in the Dome, and the CGS agreed to update the memoir. So it was expanded. There were more sites. There were 26 sites uh, listed there. And again, that, uh, that, that proved to be very popular with the, with the geological community. It also led us to then publish a third edition of Meteorite Impact in 2009. That now is sold out and is only available as an ebook. Um, at the same time, we saw the growth of the local tourism infrastructure and an integration of geoheritage aspects into ecotourism, adventure tourism uh, aspects. The unfortunate thing, though, was that uh, the, the World Heritage Site development kind of got stalled on a, on, a, on a couple of things. And um, I'll talk about those as we go through, because particularly the visitor center issue to me is a, is a central issue to, to making uh, the uh, area a success as a geoheritage uh, site. And so I'll end off by this saying that I think maybe we we finally turned a corner after about 10 years of stalling uh, with regard to where we can go. The Frida Ford Dome is obviously this uh, rather spectacular range of mountains. Uh, here as it, it gives its, 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 its indication on satellite images and high-flying aircraft, so use out the window, but it lies about 120 kilometers from Joburg. And the, the point is the dome is about 90 kilometers wide, but it's only the central part of what was a much larger crater, probably extending out almost uh, to, to a diameter of 300 kilometers. Just to show the geology, of course, what, what we know is that then as you travel from the, along the N1 south of Johannesburg, within a space of about 30 minutes, you can actually track in a car through um, a thousand million years plus of Earth history that has been exposed by this impact. So in addition to this impact event, we have this tremendous history of rocks that are pretty rare uh, around the world, and, and you can see them in a very small uh, area. The World Heritage Site itself does not actually uh, correspond to the dome as a whole. The dome is, is half of it is covered by the Karoo Supergroup, so, so only the, the, the northwestern half is really exposed in this very spectacular range of, of, of hills and ridges um, and valleys called the Frida Fort Mountain Land. And only about 25% of the dome, about 30,000 hectares, is actually the declared World Heritage Site. It, it has a buffer zone around it that's an additional uh, 14,000 hectares that is there, it's mandatory in terms of the World Heritage Declaration. Now, the other thing is that uh, although this, this, this area uh, that's indicated as the World Heritage Site area uh, covers the most rugged part of the dome, uh, in actual fact, geosites can occur all through the dome. So it, 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 there, there are many more sites around uh, that, uh, that could have been included. In addition to the geology, we obviously have the, the, the impact uh, and its unique uh, exposure in terms of how deeply it is eroded. So it's a unique window into a large impact structure. But we have uh, all these rocks from the from dating from the Archean and Paleoproterozoic, and we have very deep crustal rocks exposed by the impact. But in addition to that, then, there are these range of other linkages that go through uh, from uh, the environment, the natural scenery, through to how that is used in terms of ecotourism uh, and, and, and education to archaeological and more recent historical uh, um, events and, and buildings, et cetera, that, that, that are preserved in the area. So I just very quickly want to talk about those just to show that, again, as, as per Jasper's and Steve's definitions, um, the geology sits within this landscape, within the human activities, within the human history, et cetera. So because of its ruggedness, of course, it is a, it is a very popular site for hiking, uh, for, for the, the Vile River runs through it, and so, so there's, there's, there's a huge water-based uh, uh, um, ecotourism industry there, abseiling, etc. And of course, uh, with, 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 the, with the rocks exposed in the way they are, we have very diverse habitats, so, so an, a very rich floral and also faunal heritage that occurs there. In terms of the, um, in terms of the geology, of course, these spectacular sites, which is what excites geologists to come from all over the world to, to visit uh, the, the signs of the impact. Um, the, the, the key thing though, is that much of the evidence of impact is actually microscopic. And so you have a problem when you, when you run a field trip in explaining some of, the, some of the things and some of the concepts and some of the historical landmarks in terms of the development of the uh, ideas about the site. In terms of that, of course, we've run se several uh, very successful conferences Nowadays, very, very nicely aided by uh, uh, Billy Bischoff's uh, 2001 and, uh, 
uh, one into 50,000 map that he produced in 2000 by the Council of Geosciences. But um, it's also only possible because many of the sites lie on private land. We've got very enthusiastic landowners down there who help us. And I just put this, this picture on the top right in just to show you this was a, one of our conference visits, a geological conference. And I remember look, bending down to explain a particular outcrop here, noticing suddenly that everyone was tiptoeing away from me. And of course, they were all admiring the animals uh, sitting on the farm here. And so this gives you a sense of what people see in terms of the, the way that we can integrate everything there, the geology and nature into one experience. Here we have uh, examples of uh, sand carvings into, into the rock. Interestingly enough, they have only presented, uh, the only carvings we see are into the impact melt rock in the dome, uh, which, which, which is a fascinating linkage between our science and, and ancient history. And then uh, the area is a huge, uh, has a huge number of settlements from dating from the Iron Age uh, with various artifacts that are, that are actually left there. So uh, a crucial part of South Africa's history plays out here with interesting linkages to things like long-term climate change um, and obviously a series of conflicts that, that, that evolved uh, in the area. And then moving on to gold mining um, uh, in, in Fentuskroen, and of course, the linkage between that and the, uh, the, the, the clash of, of, of countries and the empire, the uh, South African uh, war, and uh, again, finding all these artifacts uh, and, 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 and remnants, including blockhouses and heliograph stations lying around. What, what has happened in terms of since the 2005 declaration of a World Heritage Site for this one portion of the dome? Uh, immediately, a whole series of, of, of processes were, were activated, and the first was uh, to have a strategic environmental assessment done. That was produced in 2006. There was an office opened, but it's closed since then. And then an integrated management plan um, was, was put together. Um, one of the things that, that obviously happens is that a national legislation has to link in to the World Heritage Act. And the, the, the great challenge here, unlike areas like our national parks is that the, the Fredefort Dome is, is largely privately owned land. And so there, there was no prior recognition of it as a national heritage site. And that is still an, uh, still an aspect that is, that is problematic in terms of meeting the requirements of, um, of UNESCO. Although with several teams having come out every, every four or five years, um, the, the, the status still continues to be, uh, to be recognized. There, there, there were some, uh, some other issues uh, that I'll talk about in a moment. But in addition to that, of course, what we did then was we started to look at producing information for, for people to visit, such as an exp a Z-fold explanation brochure. Uh, the book came out, other brochures were produced, and uh, local landowners, uh, expert people, such as Graham Addison, have produced his, his, produced his own uh, book. And the uh, media sites, the electronic media sites, are uh, essentially privately owned ones uh, from people in the dome. So there's no, there's no central facility. It's mainly being done by the people on the ground. W what are some of these issues? Well, uh, some of the things that have, that have created challenges for us uh, or, and, and for, for developing the site is that um, typically national government delegates the, the, the responsibility of these sites to provinces. The Fredervoort uh, World Heritage Site actually spans two provinces and it spans two district municipalities and three local municipalities. So there's a lot of uh, sort of disconnect between, between these different groups uh, that, that they, they have different allegiances, uh, they have different uh, agendas, they work at different paces and so on. And then 89% of the area is actually privately owned uh, with, with close to 800 landowners. So you can imagine trying to manage something like this compared with an entity such as the Kruger National Park, where you, where you have a very clear structure. So a lot of the energy is dissipated around trying to get these disparate groups to work together. And also then to juggle things like uh, the fact that parts of the area are still active farms, uh, parts of them have been under development, there've even been mining areas within it and so on. So, uh, the, and, and then another issue of course is, is in terms of all the, the different acts, what happens now when you discover that there are rehabilitated mines from a century or more ago in this area. The, the bottom line is that the, the, even though we have a World Heritage Site recognized by UNESCO, uh, the Fredefort Dome is still not a, a national heritage site uh, and it hasn't been recognized uh, in, in, uh, by legislation. 
the other things to consider, and because this this comes into play when you look at how a how UNESCO is is wanting a resource to be managed and, and how an, 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 a natural heritage resource should be managed, is that there becomes an increasing focus on the environmental aspects of what you see. If you're out there walking, you don't want to see plastic in the river or you don't want to smell pollution and so on. And the Vaal River coming through from, from the coal fields of Mpumalanga through Gauteng and the gold fields past Van der Vale Park and past Sasselberg, um, it's a working river. And so there have been, as, as have been well publicized in, in a couple of years ago, uh, serious pollution problems there. And of course, that, that has a knock-on effect with regard to people who are using the river to try and uh, develop um, uh, ecotourism, uh, river rafting, adventure tourism, et cetera, aspects. Obviously, uh, also things like invasive flora, trying to get rid of them, um, and, and, and so on. Uh, the deterioration in local infrastructure, uh, particularly with regard to sewage and waste removal, uh, road maintenance. Many of the roads in the area are still dirt roads. They are, they are remarkably well maintained. Um, uh, uh, most of the time there's a regular upgrade of them, but obviously they deteriorate quite quickly and deteriorate different, different rates depending on rainfall. And um, there's even, you know, there are even areas where people have continued sand mining or uh, there's been renewed efforts to say, well, can we not actually relook at gold mines or perhaps try and see if we can find old diamonds uh, as, as were mined a century ago? I want to park that and I really want to then look at the, the, the scientific question, what, what maybe holds us back from a, from a quick fix uh, solution in the, uh, in the Freda Fort Dome. And essentially the, the issue is, uh, you can see on the uh, bottom right, you can see uh, the uh, little Twain crater north of uh, Pretoria. It's easy enough to, for someone to go there, to drive up, to stand on the edge of a hole and say, I can see that a big bang happened here and something, something blew up but it's not possible to do that in the Freda Fort Dome. So we have a huge problem with scale, and then we have a huge problem with the erosion level because actually there are no crater deposits. There is no rim preserved. We are eight to 10 kilometers below the surface. And so uh, it's, it's, in essence, it's in essence symptomatic of the fact that this is why Freda Fort presented such a challenge uh, in terms of its origin uh, for so long with so many very bright people actually working on it. The other thing to note, of course, is that the World Heritage Site is actually only just taking in a small part of this, this area. And people get confused between the dome and the World Heritage Site and so on. And they can't see the differences in size or scale. So the bottom line is that we need a, a more lengthy and, and, and complex explanation for the first time visitor who arrives there and says, show me where this is. And, and we, have to, we have to get them to back off that, that quick fix five minute view and, I, and, I, and I've done it. So there's, there's uh, a lot of information that has been put out in the last 20 odd years. Um, uh, the, uh, the meteorite impact book that came out with the declaration updated in 2009. Uh, and then the, uh, the original geological guides, um, which uh, the, the first one in 2001 was sold out and the one in 1998 was then an upgrade of that, as well as the Z-fold brochures that were made available to the, uh, the, the local tourism establishments and, and could be disseminated. And then, of course, Graham Addison has now produced a, 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 a softback brochure um, that is available for people who visit uh, his facility. So uh, just some examples from Meteorite Impact to show how it then caters for the sort of questions that uh, people have about, uh, about the dome and something about the sites. The sites will come with maps. They've got GPS coordinates uh, in some of the, the, the brochures and then lots of images. And so on. But most of these sites uh, shown, shown essentially on here, uh, most of them are essentially a road trip through the World Heritage Area with one or, or two sites that actually lie outside the area because they, they are crucial, such as the center of the dome or, or uh, some of the main impact melt uh, localities and so on. The other thing then was that uh, the, the other sticking point has been the development of a visitor center and I, I'd like to call it a visitor center and, and interpret geological interpretation center. So in, in, um, I want to talk about this in a little bit, uh, in, in a little bit uh, of a while towards the end of the talk, but just to point out that there are only four other impact cratering museums in the world. So this would be an amazing resource to actually have. So in 2009, the building was built by, by 2008. And in 2009, I was asked to put together a team to actually 
develop uh, exhibits. The, the, the building was not originally designed as a museum. It was going to be a center for visitors with a conference facility and so on. And so we, we had a pre-built building and then had to go in and try and work through it. And unfortunately, what happened is that by 2010, we noticed that there were structural issues with the building. And in fact, it was, it was not properly reinforced. And so it became unsafe. And it is as, as a, uh, in limbo since then. In addition to that, I just want to say that other government-owned facilities, such as at Donkerfleet, where there was an education facility, and the Graf Eiland um, uh, Island, uh, have fallen into disrepair and are unutilized. Um, the other things that, uh, that, that, that uh, we should note is that the national legislation to, to meet the UNESCO requirements are, is still missing. Most of the books and brochures, uh, certainly the meteorite impact books, are now sold out, um, and uh, they and then the, the the brochures are not constantly replenished for visitors. They every now and then someone gets gets to print a few and then and, and hands them out at their facility and so on. Um, one of the one of the challenges we have is that the ebook now meet, the meteorite impact is only available as an ebook, and uh, essentially at international prices. In other words, one chapter of the book would cost you three hundred rand, which is just not, not feasible for a local market. The other thing to note, of course, is that uh, most of the geosites are on private land, which means there has to be a linkage to allow people on, but it also raises issues of access and insurance uh, and, and so on. The good news, the good news is that uh, through, through various efforts, the local and national profile of the dome continues to grow uh, and it grows with tourism operators on a national level and then also with tourism operators who are based in the dome, such as, such as these ones uh, over here. So there's, the, there's also a very diverse tourism infrastructure ranging from three to four star hotels to, to rustic uh, tent camps uh, in various places in the dome. So there's, there's a lot going on within the dome. And certainly the town of Paris has marketed itself wonderfully in terms of getting, um, getting its, itself on the map in terms of its association with the dome. So it's, a, it's like, I would call it the Clarence of, of the Val um, because of uh, the way it's positioned itself as an arts and food hub. Now, uh, in addition to that, in 2019, the, uh, Morris and Richard Fuyun and uh, Maggie Newman with Paris Tourism got together and they actually put together a small display in the Paris Museum. So there is some, some features uh, that are available to view, some displays that are available to view, but it's, it's, it's very much, it's a very small museum there's just one room that has this material in. So it's not, it's not particularly putting the, 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 the area on the map. So I want to then just quickly return to, to, to now and, and say, where are we uh, as I wrap up? Since late 2021, the National Department of Tourism has now taken on board this issue of the, um, the non-functioning visitor center. And the Development Bank of South Africa has just released a report to the stakeholders about a plan to now uh, uh, complete the building and allow it to be utilized. So that is that is great news. In addition to that, obviously there's been a, well. In addition to that, there's been a there's been a marked uptick in the uh, Geo Heritage Committee of the GSSA's um, work, particularly looking at the uh, Geopark UNESCO Geopark initiative and Freda Fort is being explored from that perspective. And then Ian um, Ian Mackay will present in the next talk the, the wonderful Time Trip SA initiative, which I think will be an incredible boost for Geo Heritage. Because uh, I think people are going to want to tick off all, 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 all the 20 plus sites that are on this list, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be marketing geoheritage to the country and taking it to the people. And then obviously, I'm hoping that this conference will act as a major catalyst as well. So if I had a vision for the Freda Fort Dome at, at the moment, it would be that uh, what we would see is that uh, the dome should be set up as a part of a, a regional geo product. Uh, with the cradle of humankind, with gold mining, with the Pilansberg, and that it, it would also be, be set up by things like the Time Trip SA as a national, uh, part of a national network of, of heritage sites that the public is very aware of. The aim would be to turn the predominantly day visitor groups coming from Gauteng every weekend into multi-day and repeat visitors, so for them to explore the depth of the area with, with, with everything it has to offer. And I, I, the other thing is then to, to, to integrate the, this local tourism product of the ecological, the adventure tourism, the biodiversity and the archeology, span historical, cultural stuff into a single brand. Um, that re will require some, some work um, with regard to each of these aspects uh, in order to, them to be properly identified as tourism resources and then to be utilized. 
And then in terms of, uh, I think, I think a, a, big, a big selling point has to be education. And people like Barry and Co have spoken about this, but this could be a regional center, not only for universities, not only for field guide training, but also for school visits, particularly for the, the 13 plus million uh, people living in Gauteng, many of whom have kids that, that don't get out of the urban environment. This is a very convenient place to go. Then if we can expand the, uh, the, the on-site resources um, uh, by, by cataloging everything, I've spoken about that already. Uh, the other thing is to develop a series of roadside stops uh, for geo trails along the, uh, along the lines of what is happening, what has happened in Barberton. And also then to explore the expanded geopark concept. So very briefly, uh, if I still have time, Steve, if I may just talk about this, this, this vision for the visitor center and show you what we've actually done. Thanks. What we wanted to do then was to explore basically the Earth's place in space and then take people through impact and then into looking at the Fred Ford Dome and uh, bringing it all back to look at people and the disasters and environment, et cetera, et cetera, things that various people have touched on in this conference. So um, this was basically the idea. We actually designed a logo which combined the V and the D into it. We, we, we developed a, a young man called Sipo who was going to talk to the kids about about things in the displays and um, we, we, we had this sort of structure set up and quite a few of the, uh, the uh, exhibits then use interactive materials, um, a game was developed and so on, uh, unfortunately in, 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 uh, in a system that is now no longer functional, um, but just to show you some of the exhibits as they were at the stage when the project had to be shelved, so the big, uh, the big solar system displays, trying to touch on a, a whole range of uh, uh, things. Meteorites, um, we, have, we have samples that have been donated by people from around the world to go into the display cases. So these would just be the backing cases for this. Um, I'll skip through that one, but looking at the different types of rocks, again, with big display cases, with, with samples donated from craters all over the world. So giving people a, a global perspective on this and then bringing it back into life. Um, so, uh, and then people and how people have utilized things uh, in, in the dome. So, uh, much of that has been done, um, uh, but, but awaits uh, implementation. And then obviously in terms of the geo trails, we've already identified in, in, in the field guides, we've identified sequences of stops that people can follow along the roads. The idea now would be to, to maybe create a, a more specific narrative on a, on a narrow uh, set of individual stops rather than include the whole 26 stops in our, in, in our story. And my view then and my vision would be that there are several key hubs scattered around this area that could be utilized. Barace is obviously well established already. The, the, the major resorts lie along the Val River on the so-called Val Meander. We have an education facility at Donkafleet that could be utilized for school visits, um, view sites that could be developed. Uh, I would say that Fentus Kruen should become the hub of the archeological, historical, cultural uh, type of, of, of aspects to twin with the uh, visitor center, the Ge geosciences visitor center, which would sit near Fredafort. And then there are archaeological sites that, that have tremendous potential as well. Finally, uh, the, the engine one stop stations right on the freeway here that people stop at could be a valuable marketing tool by putting up a set of displays there. People spend time, they rest there, they could actually know what is just off their, off their shoulder, sitting hidden in, 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 the, um, uh, in the area to the uh, to their north. Bredefort definitely has uh, world-class geoheritage resources and it's incredibly accessible relative to Gauteng, which not only brings a huge population group in, but it's also the international gateway into the country. It has a very strong and existing tourism infrastructure, but there's a, a, a lot of potential still for growth, particularly if we're going to market the geoheritage thing. I think when people go there at the moment, they, they are disappointed unless they make the effort to go and find a guide who is knowledgeable, they're disappointed in, 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 what, they, in what they are seeing. Um, but um, we have huge, huge growth potential there. And now, thankfully, with the National Department of Tourism involved, taking oversight of this with the Development Bank, I think we're going to see uh, the uh, significant advances being made. I'm hopeful for the next year or two that we will get this thing accelerating and going forward. And thank you to the people listed here who have all helped in various ways. Um, and thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Roger. Okay, so my talk is about Time Trip SA, 
which was meant to be kind of a year long project, started just before lockdown and is still going strong. <laughs> if that gives you an idea, of it's been quite an odyssey, a kind of geo odyssey, if you know what I mean. Um, so its aims are really to create a traveling exhibition and website that will market South Africa's geo heritage sites to schools, South African public, and the tourism sector. And I'm just put here as a note in case you think that marketing to the tourism sector and international tourists is a kind of ambitious aim. It would be a nice idea, I think, to try and take this exhibition to the tourism in Dava, where all these people gather. And they, in turn, the tourism professionals would market it overseas. Right, so just for the purpose of this talk, um, for the geo heritage sites that we covered here, we were kind of substantial ones. They at least, at least need to have signage. They could be self guided, maybe have an exhibition center, um, have guides, and best of all, provide employment. Because I think those are the ones that especially need promote, promoting. If they can attract visitors and become sustainable, then that would be a very good thing for. Um, the geo heritage industry, if I can call that at large. All right, so the objectives, obviously to create a traveling exhibition, promoting geo heritage sites, to travel domestically um, to destinations. And I've had experience of the Rand Show and Southeast Africa, especially. Um, tourism in Darba is the next ambition. And also to create a website for the exhibition. So it'll have a landing page, and all the materials that are part of the exhibition for people to download and connections to the websites for all the geo heritage sites, that kind of supporting information. And one of our funders was the South African Association of Science and Technology Advancement, which is DSI, Department of Science and uh, what are DSI at the moment, um, information. And, um, and so we've got government involved as well and government support. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so now this exhibition is going to have four components. We're going to have a large central geological map, three meters by 2.5 meters, that will summarize everything. Then we've got A0 posters for sites that represent a narrow time period, kind of like Fear of Fort Dome. And then we've got A0 posters for museums and other places where they actually cover an extensive portion of geological history, maybe even from the beginning of the, the formation of the earth to the present. Um, each poster is going to have a QR code on it. Um, I'll tell you more about that later on. And I've already talked about the website. All right, so a possible layout for this. And the way it's difficult when you kind of start designing those things, but we thought we would try and put the exhibition on an aluminium stand curved. So it would be easy to erect. And on the aluminum stand, we would have vinyl sheets with the posters printed onto them. And it would have this kind of um, curved shape. Got your central map in the middle. And then 15 A0 site posters on this side and another 15 on that side. So far as it's grown to 32, I'll show you them just now. And then in front, we've got some nice dinosaurs and um, reconstructions and we work closely with Jill Drennan and School of Geosciences, and we can get beautiful minerals that we can put on display. So we will have some interesting exhibits, um, concrete things to show the people that, that visit this exhibition as well. All right, and that's one of our latest dinosaurs, for example, that we could show you. Yeah, so just to take you on a um, kind of tour of the exhibition, this is going to be the 3.5 by 2.5 meter map. So it's going to be big. Um, it's going to be started at ground level. So if you're an adult, I think your eyes will come up to about here. Yeah, that's what we were working out. So there's this large map, yeah, of South Africa that kind of summarizes where the sites are. And this is still very much a draft, huh? work in progress. Um, and then kind of we'll have a couple of interesting symbols um, like the golden rhino of Mapungubwe, um, 
the meteorite impact volcanoes, just to kind of show people, just looking at it in one picture, oh, wow, there's such a diversity of, um, of geoheritage in South Africa, ranging from meteorites to volcanoes, gold, diamonds, town child, you name it, all this diversity. There's a lot of writing on this, and that is a problem. Um, but the idea is to make it interesting enough to get people to kind of focus and actually start reading it. And the only way we're going to know whether the strategy is going to work is by trying it out, I think. I've seen with exhibitions that people do read. If they find it attractive and interesting, they will spend time and read it. And with school kids, you can always give them worksheets and activities to kind of force them to read it, to answer questions. And so there's this. There's our little geological map. And the graphic designer, Francois Smith, has changed the colors on the, on the geological map, which he thinks is a very good idea. And I was wondering what the opinions of um, geologists here would be about actually changing the colors, because they're pretty standard, aren't they? This is all the sites that will be covered. OK, an exploration of the map, something about the geological time scale. And here is our geological timeline, kind of going all the way from way back down there to up there. So that's a basic overview. And I'll take you a few, a few give you some more detail on the different components. All right, so these are the 32 time geo uh, sites that we want to cover. We have so far covered about 20 of them. And then we go from, then we go from sort of Mapungubwe, and then we go all the way down to um, Barberton over there. And then we have a, a whole bunch of museums. So I think you can see we're trying to cover everything from archaeology, geo paleontology, geology, the full range of geo heritage with our sites. This is a bit of detail from the map as it stands. You can see the different sites. Some of them are um, like Pilanisburg volcano, and we have a volcano here. I know that it's not the right type of volcano, but um, nonetheless, it does represent a volcano. And if anybody has got a good picture of the right sort of volcano um, to send me an alkaline volcano, please, please do. Um, Cradle of Humankind, Botanical Gardens, and the town child with a little bit of information. This is all going to still be edited about some of the different graphics. Okay, this is our geological map, which we got from um, Council of Geosciences and has been altered, as I said. I'm not sure about this. Then an explanation of the geological map. And this looks dense, but if people are interested, I'm hoping they will read it and understand more about geological maps. I have seen school children. Um, standing in front of geological maps and puzzling about the different colors. And so I think it's really worthwhile for us to communicate to the general public about geological maps and what they represent and what you can do with them, et cetera, et cetera. Something about the geological time scale, history of the earth, periods, eons, eras and epochs, et cetera, et cetera. It's in the school syllabus as well. So it's of relevance to school children. And this is the latest um, version of the timeline, which has grown into a very um, kind of, what did you call it, an infographic. Um, I know Wendy Taylor was, was looking at it over the weekend, and she made um, some suggestions, and they've been incorporated in here. And you can see, so we've got the basic timeline here, which connects to the geological map, um, times, then what life was around at that time, plus some major geological events, kind of just graphics representing different geological events. And this here is one of the posters that we've developed. And since Roger was talking about the Fear of Fort Dome, I thought that it would be a good idea to just introduce this poster to sort of take it apart in detail to kind of show you what our thought processes were when we were designing this poster. And then I'll just show you a few more of the posters that we've done as well as we go along. So at the top of the poster, which I don't know if you can see, because there's this bar, the zoom bar in front of it, but there's a little summary of the experience. What, 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 what 
what is there if you go there, the main thing? Um, then there's the stock number. So these are the time stops. Um, just uh, one thing we decided, which is a bit different. If you're a geologist, you normally start going back, you start explaining the geological time scale from the very bottom and you work to the present. But we thought if you're explaining it to people, you should start with the present from the known and go back to the unknown, the more distant time. So our stop number one is Mapungubwe, and then we work all the way down to Barberton. So this at the moment is stop 22, but it's not going to be the fi finally stop 22. This, these are being rearranged. Then we've got this bar here, which kind of just summarizes what would you see if you go on a tour to that place, or if it's a museum, what are the main exhibits that you will see? And then we have the time traveler experience, why it's called this. So if you went back in time, what would you see at the time when this event was happening? And what is the place like now? At the bottom, logos and acknowledgements. And then to go back to the top there is the timeline, um, the name and the age, Something dramatic, if possible, a little eye-catching title about that place. There's the now. And then we are also talking about what else can you do in the area? And we thought we would very much like to link each place with some type of adventure activity that occurs in that place. But um, to kind of give geoheritage that adventurous people go there and visit that, that place. And then we also have a QR code, which I mentioned and I'll talk about again, so I'm not gonna go on too much into that. So just a little bit of the, of the um, poster where you can read it. So experience summary, take a guided tour and explore the evidence for one of the most catastrophic events in Earth's history. That's what you'll be doing if you go to Field of Dome. This is the timeline that you've just seen. But you can see there's an arrow, and this one wasn't from the Refrier of Full Dome um, poster, but there would be an arrow sort of explaining exactly where it is. So where is the place, just graphically. A dramatic fact, at the dome, record of the Earth's most catastro catastrophic explosion and geological event. To see or learn on that tour, just an example, if you go there, you can see the circle of hills. Up close, you can clearly see the rugged circle of hills called the Fairford Mountain Land, which were formed when the impact of the asteroid tilted and turned the original flat rock layers in the area to a deep, dip, steep dip. We've also got a picture of the Hoba meteorite, and um, Roger worked out that the, this Fairford meteorite was about 30 million times heavier than the Hoba meteorite. So that's the kind of thing that you would learn if you went for the tour. At, kilometer diameter asteroids traveling at over 36,000 kilometers per hour smashed into the earth, tilting the rock layers. That's kind of dramatic information. If you were back there, what would you see? I mean, you have to be in outer space, I guess, to see this. But what would it be like to experience this catastrophic explosion, this view, this actual thing happening? Also in the area, so now, if people are going to visit a place, often they are in groups or are they in families and not everybody's going to be interested in geoheritage. So the idea is to kind of market each place as a destination. What else can you do there? Maybe there's somebody that in the family that, that likes mountain biking or rock climbing or bird watching. So especially with a remote area or a place that you've got to travel to, if you can encourage groups or families that this is a great place to visit, spend a week there, and while you're there, go hot air ballooning, go hiking, go mountain biking, and visit the Freer of Dome, then you're kind of making it attractive to a group of people, that, the whole group, they all see the things that are there for them, the diversity of activities, and of course, one of the things they're going to do there is... Um, go on a dome tour and learn about the meteorite impact. And the other thing also is to try and have as many photographs of people enjoying themselves there um, at that site, doing different things and you can see they're enjoying themselves. So you think, ah, if I go there, I'm gonna enjoy myself too. And of course, Yara adventure activities, the um, rafting, which would be 
one of the fun things you could do at Field of Fort Dome. And I mean, rafting is a fun, adventurous thing. So is visiting the dome and going on a dome trip. Our QR codes. So if you scan this QR code, you would get take on your with your cell phone, you'll get taken through to one of the central Field of Fort Dome websites where you can immediately see who the tour operators are, where can I stay? And it'll kind of give you a gateway to somebody who wants to visit that place. So they can quickly find out, ah, okay, I want to go to the Field of Fort Dome. And these are the tour operators offering tours. This is where I can stay. Oh, I want to go river rafting. That's where I can go. So it gives them quick access um, to that particular, to visiting that place. And lastly, each poster is going to have acknowledgements and picture credits. And one of the big things with this project has been getting um, appropriate text and appropriate pictures. And so Roger Gibson and Graham Allison, for example, helped immensely with making this poster possible. Just some of our um, other posters, the Barberton one was the first one that we did. We had a lot of input from uh, Christa, Christoph, Tony Ferrer and Pumi. They all took a look at it. And because it was the first one, this one took actually ages to put together. There was a lot of backwards and forthing. And we, luckily, we had access to the images of Maggie Newman, who's allowed us to use them for the then, for this one. And you can see yeah, that our um, adventure activity was a parasailing. And those are some of the things that you would see on the tour. And there's many, many things that you can do in Barberton. If you visit there, there obviously there's the mining aspect, there's an art aspect, there are all the museums you can visit, pubs, places to stay, all that kind of stuff that visitors would need to know if they wanted to go and spend time there and they hadn't been there before. This is the Walter Sassuti National Garden. And yeah, we just thought that those Veruz eagles are so spectacular that they would be kind of a central image for visitors to the garden. This is one of Maggie Newman's, this is Maggie Newman's reconstruction of the restaurant back then. And um, one of the problems we had, um, and I'll just mention it now, was getting good high resolution images. And unfortunately, Maggie's image at the moment is sort of like 800, 800 kilobytes. And if you are producing an annual poster, getting a high res picture of that, I mean, you can't blow it up to that size because it becomes grainy. I, I took a picture of the original through glass to get this one, but it's one of the reoccurring problems that we've had. Um, this is our kitchen fossil exploration center, a fossil site down in New Bethesda. And there you can see um, mountain biking is a very popular activity amongst visitors. And then you can see how we try to put the niche to get one another this mountain biker looking at this organopsian from 255 million years ago. And again, all the other activities at the top here, what you would see if you visited the place. Other things, the owl house, for example. In this little town, often families will go there and you'll have some of them that are interested in art, so they'll go to the owl house, and others are more interested in fossils, so they'll visit the little fossil center. For museums, very much the same approach. This is the National Museum of Bloemfontein. An image, you'll see this actual skull if you visit there. The exhibits. What else does the museum do? So we talked about research, other exhibits, education programs, special programs. National Museum is big and it's got all these satellites, so we mentioned them. And then if you visit that museum, what else is there in the area that you can do? You know, all the other sites and things, the exciting things to be done in Bloemfontein. This is the Kimberley Big Hole, and Craig Smith has seen that, this one. But there is so much to say about Kimberley, as I discovered. Um, and that's the other the thing. So keeping these posters brief and interesting and encouraging them to want to read, but not having too much information has been a real challenge. I think our adventures activity should be skateboarding, strangely enough, because there's an international skateboarding arena where they actually have international, they have competitions, international competitions. And that could be a fun graphic to put in the corner, maybe. And then Mapungubwe, and obviously you've got the African Kingdom of Mapungubwe, which is a main attraction. 
but you've got the Clarence sandstones, you've got the dinosaurs, you've got the wildlife. There are a lot of aspects to that national park that you can talk about and discuss in the kind of proper holistic geoheritage coverage. Yeah. So then these are our time um, sites again. These are the different geoheritage sites. The dark ones are the ones that we've covered. And um, the light ones we are considering, we got 32. But I mean, just thinking about the talks at this, at this um, conference, there are probably many more that we could do. So there's a balance. Which are the important ones that you need to cover, um, that you really need to cover? How many can you have without making the whole thing become unwieldy? And sometimes you can be clever and you can combine a whole bunch together. For example, there are a whole lot of different sites in the Drakensberg for rock art. So we combine them together to just create Drakensberg rock art. And maybe the same can be done with some of the others. And like with the glacial pavement, you've got the engravings on the pavements and you've got the glacial pavements themselves and the Dwyker. If possible, with each post to try and cover the different dimensions, the geology, the paleontology, history, everything that makes it interesting. Okay, so just to remind you, this is kind of what the layout of this is that we're envisaging. We'd like to travel it to the RAND show. We'll be at the RAND show next week, um, but in its heyday before lockdown, RAND show used to attract about 200,000 people. And this is a good audience because it's, I mean, there's a travel component to the RAND show anyway, families, often walking around, looking at things, looking for things to do, places to go. So that's a really nice place to be. Southeast Africa, 50,000 people, and there you'd want to maybe emphasize the educational aspect of this, um, of this exhibit. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then I've already talked about tourism in Garba. But I know all the tourist operators go there, and or many of them do, to plan their tours. So it would be a good way possibly of getting visitors to come to the different sites. And the overseas market is also interested and would visit it. And then they might promote these different sites overseas. And of course, government could be there. And hopefully we can put geoheritage more in their eye and get them to look at the whole enterprise, the enterprise as a whole that needs to be supported. The website at the moment, we're just envis envisaging a simple landing page based on that big map with the different, um, with the diff different uh, um, components that I showed you and at least one page per poster um, with links to the major websites that cover that, that particular geoheritage site. If it's got its own official um, website, then it'll link through to there. Or if there's several of them, we'll try and find a landing page that will take you to, to see all the different websites. So you can see, you know, so you can choose for yourself. And then government themselves, SASTA, have already indicated that they would like a copy of the exhibition because they go to small shows all over the country, which we couldn't possibly and um, they would like to show it around more for educational purposes. And so then just to sort of giving you an idea, already in the school curriculum, and I missed the talk on the school curriculum yesterday, so I apologize if this was already covered. There is, there is quite a lot on geoheritage. I know Mapungubwe is somewhere in grade five, but in the biology or life sciences curriculum, which I know very well, um, they talk about plate tectonics, the geological time scale. They want kids to go and visit a um, geoheritage site, evidence for climate change, mass extinctions and the cause of extinctions. And it would be an easy, easy thing to sort of link the Chicxulub mass extinction to the Friedefort meteorite and the Tsuayang meteorite crater, just to, you know, that would be an easy way to do it, to link the two together. So kids visiting those sites or learning about the fear of fourth impact would then relate that to the dinosaur extinction. Earliest forms of life in South Africa, um, going back to Barberton, of course, that's what they mean. Soft bodied animals in Namibia, land plants in the, Gra in the Grahamstown area. We've got um, Waterloo Farm and they're planning like a roadside attraction 
nearby there. Then you've got Glossopteris, coal localities, mammal-like reptiles, dinosaurs, the cradle of humankind. And each of these aspects has got, each of these has got this, its very own geological aspect. And I think if you've got a geoheritage site, you'll easily be able to find a link to somewhere in the school curriculum as it stands without changing the curriculum at all. I mean, the cradle of humankind, they talk about dolomites and cave formation and all that kind of thing. All right, and then I just think the lessons that I've learned, or we, uh, we've learned, me and the graphic artists um, that were involved with this, and it has taken so long, is that obtaining the information was very difficult in many places because sometimes it's not readily available, the, the information that you're looking at. It might not be in a book. I mean, what people are showing in a museum on the other side of the country isn't. And people during lockdown were working from home. You couldn't contact them. They took a long time to come back to you. So just obtaining the information has been a challenge. And then taking that information and distilling it into something relevant for a poster has been quite difficult. Um, and obtaining high resolution images has been especially um, difficult. And I almost feel as if we should have a project where we get one professional photographer and pay them to travel around the country and take high resolution images of all these sites. Because often when you contact people and they're very happy to supply you with information or images, you find that they, they don't have much available to, to give you. And if you download stuff from the, the internet, A, you've got a pro problem with copyright. And usually and often the stuff that's free for use is not of a very good quality or sufficient resolution to use. And then also at the end of this, we've created each poster kind of sequentially. And then you end up with 20 posters and you see, well, there are different amounts of information in them, and you need to sort of re-edit all of them so that you have a common editorial policy that's, that works with all of the, the posters. Sasta has been helping us with editing them as well, but still, it's a huge job to get all these different posters edited in a uniform way and to try and at least get standard information, even if you've got a common framework for all of them. Um, and so this really, really is work in progress and funding, well, I'm still hoping for funding from the REI fund, even though this has gone so over time, we've had funding from the seed funding from the um, COE of Paleo Sciences and SASTA also has funded part of it. And for content contributors, there've been so many people um, that have contributed to this, each of the 20 posters, there's one, two, three, maybe a whole team of people. And I just would like to thank all of them. If you are here listening, thank you very much. It would just be such a huge list. And design and artwork, of course, Maggie Newman, her pictures have been crucial because they, to, and we've added them to posters wherever we could. And then to the graphics designers, uh, Francois and Debbie Smith, they've been great and um, really, added a lot of creativity as well to the project. And that's it. Thank you very much, Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, what we consider to be a bit of an open strategy session. I've got Chris Hatton, the current chair of the Geoheritage Division, sitting in Durban. Um, he can come on at will, I believe. And Julian Saunders is sitting in the airport uh, in Johannesburg about to board a flight, I believe. So she'll be with us for a little while. Um, the, the intention of this session is, is to be an open session with probably a lot of debate and um, comment. We may or may not get to any conclusions, but basically, um, if you have a look at this monument, uh, you might get the impression that geoheritage in South Africa in general is, is in a bit of a state of bother. But after hearing the presentations of the last two days and what we're going to hear tomorrow, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, something like this is very fixable. It's a glass half full rather than a, than a glass half empty. Uh, and I just thought I'd run through some of my um, uh, thoughts that have occurred over the last couple of days. 
And we do have some issues and we do have some strategic questions to answer going forward. Um, first of all, uh, what is GeoHeritage? We've, we've heard quite a lot about that yesterday and today. And it means different things to different people, to different interest groups. And these are, these are some of the, uh, probably not an exhaustive list of what it means to various, various people. Now, when, when the Geo Conservation Committee for, was first started, I think Uber Reimel, who is now in Brazil and is in, is in the uh, uh, delegate group here, uh, was instrumental in, in forming what was then called the GSSA Conservation Committee. And the, the emphasis in those days was on site preservation and site conservation as opposed to anything else. But in the intervening years, all these other issues have been added to it. And some of them, in my view, are more important than others. Um, but it means different things to different interest groups. And I, I guess one of the things that we've, we've headed for is a narrow definition of, of geoheritage or a wider definition. And I think that most people, given the presentations we've seen in particular this last couple of days, would opt for a wider uh, view of a, of a geoheritage definition. It can encompass quite a lot of things. Um, just a couple of comments. What is going right? Uh, good project level execution. We've seen a lot of projects today and yesterday, uh, and we we there there are some that we didn't know about actually, um, but there's a lot of work going on out there, and it's good work. Um, there's 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 no issues with the with the commitment. We have committed people involved in it, and we're starting to see incorporation of technology. I mean, I think during the last two days we heard about two or three new apps, for example. Um, so things are, things are going well on that front. There are issues though that need attention and, and vandalism uh, as demonstrated by the first slide is just one of them, but that's probably the most easily fixed of the, of the lot. Uh, definition of geoheritage, um, I don't think is a major issue at this point, but someone may take exception to that. There is confusion about the responsible authorities and overlapping authorities. And I think that was well illustrated by Roger Gibson's talk on free to four. Funding, very, very little has been said about funding some of these initiatives. And some of them are, are quite cost effective, well, very, very uncostly and very cheap. Uh, putting up a plaque is something that doesn't take a lot of money, but uh, founding a U UNESCO geopark does. So there, there hasn't been a lot said about funding in this meeting so far. There is no da national database or inventory. Um, there's a few efforts out there like we've just heard from Ian, for example. I think there's a lack of a communication forum. Um, and I, one of the ideas I've been thinking about is a high quality professionally managed website and maybe even a journal that publishes four times a year and can get onto the shelves of uh, exclusive books, for example but that takes money. Uh, one of the key things with which Jillian may want to have some more to say about is the definition of target markets. Uh, too often we get involved with preaching to the converted and, and there's been a shift away from that in this meeting to more appreciation, I think, of the general public and the communities uh, around geosites and involved in geosites. There's been some discussion about UNESCO geoparks, and I think this is still an open question. We have World Heritage sites, but what does it take to turn it into a UNESCO geopark? Is it too costly and too administrative heavy, administratively heavy? And there, there is a sustainability issues around, around that. Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed, we bottom-up versus top-down strategies. We've got a lot of work going on at grassroots level, and, and it's brilliant work. We are not getting the political leaders, leadership um, to the same level of excitement as uh, we have internally about some of these projects. And that comes down to the management authorities. Um, just uh, if, if we pick out three key strategic issues that I, I, I think are important to get, get around, the first one is what is geoheritage, which, and I think we're there. 
but it's not just site preservation. Um, this, the second one is lack of a national common vision or champion that will attract buy-in from project level and ensure sustainability. There's no committed political leadership. We haven't been able to, to excite or, or um, ignite that, that leadership that we probably need. I've mentioned the overlapping authorities, the national inventory or database of sites and projects. And um, thinking about it, Matt Mullins made a suggestion yesterday that maybe we need a SAMCO style organization uh, on a national level. Now that would not be a regulatory organization, but more of an advisory organization and, 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 and a communication organization. And then um, what I think we, a lot of people have realized over the last four or five years is understanding and reaching the target markets. Target market, a target market is not just somebody interested in geology. It's to what degree he's interested in geology. It's to what degree he's come to South Africa to do uh, safaris. Uh, what kind of information would, would uh, enhance that, that experience for him or her? Uh, we as geologists typically don't have a very good grasp of, of marketing. And I think that's one of the things we're, we're a little bit short on. So with that, um, Jillian, would you like to say a few words or, or Chris, and then we can open it up, open up the floor to any of these questions or any of this discussion and, and it will be kind of open-ended. Um, Craig, I'm happy to go first if that's okay. And if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so, so some of my thoughts on some of those issues that you've tabled and, and ideas you've tabled. I think the approach is the wider um, focus on geoheritage and then also on geoheritage tourism, which becomes a wider focus. And I think it was nice to see on um, Ian's um, time trip, which was the last speech, and I haven't heard all the speeches of the last two days, where he talked about the other activities at those sites, which might include skateboarding, for instance, in Kimberley, which I didn't even know about, or cycling or other adventure activities. So from, from this side of what geoheritage is, I think how people will enjoy geoheritage um, assets in South Africa is through interest in the geoheritage per se, but also interest in other elements that you can do on a site that happens to have geoheritage as part of it. And I think I think that's a great thing. And I'll come back to that in a little while. Um, you know, tourism, I think I, I could, I didn't really define it in totality yesterday, but tourism, you know, a lot of what we what is we were talking about here for geoheritage, we see as a subset of the tourism industry. So I'll um, talk about to target markets as well. But school educational visits to attractions, and I'll use that broad definition of attractions, we see as one of the target markets for tourism. Schools are a target market. So the educational curriculum-based elements of people visiting geoheritage sites is part of as we see it, tourism, as our museums, as are the field guides, they're all part of the tourism industry. So that's also why I think there's some sort of wider approach to what is the tourism industry to, to get involved with here. As I see it, I think there's, um, I see two core, um, well, maybe three challenges, but funding is behind all the challenges. And within that, we need to market better. And marketing is understanding our target markets, understanding what experience they are looking for when they come. And I think I mentioned this yesterday that I think there's basically three levels. There's the, there's the real in-depth specialist niche tourism which is people who have geo, geo heritage or geology as a hobby or are specialists in that field. And they may be traveling the world to other sites and they would travel here for the amazing geo heritage history you have here. That'd be what I call deep generalists, people who would come to South Africa or South Africans who would visit a site who want a really good um, educational experience effectively or edutainment experience. So I call that a deep generalist. And then there's going to be actually general tourists who come for a more superficial geology or geoheritage experience, but will do other things in your geoheritage site, like the action and adventure type activities that are available. And then, as I said, schools and education would be another subset of your marketing. But the thing is, what we need is, well, how do we market? What we've heard over the last two days is a phenomenal list of, of, of things that are going on to get people to visit your heritage sites. Um, the Freight of Fort Dome, the, the time trip that we just saw, and various other things that I did manage to, to hear. But such a rich variety of things and such passion and so many people doing it. But it's, it's typically at a bit of a micro level and there's nothing bringing it together. And what would bring it together, I think, is one, having that national inventory and database because that will underlie what we have to sell. And to be honest, it's about selling. So 
you know, we want to preserve the sites. We're short of funds, and not just for geo heritage, but for eco you know, ecology conservation. We know that tourism, except for the COVID years, has been a major funder of conservation across this continent and across other continents. And in the same way as tourism can fund um, ecological conservation, it can also fund geo heritage conservation if we look at it properly. And then, you know, there's some way that you do enough marketing to drive greater footfall to all of these geo heritage sites, which actually are all out there and ready to, to go to market. There's such a lot of work gone on to get them ready to go to market. And that also hopefully would generate more revenue to support the, um, the preservation of the sites and the maintenance of the sites. But what I'm talking about is not easy to achieve. So I, I know that's an issue, but I think what we do need, and I think you had it, do we need a Sam Code style organization, which is the mining industry or something similar? One of the ones I've looked at is Bird Life Africa, um, and that supports birding in a big way in this country. And maybe we have, I don't know what it's going to be called, Geo Heritage Africa. Um, and we start, it, it would need budget, it would need leadership, and hopefully we'd be able to get some philanthropic and government funding. I see that Department of Science and Education, SASTA, and places like that are putting money into different things. If we can get some seed funding to get something like that going, and then we can start doing the national inventory and we can start looking at how we how we brand geo heritage tourism. So we're going to need a brand, we're going to need a tagline, and we're going to then have people say, well, they have a product, a tourism product, and we will list those and start marketing those. So I, I, I've not got the whole answers yet, but these are some of the ideas that I have. Um, I think going forward, we sort of need a two or three step idea of what the future might look like. What will be phase one? What will be phase two? What will be phase three? And you can hear from the way I talk, I'm talking more about the, the revenue generation potential of your heritage in terms of tourism and predominantly tourism. Um, I think there's probably other things that the more technical side of geo heritage needs in terms of preservation, in terms of research, um, that would also need to be handled if we could at the same organization level. Um, it, you know, this is my initial thinking. I know some people in the industry have been thinking along these lines as well. And as you say, do we need a Samco style organization? You know, I think we're a little bit fragmented. We're very fragmented in many ways, very academic currently. We, search, we need, and I'm sorry to say this, more commercial tourism thinking into some of what's going on. And then I really think there's huge potential for generating and stimulating um, enjoyment of geo heritage sites in South Africa for tourism purposes. Thank you, Julian. Um, Chris, would you like to add anything to that? I uh, stop now, video, uh, but I, I can talk. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the target markets and, and, and funding and revenue, I think the target has to be the general tourist. And, and where we are now, we're looking at, um, you know, Ian's uh, time trip posters. They're almost in a state where they can go into engine, uh, you know, well, to the engine at Kroenval, for example. But those posters could go up at filling stations all along the major routes in the country. Uh, because, you know, that time trip, it's got 32 stops. I think um, those are more or less what everybody, I mean, uh, almost everything is included in there. there. There might be a, some of those targets could be expanded. But essentially, I think where we are now, we need to look at getting those time trip posters on, in a format where they can go into um, petrol stations along the route. And Ian mentioned a very practical issue is that we've got Maggie, Maggie Newman's fantastic images, but not all of them um, have been, have, have been uh, captured digitally properly. And Maggie, Maggie has a photographer in Bloemfontein who specializes in, in uh, pho um, photographing uh, her, her posters and you know, at a scale that they can be used to bl blown up. So I think a very important thing is to, uh, well, to to uh, get us get funding to keep Maggie's uh, keep Maggie's work going, and funding for the photographer that uh, captures her images. So uh, you know, I think you know where we are now. We need to push forward with uh, getting time trip uh, available to the general tourist. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, right. Could I add something, Craig? For, to, yes, what, yeah. go ahead. So, so I think what we can look at is a sort of synergy of lobbying, you know, getting all our marketing in one place for all the geo heritage sites, because the time trip, as we saw from the comments, not everything's on it. And I think there's quite a lot that perhaps isn't on it. Um, 
so so if we actually go across everything that somebody's trying to get going for tourism purposes whether it's a, a coastal trip along the garden route to look at the um the early humankind evidence there if, if we market it all together and we start having some common tagline and brand with it we will have synergies then we use the same photographer and the same budget to photograph everything so we don't you know i think the time trip is, is fantastic i think we need to have the time trip fleshed out and do everything that, that, that chris is saying but we need to do that carefully i mean how much does it cost to put posters in all the service stations versus how much would a social media well-planned social media marketing campaign cost it might be significantly less and all those same um, all that same material, infographics, et cetera, can go on your social media campaign. And maybe that's actually a cheaper way to get to more people, but we need to have this worked out properly in terms of conveying the message of what there is to see and do out there. So I'd like the messages of what to see and do out there to be under some sort of common branding so that we add to it all the time. And I think if we synergize across them all, we'll save money in terms of marketing, photography, and then we develop the right campaigns for the right target markets. And I agree with Chris totally that our markets are all South Africans and every single foreign tourist coming to this country, fundamentally. But within that, we need to unpack it a little bit. There will be some that will be more likely to go to our geo heritage sites and some that won't. Um, but I think, so in tourism marketing right now, today, there's a lot of moves to social media and we have some excellent social media marketing expertise in tourism. And I suspect that budget efficiency wise, social media will be the way to go predominantly. Um, but the information still needs to be there. The, the high resolution photos still needs to be there. Thanks, Jillian. Um, with that, I'd like to open the discussion to uh, the delegates. Um, any of these key issues or other issues that you have uh, would like to comment about? What, what is the view out there on, on, on having a, a common marketing focus of some sort? Um, you know, what, what's the reaction to that amongst our geoheritage practitioners? I'd like to open the floor now. Craig, I think if you look at the uh, gallery. Okay. You, you, you carry on, you unmute yourself and. Hi all. Um, so I'm really, really new to the geo heritage space. I mean, I didn't graduate all that long ago. Um, I don't know if anyone was around for Michelle Duplessis talk yesterday, um, for God, she was MD of Fogasa, but as a suggestion, I mean, Fogasa is really has huge potential in terms of their marketing, being able to be like a centralized marketing organization for GeoHeritage because of the, um, they are trying to introduce a specialized geology course for guides around game parks in South Africa. And I mean, they too have a whole bunch of guides that do on the side, things like photography. And um, I think that has really huge potential as, as a way to tap into marketing and their uh, yeah, tourist base, which they have already. Um, so I think that's a really has huge potential. That's just a comment I wanted to make. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Cameron, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, yeah. How's it, everyone? Um, yeah, look, I do think uh, we are also uh, long overdue with doing any sort of marketing on uh, on Joe Heritage as well as Joe Sites um, and the like. My fear is is that if these things become a little bit too prescriptive, it might sway people away from uh, not doing uh, or not wanting to actually do this. Um, so it would ideally you'd want to find a sort of middle of the road uh to to tend to both it would also be nice as well is that if you have some uh organizations or groups who have got a sort of their own branding as such on how they do things is that that branding sort of uh, that branding comes through um themselves so you know to try and retain their identity as uh, these sites in particular would but um I do think is that an inventory of um, of geosites is required. Um, I think it would be good as well also to show uh, things, especially if we're looking at communicating the work that we're doing up to uh, governmental levels, is we all know uh, that uh, government agencies that 
you should be looking after these sites or, or maintaining them, etc. Cannot do it. They stretch beyond belief. Uh, so it would be good to sort of help these people out and um, or these agencies out. And then who knows in future that could come back and help us in future in terms of funding, support, etc. So it's just just my two cents worth on that. Uh, Carry on. Um, yeah, hi, sorry. Um, <laughs> just, a, just a general comment. Um, I think uh, general marketing is, is, is an absolute fantastic idea and uh, it would be great if the GSSA can incorporate all the provinces. Because from what I noticed is that um, I know that uh, Gauteng province is very active. Uh, the area around Kimberley is very active. The area around Fredeford is very active. Western Cape is very active. So it neglects a little bit um, other provinces that, for example, the Northern Cape, um, and I can see that uh, KZN is also, you know, um, featured not at a, you know, very extensively. Um, to to basically reach out to those provinces as well and and get uh, uh, some representation as well. Okay, we've uh, Jan, you have your hand up. You may have seen in the post just now from Rudy Mark that we are making virtual field trips for uh, undergraduate students. And then we use high resolution photography. Um, it may be cheaper to get one of us to do the photography or those images from Maggie rather than employing a uh, commercial photograph for that. Our, our work is uh, related to geophors, but it is more intended for teaching in geology students. So the higher resolution goes down to the mineral level um, where necessary, uh, um, we can zoom into. Um, the images are large, um, but there are websites that, uh, that use these in a tiled format like Google Earth is, and um, you don't need much data to zoom in on a specific area. So that may be a thought to, uh, to bear in mind when it goes to the next stage. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, two participants. Uh, um, Kate James, do you have a comment? You're muted, I think. It's not so much a comment as a, um, I, because I work for one of the govern, government agencies, I can't officially talk for them, but on an unofficial basis, government in terms of heritage sites especially local government has almost no interest in these sites and has almost no interest in providing funding or anything of the like unless you can give them a concrete idea that there's going to be money and that money is going to be coming towards them in a meaningful way but from that side I've been looking at so, so many of the talks today and there's just so much hope and it's fantastic and looking at the, the educational outreach and those issues from the museum side. I would love to be involved in these. I'm just not entirely sure how we would fund them except for externally, mostly because at the moment, government just has no money at all. But in terms of the outreach and, and it's that's very much the only comment I have to say there, but I would love to see a national registry of, of items, especially not just the geo sites, but also the geological heritage items in the storages. And part of the reason why is because if we have an inter a national database, it safeguards those items because in terms of geological heritage, we are losing our heritage in a rate of knots. And a lot of it is because of a lack of understanding by the government bodies that are holding this, these heritage items. So having a national database i think would be an absolutely brilliant idea but it would have to be administered in a way that would fit together with sara and some of the other the grap 102 principles as well so that's all i really wanted to say do we have anybody from sara in the audience here the south african heritage resource agency no possibly not any other comments i'd like to i'd like to call on uva in brazil to get comment from him as to progress that has been made or not made since the uh, since he was involved uh, in South Africa, and I know he's involved in geoheritage in Brazil as well. Uh, maybe some comments on, on comparative progress, if you will. Okay, I've been uh, as 
probably many of you know, I've been out of South Africa since uh, 2005, but uh, visited repeatedly and uh, in touch with uh, some people who've kept me abreast, certainly about Fredefort. Thank you, Roger. I've been thinking these last two hours, and, and maybe I should uh, add first that I have not been able to listen to many talks. I just had a small selection of uh, the presentations of this conference. But uh, just now I've been thinking that uh, many of the issues that uh, you are debating now have already been debated in 1995, 1996, when we actually set up the Conservation Committee. Uh, definition of zero heritage was an issue at the time. Making a national database has been an issue, I think, ever since. Probably all committees over the last 25 years have dealt and brainstormed this issue. And um, it is really an important issue. Um, this is an issue for Brazil as well. Um, Brazil and South Africa are much alike in terms of having this fantastic multifaceted geology over long periods of time. South Africa actually a little bit longer than Brazil. There are specks of 3.5 million year king crust here in Brazil, but uh, you've got a little bit more of that, at least in the Barbaran area. So recognizing the heritage is a first most important step. Secondly, the issues with government and provincial and local structures that uh, you in South Africa have been uh, working with and against is an issue that is rife here in Brazil as well. Um, we have a similar federal structure with estados, with uh, states which would correspond to the South African provinces. Uh, we do not have such strong divulgation towards uh, even lower hierarchies, uh, district council uh, responsibilities and local community responsibilities. But uh, instead, we probably have more issues here with um, private ownership private land ownership um, in this country. Right now, we are looking at what can we do in terms of geoheritage, in terms of geoconservation, in terms of geotourism in an impact structure. Surprise, there is a large impact structure in Brazil called Aragrinha. It's about 40 kilometers in diameter, but it's the largest in South America. And it has fantastic outcrops. It has fantastic geomorphology, fantastic landscapes. Uh, no, absolutely no infrastructure in terms of tourism development. Uh, but just in the last year, the only road that leads through this entire structure has been resurfaced. And uh, we are now looking at an influx, not just of trucks, but of private people as well. And uh, so at the forefront of our ideas, what needs to be done is marketing the geo heritage and other aspects related to it, community development, the uh, indigenous communities that used to live in this region in central Brazil and so on. So there are many points of, um, of mutual interest between, uh, I cannot speak for the uh, society, the geological society of Brazil, but certainly there is a heritage committee as well, and uh, these are issues that are being debated. The issue of geopark development is a big problem here as well. Um, Brazil at the moment has one relatively well developed geopark where the state authorities have actually pumped in some money for a proper visitor center and so on. There are, I don't know, 20 other sites or uh, areas that have been earmarked for potential geopark development and uh, everybody in the or many people in the society are looking into the possibility of starting something there. Uh, a new call for a census of possible sites has been just made a couple of weeks ago and the middle of the year maybe two or three priority sites or areas will be um, selected or have been selected uh, also for the IUGS, by the way. Interests are the same, problematics are similar, solutions 
everybody here in Brazil is struggling to find them as well. Marketing, communication with stakeholders, with local communities is an issue that uh, maybe here in Brazil has not featured so strongly as it has over the last 20, 25 years in South Africa already. Okay, Craig, these are some of the thoughts that I've had uh, in the last hours. Forgive okay. me, you guys started very early too for me. <laughs> to <be a> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Uwe. Uh, jump in whenever you have a comment. Um, Tanya, I'm not sure you, your hand is up. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I just wanted to, to note to everybody that the, the GSSA on our website, we do have a GeoHeritage page. And I'd like to invite anybody who wants to use this to link to their sites. Um, not, as, not in competition to your own sites or as an alternative to your own sites, but just to add in additional advertising, because I've seen so many exciting initiatives spoken about today, and very few people do not know about these. So if we can perhaps help with the, the marketing, put links on our website to, to your sites or to your initiatives, we'd be very willing to do so. And also to advertise through our GSSA social media. Again, this is not an organized program. I'm not offering to do the, the organized thing that everybody has the same um, plans and programs and all the rest of it. Just stating that we'd be very happy to market, to advertise any of your initiatives that, that we can help to, to, to get out there to all of our members and everybody else. Thanks, Craig. Okay, thanks for that. Yes, I was looking, I was doing some investigation of all the tour, provincial tourism sites in, in South Africa. And I was also looking at TripAdvisor. And I think everybody should do the same. And I think you'll be rather disappointed to find out how few of our sites are actually featured there. Mara Ping's there on the Gauteng site. Um, on the Northwest Tourism site, you find a picture of the town skull for the one district, because that's what they choose. Um, look at Western Cape, and they mention a couple of rock art sites. And you know, they've got the cradle of human culture, whole tourism route that they've just opened. So I think if we could, and I don't know how you would do it or who would do it, we should lobby those sites to kind of have a geo heritage logo somewhere on the cover page so that people are interested, they can actually find out immediately about the geo heritage in that province. Um, and also people visiting sites, you should really, uh, sites that you enjoy, if you visit a site, you should really go to TripAdvisor and give it a rave review. Um, because a lot of people base the decisions on where to go on TripAdvisor. Thanks for that, Ian. Um... I wasn't aware that TripAdvisor was not featuring us in, 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 in a very major way, and that's, that's concerning. Um, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we need an overarching marketing body of some sort. Uh, I don't think Matt Mullins is with us today. I would have liked him to, him to comment on his, his idea yesterday about a SAMREC style um, committee. Uh, it wouldn't have the same functions and uh, any national body or organization that gets set up has to be very, very careful not to interfere with the local project levels, which, which are the local projects are going well, but we're not, we're not communicating to the, to the market at large. And we don't have a one, a one-stop place where someone can go and say, what's, I'm going to Johannesburg on a business trip in two months time. What can I see? I think we need something like that. And um, there needs to be a bit, in my view, there needs to be a bit more emphasis on the marketing and, and marketing to the proper target markets. Uh, would any other comments on that? Uh, while we wait for anybody else, can I make a comment again? Um, yes, so, so I'm obviously in agreement with you on that. And I, and I think to all of you, and the reason you're not on TripAdvisor is much of this is a well-kept secret. 
your average tourist doesn't know. And even where they know about it, they don't have a word, they don't have a concept that's a geo heritage experience that they perhaps are doing. So until we get some sort of coordinated marketing, and again, I think there's been some great ideas from the floor, but every single one of those ideas needed some sort of capacity at the center to implement them. And so it's that capacity at the center to implement elements of these ideas, whether it be creating the inventory um, and then creating the right marketing to the right target audiences, understanding that your target audiences vary. So the idea of having the links on the GSSA website page on the Geo Heritage, great, but who's your target audience for the GSSA website? It's probably your deep specialists, your niche Geo Heritage or geology tourists, but your greatest revenue generator is not that market. It's an important market and you always need it. Your greatest revenue generators are going to come from your deep generalists and your um, what should I call general visitors who are not looking for a geo heritage experience, but enjoy an element of geo heritage while they do an adventure experience. Usually it's adventure, but it can be something else. So I really think if we, you know, it, we're going to remain fragmented and things are going to remain best kept secrets. They won't get onto TripAdvisor because people are either not going. Maripen gets a very good footfall. Um, so, so do a couple of other sites, but most of the sites are not getting very good footfall at all. And without your visitors, you're not going to, you're not going to, um, generate revenue towards one further marketing and to any sort of preservation activities that you can undertake. So I would agree with you totally. And I think one needs to investigate whether it is uh, uh, the same as the mining organization or the same as BirdLife Africa, where you can get some seed funding to sort of start this going at this point. It's, it's an early step. It's what some, one has to do something like that to get it going and get it off the ground. Just to comment on what somebody else said, I think Every site retains its own identity. This is not something that takes identity away or brand away from a site. They retain their own identity and their own brand, but they come under an, an umbrella of geo heritage tourism or geo tourism or whatever it is. So again, I'm thinking of the tourism and commercial revenue generation side of all of this, which we need for the benefit of preservation and, and, and to also educate people on our geo heritage. Um, and another comment just to mention, I mean, there was another idea of, of Fagasa being involved in the marketing. Fagasa will market a little bit. I don't know how many field guides have been trained, but most tourists in South Africa are not using a field guide or a tour guide of any sort, whether they be international or local. So we need to remember that's a very small target market and a professional association, which is what Fagasa is, is not a destination marketing association. And to start thinking in terms of destination marketing associations is quite important. And, and this would potentially be a geo heritage destination marketing body of some sort. Um, it, it, it probably has another role as too, in which is the research and education and um, preservation element to it. People mentioned the the provincial tourism authorities. That's one of the things what somebody needs to do. But for each area or each province, go to those provincial tourism authorities and say, please list our geo heritage assets. These are what they are because we've already invented them. This is the state of the experience that we have there and start getting them out there. And so we work with the existing tourism authorities and some of the local areas have got fantastic tourism authorities. Um, the garden route, for instance, um, some of the winelands areas, um, some parts of the um, Hauteng and Free State like Paris or Dalstrom. So we need to work with those tourism associations. And so this is an integral part of getting this to work is to work with the tourism structures that exist and understand how they work and how they knit together and to work with them to maximize what you can through what their activities are. Um, as well as to start saying, how do we get capacity at the centre to do all the great things that people are suggesting today? Okay, thanks, Julian. Um, Cameron, you have your hand up. Yeah, it was uh, just uh, on your comments in terms of uh, marketing and uh, identity and what have you. Um, one of the most important things I think for this, and it's probably what we are, uh, or what what I, what will be required, especially if we have to do this under an umbrella, is you need a content creator. Having worked with a content creator, um, I've seen that it is very, uh, it's very demanding of someone's time, it's very demanding of someone's uh, efforts and energy. And it's not the sort of thing that people should be doing freely. I mean, uh, people who create content and, and science communities, communicates as you name it, you know, it's a, it essentially is a full-time job. Uh, one of the, the ways, creative ways I was thinking of this perhaps is um, I'm not sure how our, it's of course is to get, uh, to raise funds for a person like, uh, to have a person in this post, uh, a science communicator a content creator 
and to have a budget available to them in order to create content, distribute content, et cetera, and essentially to market it. I'm not sure how our funds that we pay uh, as part of our GSSA uh, annual subscription are divvied up where it goes to, but I'm sure we could take a portion of those uh, those funds over there to pay, you know, for this sort of position for this person at the GSSA, for instance, um, or as part of a fund or something along those lines. But in order to get the job done properly, you've, you've got to have someone there to do it full time. Um, and I've seen the, the wonders that um, uh, where companies have invested in, uh, in very good marketing. So I, if, you, if you look at the Envoto and the Envoto Foundation, where they have invested in, uh, look, it's at, in their own staff, but they've actually invested in uh, people to create content. And from having, um, from having nothing to having something now where it, the, the stuff they're doing is amazing. Look at the, the, those, those booklets of theirs, for instance. Uh, so if we want to do it, we, we ought to do it properly. Uh, the big thing is finding the funds in order to pay those people and to run those uh, those bureaus as such. Okay. Any any other comments along this, these lines or concerning this topic? Yes. Um, rather, I was going to ask, with all the different organizations that are involved in the ideas that are contributed to the conference, may I rather suggest uh, collaborations of these different organizations um, only if that is possible because I am coming from a modern perspective of making things a bit virtual um, together with what you mentioned about the Dwarf's Refuel uh, plaque because if we could perhaps integrate that and make it hybrid by putting in or creating QR codes that would land on a website it could be a new website or the GSSA website with uh, your permission and all that that would pop up maps or give a virtual information or virtual reality content. Because scanning these, you, you someone mentioned that some of these properties are private owned. And my suggestion, my rather my suggestion is to the least we could rather do is to approach them from our perspective of marketing this by inserting or them granting us permission to insert these QR codes that would land on our page and that would create traffic so that people can be aware of the geo heritage. And that way, it, I think the least we could do as a point of departure is to actually create awareness of what is this initiative all about and how to best find us. Because I believe if we, if we have something that would pop up um, outcrops or certain geological uh, sites that people are not aware of. There's something called geotagging. Unfortunately, because a lot of us depend on our smartphones, that is something that we can best take advantage of. That's just a suggestion from my side. Thank you for that. Can I, can I throw out another question um, uh, in a slightly different direction on a slightly different topic? But over the last few years, we've we, uh, a number of us have been involved in this issue of UNESCO geoparks um, as opposed to World Heritage Ge uh, World Heritage sites. Now, South Africa has something like I think 13 or 14 World Heritage sites, but no geoparks. And just as background, um, Richard may back me up on this if he's if he's on the call. But one of the ideas before we held IGC 35 in Cape Town in 2016 was to promote and, and establish Table Mountain as a, as, a, as, a, as a national, as a UNESCO geopark. Now, when we got into the nitty gritty of that, basically Sand Parks as an organization at both uh, provincial and national level could not be interested in it because of the costs involved. There were other issues like, uh, in, in, because Cape Town is such a populated area, moving businesses and that sort of thing. But there clearly was not an appetite from, from government, which there needs to be, to form and sustain um, a UNESCO geopark. There, there are enormous administrative costs involved in this. And during the course of the last two days, I think we've heard opinions from both sides of the table. Uh, there were some figures given on UNESCO geoparks uh, revenue generating capacity or capabilities. 
Uh, there was also concern expressed about the cost and difficulty of, of setting up and maintaining a UNESCO geopark. Where do you as delegates sit on this? Uh, should we be lobbying for a UNESCO geopark or should we be going for more of a national flavor as has been suggested in a couple of the presentations? UNESCO geoparks or national geoparks? Um, any comments on this? Cameron, your hand is up again. Just, uh, 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 I, I'm still a little bit confused at this, what, uh, if you don't mind explaining again, what, what really at the end of the day is the difference between a national geopark and a UNESCO geopark be before I, I comment? Well, I don't, I don't see very much difference myself other than um, setting up a national geopark is going to be a lot easier uh, than setting up a UNESCO geopark. The UNESCO set of rules and regulations is uh, pretty draconian. I mean, you've got to do, do a lot of work and spend a lot of money to get to it. Once you get to it, of course, it's, it's fine. But I, I, would, I wouldn't think setting up a national structure or a national park of some sort would be as difficult. Um, and you would have more room for customization, uh, local input, and so forth. So that's how I see it. Uh, Sherrod, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I attended a workshop on UNESCO geoparks uh, a number of years ago. It was in 2012, I think, in, in Ethiopia. And so we had people from, uh, you know, from this organization. And it's basically, it's a, it's a branding exercise. It, it's uh, UNESCO geoparks. If you have that status as a UNESCO geopark, it's kind of an international brand. Uh, that has particular standards that, that are associated with it. And so if you know that say, I'm going to a UNESCO geopark in Mexico or Japan or Portugal, which I've done, they all have a particular standard uh, because of the, all the rules that have to go into establishing uh, and, and, uh, and accepting a, a UNESCO geopark. So that, and that's one of the problems that we have. It's that we are far from complying with any of the of the uh, stringent requirements for a UNESCO geopark in South Africa. And, and those rules include, um, you know, um, a proper management structure and a proper, you know, uh, and it has to be a, a properly approved structure, not just an, an ad hoc thing, like, you know, just putting some, some people together from regional and local authorities. There has to be a proper established management structure, which has to be approved by UNESCO and um, the, the rules are very stringent about uh, also community involvement. There are people living in those areas uh, and they have to benefit directly. And there has to be a proper way that this is managed. And we don't have any of those things, um, you know, um, sort of say in, in Frida Fort, for example. I mean, there's just uh, no, uh, a, a mismatch between different stakeholders and communities and government authorities and local authorities. And so, we just don't have um, the means to, to meet the criteria for a proper UNESCO geopark. And, and then also, once it's been established, it gets, it gets policed, if you like, because they, 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 they keep checking up on it every couple of years to see if you are still meeting the requirements. And if not, uh, you, you, you lose that status. And, and so once you get that status, it's a marketing tool for tourism authorities and it's used quite extensively in, in Europe where there are well-established parks like that. Um, for example, I've seen some in, in, in um, uh, Portugal and also in Mexico. But uh, to get there, is it, it, you have to you know, meet some, some pretty high sort of uh, standards and, and we don't have that. So it's much easier to establish a local park that doesn't quite meet the UN UNESCO standards, but then doesn't have the branding to go with it. Sorry, Ray, can I make a comment? Yes, please go ahead. Sure, I took a lot of words out of my mouth. Um, he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, there has to be a dedicated management. There has to be dedicated investment. There has to be a link with some government organization. And uh, in the South African context, I would think we're looking maybe at a district council to really dedic dedicatedly subscribe to a geopark scheme. But uh, the suggestion that I could make is, why doesn't the GSSA invite two or three times somebody who is involved with management of a geopark? There are national geoparks in Germany. They are usually supported by a county, county in, in terms of 
British counties as well. So it's a small region that has its own administration and is represented by within the state parliament. Uh, but they have management and these managements don't have to be too big. There can be two or three or four appointed managers, maybe one from the biological side, one from the geological side, one from a cultural side. It depends what the focus of this particular park is. So there is, for example, the Ries crater, a meteorite crater of 20 kilometer diameter in southern Germany that has been a geopark, a national geopark for many years, and it's just been promoted to UNESCO geopark status as well. Uh, now they want to try to go for World Heritage status. So what about gaining these absolute at bottom experiences from two or three people, maybe one in Portugal, as Charles suggests, one in, in Germany, one in the UK. And if you can get somebody from China, you will probably find that uh, they have 50 million visitors to some of their geoparks. So sustainability by influx of tourists is probably a major requirement. Uh, it is a requirement in Germany, for example, where we have something like 15,000 or 20,000 visitors to the Ries Crater Museum, but we have more visitors to the Geopark region. And I do not know how many would come if the Geopark label would not exist for this small, relatively small area of 400 square kilometers. These are issues that the people who are running or managing aspects of a geopark or are actually managers of a geopark could directly report on. What is required to be sustainable? Okay, thanks. Uh, John McAdam, you've got your hand up. Right, thanks. I've been, I'm in England, sorry, in Cornwall. Um, we were going to have a geopark back in 1999, one of the very first ones in Europe. Um, it didn't happen for lots of reasons. Um, I've been involved in geoparks for 20 years. Uh, many countries have national geoparks, Germany, China, Italy, et cetera, et cetera. And from these, the ones that are, some of them actually go ahead and develop and apply for UNESCO. As somebody has said, it takes about five years running as a, with a management as, as a geopark uh, before you can get validation. And then as somebody else has said, every four years you need to be revalidated and you need to show progress so it's not like world heritage where you can just stay absolutely still and you don't get bumped off the world heritage list it has to be a real disaster to get bumped off world heritage it's much easier to get bumped off the uh, global geopark thing so certainly i, I would suggest uh, national geoparks first and see how they go Geoparks have to be very much bottom up. Um, as people have said, the local community has to be very much involved. Also, a lot of the uh, European geoparks were set up using European Union money. Enormous amount of money has gone into them. So they had lots of joint projects. So this is why they are so well run. They've got visitor centers, train guides, blah, 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 all the infrastructure that you really need. Um, EU funds, okay. With, with guarantees of funding, presumably. Well, the funding is, is kind of for four years. And, uh, you know, somebody in, in, the, in the target group or in the group um, thinks about the next project they're going to have, which is going to get EU funds. I mean, it, it, it's a well-greased machine and good for them. It's done really good things. Uh, friends of mine at the moment from Rokua in Finland are uh, in... Um, I think with Italians or another uh, with Norwegians, sorry, in Iceland. So there's two different, geo, three different geoparks meeting up in Iceland at the moment. I've had um, Italian and Finnish people working together on, and French on a, on a project, educational project funded by Europe, Erasmus. Uh, the Romanians are very, very good. If you want to learn about how to train guides, um, they have a very good volunteer training program using a lot of people which are high school and uh, people of that sort of age. Um, the person you want to contact there is a guy called Alex Andresanu um, at University of Bucharest. Uh, um, in Portugal, there's lots of people. There's uh, Jose Bria in Minio, who has a, a master's um, 
program in GeoHeritage. There's lots and lots of people you, you, can, you can get help from. Okay, thanks for that, John. Is Roger, are you still online with us? Uh, Roger Gibson? I've listened to intently to what's happened over the last two days. And it's very clear to me that this um, branding, common branding and marketing is pretty essential to go forward, whether we form a geopark or not. I think all the talks have been pretty good and, and the basis has been set at that level. But often the people who have produced a new product um, are not, you know, not interested or cannot market the product. Or, you know, how do we go about marketing all these products that are coming coming on now? So I think that's very important that there is a common um, a marketing uh, group and uh, that um, we advertise and people can advertise through this group. So there's coordination and uh, we, we take it from there. As, as far as the um, geoparks are concerned, I think they are important, as everyone has pointed out. Um, however, it's the management, again, that is a problem. And um, yeah, there, I think, to start with, we should consider a, a national geopark, which is not as onerous, but above all, the management, because a national geopark will also need a management structure. So we've got to look at that very carefully, and we've got to look at the marketing. So we need ideas as to how we go about this. And I think from the marketing point of view, um, I, I doubt whether it's going to work through a government organization from the comments that I've heard, um, whether it be uh, national or, or local or regional. Um, so I, I think it's important, perhaps, that private enterprise gets involved here and that we get the thing going. We need sponsorship. We need things like that to get moving. And uh, then we can set up an organization that can properly go about um, branding and, and marketing. So we need to consider that um, as the geoheritage destinations possibility. So that's my comment. And I think maybe people should put in uh, proposals on, on this line of what they intend doing uh, with this. Because if we don't get going, nothing is going to happen for the next 20 years. We've talked about <laughs> this before. So, you know, my feeling is we've got to do something now. And we've got all the ideas. We've got the products. It's a matter of advertising them, marketing them. So those are my comments at this stage. Jillian, and you've still got your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I just had a... Is it a sort of a comment on the idea of national geoparks? And I certainly support everybody who says don't go for UNESCO, certainly not yet. I think it's a way down the road. And I support ex everything Richard said. But perhaps some, another thought is we have a lot of provincial parks in this country. We have the, a lot of national parks. Some of those parks, the core element of, of them is geoheritage, um, whether it's West Coast Fossil Park or whether it's even, to me, Table Mountain National Park or the, the Garden Route National Park. And if you think about Garden Route National Park and Table Mountain National Park, which are Sun Park's parks, Sun Park's overriding perception in terms of brand is a, a wildlife experience. And while there's some wildlife in those two parks, it's not a wildlife experience. It's a lot of related to geoheritage experiences because that's what is the core, core of those. So my idea would be if you get your marketing branding going, you actually try and persuade some of the provincial reservoir, you know, um, provincial parks and some of the national parks to have a tagline that they are a geopark, a national geopark or a geoheritage park, whatever we work it out to be, and start there because they already have the management. And perhaps actually if that gets managed well for five years with that tagline, you can actually go and make that a UNESCO geopark. I don't really see why you couldn't. It's just a thought that we use some of the already managed areas that have a high um, geoheritage um, element to them and that don't have anything else that stands out as their brand, like wildlife and, and game and safaris, and, and start there as a, as a sort of local geopark um, sub-brand, if you like, um, and then we start to see them being managed as geoheritage destinations. Okay, um, thanks. Could, yeah, carry on. Craig, just another comment. Um, we've been working, as you know, with the Walter Sassoulu Botanical Gardens, and um, They've now got a, an incredible collection of rocks representing the timeline of South Africa. 
I gave a talk on this. I'm not sure if anyone uh, tuned into that um, on on Sunday. Unfortunately, the the walk was was rained out. But um, the the amount of enthusiasm from the management of of the botanical gardens is unbelievable, and uh, they will promote it for us. The area is managed, um, so it's an ideal place to set up um, um, various kind of material uh, in the form of signage and so on, and the rock types are there. So, and then create um, panels, uh, posters, if you like, in the information center, and there you've got the full story in a place visited by thousands of visitors. I mean, they get 3,000, 4,000 people over the weekend. I'm not sure if um, they're all interested, of course, but some will be. And uh, I think um, this can be worked on. We need to look at other botanical gardens as well. Uh, we have looked at the George uh, Garden. Uh, there's interest there. Kirsten Bosch is another one. And the other botanical gardens, the Nelspreet Botanical Garden in, um, in the Lowfeld. So this may be a way of uh, marketing uh, the product and working with the, or, or at least having a management structure to look after any displays that we might have. So those, those are my comments on, on that. We should look at that. But obviously not only botanical gardens, there are other um, parks and so on that might have a management structure. And as Gillian mentioned, we should look at those opportunities first, perhaps, before, uh, rather than try to set up a new costly management structure in, in, at some new uh, venue. Okay, thanks for that. Alexandra, your hand is up again. Yeah, so I think that's Matt Mullins uh, logging in under Alexandra's. Uh, uh, hi, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi. Sorry, I was late. I was a bit late getting into Stellenbosch. Um, but thanks, and I and I know I've missed a lot of the debate. So apologies for that as well. But um, in terms of the sort of management structure, what I was trying to show uh, yesterday were, were two things. And let's set aside the the issue of the UNESCO geoparks, which I still believe would be a great driving force for getting motivated and uh, in terms of overall geo heritage in South Africa for the benefit of geotourism. But let's talk about a management structure. And I raised the opportunity or the possibility of developing a SAMRIC style management structure, which has been in place for 30 years and highly successful as many people in the industry will attest to, started off as a, as a reasonably broad based management structure uh, or steering committee type of uh, approach under the SIMM and the GSSA. Now, what I was suggesting is a similar sort of approach, starting with geological society leadership and starting small, maybe through the inclusion of an existing cooperation agreement that we have with Fagasa, but also bringing on board a couple of the other major players in, in the, the industry. Not trying to get too big, but just starting um, as a smallish structure, things like marketing, for example, uh, we could tap into existing marketing uh, approaches and infrastructures used by other organizations like Fogasa. But uh, why, why I sort of particularly liked it is that you, you, you're dealing with largely um, national parks or game parks that have a defined ge geographic extent, a defined management structure, and many of those who I've spoken to involved in those game parks would be interested in pursuing greater involvement with, with the geological side. And some of them have even expressed an interest in going the, the geopark route. Some of that interest has been secondhand, yes, but I think we could very quickly gauge what that would be. And I certainly wouldn't suggest going all out for as many as possible, but selectively choosing a couple that we would advance um, to geopark status. However, the first point that I made was, was I believe the most important one is let's get a structure going, a management structure, a structure that we can actually point to for all of us involved in, in geo heritage as an umbrella body that we can use to not only communicate with other management structures throughout other countries, but also if we want to use it as the marketing overall umbrella body, that we could actually use it to raise, raise money for geo heritage in South Africa. 
Now that that's sort of a long-winded way of saying that I, I do believe we need leadership, um, and I'm sure you've, you've the discussion has been around that as well. But I do believe we need to actually settle on something to go forward with sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm just suggesting a possible alternative. It might not be the only one. It might not be the best one. But let's get something going. Is what I'm what I'm saying. Such an organization could have, as as is the case of the Sam, the Sam Codes model, um, some uh, a couple of founding organizations or a couple of pa patrons to drive it yes. forward. And, yes, a couple uh, of patrons and a couple of interested parties who maybe are not, not directly involved, but who would be involved in all of the discussions and and some of the meetings. Okay, uh, John, your hand is still up. Yeah, please. Um, so this idea of uh, using existing uh, parks and things like that, that's very, very, very common in UNESCO geoparks. Just three. The North Pennines UNESCO Global Geopark is actually the North Pennines area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, it already had the organization set up, so it got the extra branding because there's really good geology. I've done field work up there. Cesia Val Grande, which is a... Uh, a super volcano in northern Italy, where the next European Geoparks Conference will be in September. Um, if anyone wants to go and speak, um, that's using two national nature parks in northern Italy, um, but it has a separate uh, organization management, which is sort of had some common elements with the, with the two national parks. And if you go to Morocco, Magoon uh, UNESCO Global Geopark where the next Global Geoparks Conference will be is actually part of a much, much bigger Magoon National Park. So that, that's a, a very common system that, you know, you, you, you've already got the management and then you either use the whole of the area or else you chop out the relevant, particularly geological bits. And remember that Geoparks, UNESCO ones, are not just geology, they're geology, biology, ecology, and human culture. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, there's, there's a couple of comments in the chat box about this. Um, for UNESCO, uh, from Dion Brandt, the UNESCO World Heritage Site or Geopark, it is, it is essential to have a functioning management, management agency in place, as we have discovered with the Barberton World Heritage, Heritage Site. The agency needs government support and funding. There are a few other messages. Have a look in the chat box. Fully support Jillian's suggestions. Develop a national geopark brand and start uh, branding places. There seems to be a consensus that that maybe a first step should be a national effort, a national park or park structure, which could be migrated to a UNESCO geopark status as as it as it comes in. If there are no more comments on, on the, the, the geopark versus national park issue, I'd, I'd like to switch topics uh, slightly again. And Sorry, just Greg, can, can I still make one more comment about uh, geoparks? Yes, please go ahead. I believe it is necessary to have a properly instituted national geopark system with an agency that is nationally appointed or has a national mandate that oversees uh, the management and then also the application process for national geopark standard. In Germany, it's the so-called Geo Union. It's a combination of a number of institutions, about 12 or 15 involving museums, involving the uh, uh, Potsdam Geoscience Center, um, the, BRG, the um, BMR, the B BGR, sorry, the uh, equivalent of the geological survey. And uh, they tour the country, they make these uh, initial evaluations whether a national geopark uh, can be instituted. They also make the four year or five year evaluations whether progress has been made. And progress does not have to be very big. In one case, in the Rees Geopark, there was a new cycle path uh, opened, inaugurated, and uh, a geopark culinary experience was created, which was some kind of loose uh, combination of uh, local restaurants and so on. 
but uh, I do believe it does need to have a national structure and probably a government linked, maybe not government run, but at least linked and approved uh, certification system. All right. For uh, which government agency in South Africa is best 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 place to be directly involved in that? Is my thinking at the moment is that it's probably the Department of Tourism. Department of Tourism, and uh, maybe one should talk to Sarah and uh, try to get their support as well to have already a step in the door to some national government department. And then, of course, if you earmark one or two existing parks of national or provincial importance as possible national geoparks uh, discussions with their management structures and uh, conviction that this would be another uh, feather in their cap um, if they have the geo label as well um, needs to be entertained okay any other comments on that there's a couple comments in the chat box again you need the, the National Geological Survey or State Geological Survey involved so you get good quality geosites. So these are the foundation of the, uh, of the geoparks. So you, you want some geological scientific credibility, don't you, on your, on your management umbrella, I think. So it's not just tourism. And this is one of the criticisms that's being made with some of the geoparks by the geological community in Europe and elsewhere that they're being run for tourism rather than the aspects of conservation of sites of research etc and education so you know the 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 english riviera geopark in in devon in england um tourism seems to be the the main driver there okay you want sustainable development but you must have the good science as a foundation Cameron, as an employee of the Council for Geoscience, would you have any comment on that? Um, oof, okay, so I can tell you what is going on over here. So um, uh, I'm going to be, we are going to be having a strategy session up in Pretoria in, I think, a week and a half's time from now. And this is one of the, the points that I'm putting forward that we, we, we talk about, so, or, or that we are going to um, uh, discuss. Um, so from what we are doing over here in, um, well, essentially the way I see it is that this should, this is actually part of our mandate as well, because uh, you could argue that Joe Heritage uh, in essence uh, helps take or helps monitor or helps track where all these geoheritage sites are. They are innate resources, geological resources to the country, and that they can be used to stimulate um, uh, employment and development of new sectors as well. So I don't see what the discrepancy or where the discrepancy lies. Uh, as for data, uh, already we have released at least up to our 250,000 level map data um, and through time uh, or with time each as each year passes as well, our 50,000 data becomes available and those databases that uh, are aligned to those uh, map sheets have all been updated or, or all are, are considered correct. The 250,000 sheets, they, yes, there are a little bit of issues with those still, but those are currently being rectified at the moment. Now I'm actually working with uh, part of the team on that, is sorting out those databases. So in principle, the CGS is uh, committed to these to this, but um, I'll be able to give you more insights uh, uh, on the, the stance in the, next, um, in the next little while. Um, I do know that the Geodesy app now has at least piqued the interest of our of some of our management as well. So uh, I've been asked to present about this, um, and the the early indications are looking quite good. Um, is that it does also look good for us as an organisation as well. But other than that, I'm I'm essentially just speaking as a as a as a person and not as an, as an employee. So it's very difficult to actually get an official uh, stance, but hopefully, as I say, after, the, after our meeting, I'll be able to come back with um, a more concrete stance or concrete statement on this. Okay, thanks. Um, for the benefit of everybody involved today, 
just a, a personal opinion comment from me uh, is that in the South African context, we do have difficulty dealing with government. Government departments tend to be pretty inefficient for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part. And I, I think we've had some frustrations in, in trying to liaise with, with various organizations, such as SARA, for example, because they've got a lot on their plate as well. And um, it's, it's an issue. Uh, if there's if there's no more comments on 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 this topic, I'd I'd like to move on to something else, which I regard as part of geoheritage, and that is museums and information centers, visitor centers, and that sort of thing. Um, how are we doing there? We've we've got several around the co the country. Uh, I know Museum Africa is is a bit of a problem at the moment. I don't know how well the others are doing. Our and so, Craig, sorry to butt in. Just before yeah. we move on, yeah. and, and I apologize for not having been here at the start, but uh, did we have any concrete suggestions or concrete outcomes from that session, or was it just a discussion, or what was the intent of it? Well, the, the intent was to try and set some strategies to go forward. I think two of the things that, that come out of it at the moment are that um, your suggestion of some sort of SAM code style organization, which is not necessarily not regulatory, but uh, maybe advisory in nature, is is uh, an important thing to try and 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 found. And then the um, the issue about the UNESCO geopark status. Uh, I think there's a pretty clear majority who uh, believe that that going forward in a national parks level is the way to go. Um, so those are the two things that have come out of the discussion for me so far. I think it would be useful if we did have something that concrete to come out of all the effort that's gone into it so far that we can at least have something to pin on uh, going forward. Um, I didn't get well, the impression that there was anything. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I'll prepare a little bit of a summary doc document. Uh, I'll make it fairly brief. Um, but those are the things that have come out to me, uh, and the, the importance of marketing is, is um, I think everybody agrees on that. And we have not been very effective at marketing what we, what we do. At the beginning of the, the, this discussion, I noted, and I think it's been verified by a number of participants here, the projects we have going on at local level are really tremendous. There's, there's a lot going on, and we're, we're, just, we're not getting it communicated properly or marketed properly. And, and we need we need to, to do that. And, and that would be the function, I think, of some sort of uh, central agency. So that's that's what's come out of it for me. So, so just in terms of that, do you have any concrete suggestions that have come up on, say, the Council for Geoscience, CAM, this director, to do to, to uh, have a central repository of geo heritage sites, initiatives, and, and other such? Or is that still up in the air at the moment? Uh, to answer your, your question there, Matt. Um, so we used to have a, um, back in the day of Roger Price, there was a, uh, there was a database that was running. It was actually quite a, 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 a quite a nice, uh, well-kept database. It's, it's a little bit out of date now, but no one has been tending to it for some time. So part of the discussions that I'll, I'll be having in the next few weeks is about setting up a just a small ragtag team over here that will actually at least uh, you know try and capture these data as part of our mandates, um, where these geosites are located, etc. And it's uh, of course a worthwhile exercise in my opinion. But um, you know, thinking now what you're saying about uh, with having a sort of SAM codes type advisory um, uh, standard, I actually think coming to think of it now, this is actually a very good idea to have. Uh, or have something like this in place um, in terms of, you know, when these things are reported or shared, it's at least everyone is speaking the same language at the end of the day. Um, and it would be, a, of course, a resource that everyone could tap into and everyone could contribute towards. So it is something that I will bring up with our discussions, uh, with this, the, the discussions I'll be having in the next few weeks. And uh, look, it would also take uh, time to have this sort of uh, thing approved. Uh, within our structures as well. Um, but for now, um, we've, we have started the process, or myself and my, um, my, uh, my team, 
are starting to at least try and uh, capture these data in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so yeah, I'll be able to get back to everyone on that in due course. But uh, I do think it is a worthwhile thing to have, um, especially over here at CGS. It's just about um, showing its relevance in, in a way that, um, uh, that only government understands, uh, to put it lightly. But um, I'll try my best. Okay, thanks. Sure, anytime. And change, the, change the topic a bit. The question is, how are our museums and exhibition centers and education centers doing? I get the feeling that it's a very mixed bag uh, from what we hear. We try to keep track of this in, in the management structures of the Geological Society. Uh, we tend to hear more about some and less about others. We know that Museum Africa is in a little bit of trouble at the moment, but I don't know what the, what the status is of the other museums and exhibition centers are. Would anybody care to comment on that? Yeah, M Museum Africa and the Geology Museum are at present closed, mostly due to flooding and damage. But uh, we have been given a granted a tender to fix the problem. But when that tender will arrive, we don't know. So there is hope, but the we have we thankfully have a new chief curator and a new collections manager who are very proactive about things. But even they see some of the difficulties we're in in general in the museum sector, and it's 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 very disheartening, unfortunately. It's the I think it's a general museum bitch. There's no money, there's no, there's, there's no displays, there's no support, but we're getting there slowly. But things are slowly improving. Well, we hope they are. Would anybody else have any comments about this? I could, I could say a few comments about my experience with Zico. Um, yeah, I, I, thanks, thanks so much for letting me in. I, I agree. I think things are improving. Um, I know their staff is very, I know they're very short staffed um, and it's very tight, um, but I think it's getting better. There are more programs that are running. The school groups are coming back. Um, and we had a really good programs last week with them. We did uh, two days of holiday programs and the general public. there seem to be a lot of people in the museum. And I think... I mean, I would defer to Zico staff to give a more formal update, but just as my ad hoc kind of um, input, I think things are looking up and, and feeling a bit more optimistic about uh, going forward. So from my, my perspective. Maybe I'm making an assumption here by including museums and, and, and education centers and exhibition centers into the GeoHeritage effort, but as long as we assume there's, there's a wide and broad definition of geoheritage, I think it's appropriate to do so. Does anybody disagree with that? Silence. I don't disagree at all. There's I think no maybe... disagreement here at all. Yeah. yeah None whatsoever. Okay, okay. Sorry, Cam. It's all good. <laughs> Maybe moving on to another topic uh, before I go Craig, back. Craig, just, just one thing I wanted to just chip in on you. Sorry about museums. Uh, there was a, well, what, I can't recall how long ago it was, but it was relatively recent that there was a motion. Um, I'm not sure if it was in discussion. I think it was up for debate or what have you. It was, uh, it was essentially for museums in some sort of way to become deregulated as such. Uh, where you as an individual would be able to open up a, a your own museum, a, a private museum, and hold private collections as long as there's a reporting line to SARA of, of the material that you have, etc. Um, I honestly think museums themselves are huge cash cows, and I, I, I personally believe that every single museum in this country is mismanaged. They, uh, if you look at what they have and what they can do, um they aren't doing it so i'm actually excited for this is that when uh when and if uh, this becomes legal uh that private museums and private collections become a thing i honestly think it's going to be be a bonanza because yeah why not um especially if you've got some sort of oddity type museum which i think the public when they think of geology 
you know, I think they do sort of think it as something quite alien in a lot of ways. So I know that has been up for, that is up for discussion or was up for discussion recently. The other thing as well that uh, we struggle with in, in the, I guess, educational outreach museums field is that, um, you know, is that in the past we had strict museums that handled uh, science and technology and those that handled cultural aspects. Uh, those two have now all been merged together and there's a sort of blurry division uh, or not, there's, there's no real understanding of what the needs are for a science and technology museum as opposed to a cultural museum. Unfortunately, those in the, the uh, more cultural practitioners tend to uh, dominate uh, the museum industry. So a lot of those voices, I guess, aren't heard in the science and technology front. And then also as well, there's different needs for the two. I'm not sure what role the GSSA could play in having these sort of discussions up with DACs in particular. You know, I would I would like to see science and technology museums be pulled under the DSI umbrella as they were originally in the past. But uh, that, yeah, I'm not sure if the GSSA is able to to start that sort of uh, those discussions at all. But I do think that scientists overall would would be very supportive of this. And I think our colleagues that are in our former science and technology driven museums would, would be sort of supportive of it as well. DSI I, probably has more money than DAX has, and um, it might be the best place for things like geoscience museums at the end of the day, if we still want these under government structures, that is. I would just muscling in quickly here. I would completely agree with the idea of putting science museums, especially geoscience museums, under science and technology, because at the moment with Museum Africa and the Geology Museum, we're sitting in a, in a cultural history museum. And unfortunately, because we're in a cultural history museum, a lot of the time we're misunderstood. And a lot of our displays aren't cultural enough. They don't focus on the right flavor of cultural history because we're focusing on mining or mining history as opposed to the, the, the kind of history that the, the government wants us to focus on, which is really unfortunate because we have so much to offer, especially in terms of historical narrative. Okay, so Cameron, when you, when, when you know more about those discussions, please let us know. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll get, um, I'll speak to, because I'm, I'm due to, I think I'm Bruce and myself, Rubich have got a, a meeting tonight uh, I'll ask him about it because I, I seem to recall it was him who mentioned it to me and I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, that would be important. Any more comments on museum exhibition centers? The last topic I'd like to touch on um, is the use of technology. One of the things that's impressed me about the last two, two days compared to the last time we had a, a geoheritage meeting was the, the very the very clear increase in the use of technology and in information technology in particular in, in the geoheritage efforts. Should we have a long-term vision of, of how to use that? Should, should we be um, aiming for uh, a countrywide system of, um, of te technology support for our geoheritage efforts? Are there any visionary technologies out, out there on the horizon that we should be looking at? Sorry, I've been very noisy in this one. Um, someone was talking about apps earlier. And I think the use of apps and especially apps in the heritage section would be fantastic, mostly because if you can access these apps, you can access the information. And getting that information out is probably the most important thing that we can do. If use of apps and access to talks like the one we're, we're sitting in right now means that we have access to the information, it, it's fantastic. And if we can extend those apps and those, the use of that access and that information out into the, in, into the general public, so instead of having to be forced into a museum situation, if you're out walking in the park and you see an interesting rock, you can take a picture of that rock and you get a link to, in the geology museum, they have a collection of these rocks and this is the information about it. I think that sort of app and that sort of information and that sort of technology would be absolutely brilliant, especially in, 
sort of talking about geoparks and geoheritage, getting the geoparks out there and getting that information out there because then we could change our idea of our definition of a geopark because you could always almost have these these miniature geological sites so one that would be close to my heart would be the, the Tipperfears Back Ace Reserve which sits on the Fentersdorf Lovers which is a witness area to the fauna and flora there but it also contains the Fairfontaine Dam so not only is that there's the geology aspect there's the historical aspect that's involved in the geology and we just we're not getting it out there enough. So, Craig, can I can I chip in here? I think you raised a yeah. a, a really really good and point and and, uh, and that last point that was made on linkage of any apps that are under development or or perceived at the moment could have far far reaching uh, impact in the in the geoheritage space. So, for example, if you have something on Eastern Cape, for example, or, or, or the app that's mentioning something in the Eastern Cape to refer to whatever's in the museums. Graham Sound, for example, would be absolutely fantastic. I, I, I see at the moment with, uh, I think, two apps are, that I know of or, or have kicked off or are under development, um, the CGS with, with Cam, thanks, and, uh, and the one with, with us, with Fugar. So we're going to parallel route with um, using the same service provider. But I think if we have a proliferation of apps, we do run the risk of uh, having multiple um, apps out there, which, which is maybe is not a bad thing, but it, it could dilute our effort if we're, not, if we're not careful enough. But if we do get it right, I, I can see enormous, enormous benefits. Um, linkages, as, as was mentioned, to museums or to other areas of interest or, or to displays in various areas. I, I think there's, there's huge potential in going this route. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Yeah, it's just to, to err on, on what uh, Matt is saying and what also our cat has said as well is that, you know, this, I guess, is this is this is the future over here right now. And uh, as time progresses as well, there's this sort of lag time between the dissemination of data is going to reduce greatly so we as a whole and this actually extends even beyond uh, geoheritage i think every single sphere of uh, of life had, is is and should be moving over to this sort of approach right now um and i'm sure in future there will be other technologies uh, uh, that we haven't even thought of yet that will will be able to surpass what we are doing right now. Um, so yeah, I do think that uh, that these this is the way to go, and I think that anyone who is doing this sort of work, you know, should continue with these uh, the efforts over here because at the end of the day, they'll be we're all preaching, I guess, the same thing. Um, we've all got the same end goal in mind over there and that's and that's just to promote just what a bloody wonderful country we have uh, geologically um so yeah that's the, the comment i have on that one um on that point over there all right then the other thing as well is just to look as well as that in the digital frontier is that your your possibilities are endless with what you can do so i guess you know allow people to stretch their imaginations on this and uh, there's probably ideas even in the app space that uh, that we haven't thought of uh, so yeah I, I look forward to seeing how this this evolves through time craig can i chip in once more please yes uh, the the reason is i actually need to leave but i would like to say something else i'm i've been really impressed over the last three days i did not listen to all that much but what i've seen and what i've heard this afternoon is really impressive in terms of the multitude of projects and the strength of the commitment that uh, this community is mustering. I do think, however, that this could be a bit of a two-edged sword and maybe there is a need to prioritize and to identify a small number of projects of priority with visibility to set the scene um, for negotiations with other stakeholders. And, and, and I think here and there, the government cannot be ignored, needs to be part of these negotiations. So if some a small number of visible projects can be brought to fruition, this would set the scene for other projects to perhaps be successful in the future too. I think 
maybe one suggestion and it's always easy to make suggestions from being so far away and uh, outside or at the fringe of the community uh, there should be a strategic plan regarding the short term and longer term developments of projects what can be achieved quickly with what outcome with respect to further successes i would like to thank you guys for for your engagement with geo heritage geo conservation geo tourism and so on and wish you well for your endeavors um, I, I try to stay on the fringe and uh, look in and see what's happening. All the best. Thanks very much, Uwe. Uh, have a good day further. I guess you're still in mid-morning, probably, at this stage. Yeah, looking at lunchtime, but uh, there's something else on. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks right, very much for your participation. Thanks, Craig. Um, there's a couple uh, comments in the chat site. Um, uh, John McAdams reminds us that... Um, People could join ProGeo, the International Association for the Conservation of the Geological Heritage. Uh, we, we had a talk on that yesterday. That might, that's something we should probably look at. And uh, a couple of other sessions, uh, suggestions to using, using, adding geoheritage sites to Google Maps, which I think to some extent is being done. There's another comment here I have to, thanks to the organizers and, and presenters, it was great for me to be surrounded by geologists rather than engineers. I don't have any other topics that I'd like to address at this point. I'd open the floor for any questions or comments from anybody else. That's Sharad here. Hi, Sharad. Yeah, carry uh, on. Yeah, I, I just had a question about, uh, I think it was about a month or two back that there was a, a big online discussion going on about top uh, geological sites in South Africa, heritage, geo-heritage sites. And uh, it was something that came through IUGS and came through um, um, in Higio. And uh, I think it was Bruce Cancross who sort of uh, uh, communicated it further to the uh, geological community. I was traveling at the time and I was sort of out of the start of the discussion. But I know that there was a, a, a kind of a lot of back and forth about trying to put, a, put together a national list of, of top geoheritage sites. And I just want to know what was the outcome of that, because I'm not quite sure if we actually did put together a site to give, give back to UNESCO. Uh, we, we did not at this stage. Um, basically, we got the notification pretty late. Yeah. I, put, I put the notification out to the membership and um, with a specific suggestion that um, you could get involved in doing Seapoint, for example. But yeah. I know you were traveling at the time, so you probably missed it. But I, I got back a large number of suggestions as to sites and um, projects in some cases that could be added to the IUGS list, yeah. but no one filled out the templates. Okay. And uh, I didn't have time to sort of sit and fill out 30 templates or sure. even select five of them. Yeah. So we never got anything in into them. We'll have to go in on the second round. Okay, that's that's fine. I, I've just been asked by the the the, the, the um, uh, president of uh, Inhigio to to assist in, in this task of of selecting things, and I thought I might have a conflict of interest. But since we don't have any applications in, it's fine. I will communicate that with him, and then we'll try for next for the next round. Well, unless unless that deadline has been extended, I I, I don't know. I'll find out. I, I thought a really good target for that was the sea point contact um, yeah. in terms of the history of geology. Okay, well, yeah, thanks. Okay. Kevin Page just uh, invited or suggested maybe a special issue on South African geoheritage in the Geoheritage magazine. And that was a special offer. There is going to be one on Indian geoheritage coming up shortly. Um, that will be really good to get lots of stuff together. and raise it up the agenda globally and the second thing is invite really good communicators passionate knowledgeable communicators to give very short videos on and put them on youtube on G, the gssa channel i assume you have one yeah that's really good various people are doing that around the world that's a good way to get people to see um geoheritage of, of a country thank you i think i think we should investigate that I'll send you some links and you can put them up on your um, 
on on your website maybe the ones that I've seen which I think are really good. Okay, what what uh, what we will do as a management team uh, between Chris and myself and and other Manco members, uh, we'll maybe put together a, a hit list and uh, see if we can drag people into into doing some of this. I think it would be. I mean, any of these presentations we've seen in the last couple of days, or most of them, could be turned into a nice paper. And the YouTube thing, really, I mean, I'm talking short YouTubes, you know, five minutes, that sort of thing. Just one topic, uh, one site, maybe uh, in, a, in, a, in a bigger area, um, a really good communicator that's passionate, that is knowledgeable. Um, they do well. Cheers. Thank you. I've enjoyed myself. Thanks, John. Thanks for attending. Chris, are you still on? Well, with, with that, I think I should draw the meeting to a close. I, I don't know if Tanya or Nalin want to say anything at this point. The sessions continue tomorrow with a focus on the, um, the Hermanus-based Overberg Ge Ge Geology Group. Um, there will be a morning of presentations. Um, you, you'll have the link in your calendars also on GeoHeritage, and that will be followed by a, a short trip that they've organized tomorrow afternoon in the Hermanus area. So with, with that, I'll sign off and hand back to either Tanya or Nolene. I'm not sure who's which of them are here, if either of them. I think they're out of the meeting at this stage. So um, with that, I'll sign off and close the meeting. Mm -hmm.